lonely ship streaks along an endless path. It's the mammoth starship Enterprise. Follow her trackless journey each week on Star Trek. William Shatner stars as Captain James Kirk, starship commander. And Leonard Nimoy stars as science officer Spock, half earthling, half Vulcanian. There are hazards that beset the Enterprise and its crew on board ship and on alien planets. Don't miss Star Trek in color. time i'm your host chance bartels how are you how are you how are you doing this is your weird informative and hopefully fun time capsule of memories of days gone by as we forge ahead together in a game of life remember the milton bradley board game of life i was more of a monopoly man myself but right now we're reminiscing about life life specifically pop culture history and life experiences that we all have in common that's what this show the nostalgic pod blast is all about this is your nostalgia show with a bite welcome i'm chance bartels your host no relation to chance the rapper as you can see and as steve harvey says at the beginning of family feud we got a good one for you today. today's pod blast topic is all about dell and gold key comic books based on popular television shows and movies. And Dan from South Carolina is our guest who has a massive collection of these books, which he'll share with us today. It's been a while since I've had a comic book show topic, but uh, I've tried to make this show interesting for TV and movie fans, as well as comic book collectors, since, let's face it, there are comic book fans who don't give a crud about television, just like there are classic TV people who are not into comic books. The original primary comic book publishers of TV shows adapted into a comic book format were Dell and Gold Key. And we're going to cover other comic book companies too, like Charlton and others that had comic books based on popular films and TV shows. But we're going to be showing you Gold Key and Dell comics for the most part. I'm going to show you every Munsters cover of the classic Gold Key Munster series. Going to show you every Dell Bewitched comic book cover and a whole lot more things from our collection, Dan and I. And I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Plus, there's going to be trivia for prizes such as comic books and tops Star Wars cards from 1977 and Batman 1989 cards from tops as well. If you want to call in to talk about these comic books or anything nostalgic, the number is 770-438-1050, or simply comment here in the live chat comment area with your thoughts, which I'll show on the screen for viewers. Now, listeners, if you want to see tonight's show and see these comic books, simply head to the Nostalgic Pod Blast YouTube channel. That's the Nostalgic with a C, not nostalgia, the nostalgic Podblast YouTube channel. 
and it's so easy to find. Just Google search The Nostalgic Pod Blast, and once there, click the live tab, and you'll see a thumbnail image of guest Dan and I with a bunch of TV comics. Hang on, we got a call. The Nostalgic Pod Blast, I'm just starting the show. You're on the air. Who is this? It was a prank call from someone in my life. All right, but getting back to the show, that totally uh, threw me off. Uh, and I talked about the trivia. Yeah, so we're going to give away uh, some comic books. Like, I'll give you an example. The Star Wars 1977 issue two, full disclosure, that's a reprint. Um, some tops. I know I already mentioned this, but I'll show you some some tops mint condition Star Wars cards, some Batman 1989 cards, the Tim Burton Batman, the first movie. Um, so oh yeah, when you go to the nostalgic pod blast, just Google search it and you'll see the nostalgic pod blast YouTube. When you Google the nostalgic pod blast and then hit the live tab, once you click uh the channel. And you'll see an image in the live area of Dan and I surrounded by TV and movie comic books in between us. And thank you, Sarah in Southern California, for that thumbnail art. She designed that, and it looks really great. Okay, I'm going to bring Dan on in just a moment, but it's history lesson time. I want to talk about the origin of Dell Comics, and we'll get this nostalgic party started. Dell Comics was the comic book publishing arm of Dell Publishing, which got its start in pulp magazines. And it published comics from 1929 until 1974. At its peak, it was the most prominent and successful American company in the medium. In 1953, Dell claimed to be the world's largest comic book publisher, selling 26 million copies each month. Its first title was titled The Funnies in 1929. I'm going to have to take this phone off the hook. Hey, do you want to go on the show, Samantha? <laughs> I'm taking the phone off the hook. Uh. So The Funnies was described by the Library of Congress as a, quote, short-lived newspaper tabloid insert rather than a comic book. Comic book historian Rob Goulart describes the 16-page four-color newsprint periodical as, quote, more of a Sunday comic section without the rest of the newspaper than a true comic book. But it did offer all original material and was sold on newsstands, unquote. It ran 60, it ran 36 weekly issues, 36 weekly issues published Saturdays between January 16th, 1929 until October 16th, 1930. And the, the cover price rose from 10 cents to 30 cents by issue number three. And it was reduced to a nickel from issue number 22 until the end of its run. In 1933, Dell collaborated with Eastern Color Printing to publish the 36-page Famous Funnies, a car carnival of comics considered by historians the first true American comic book. Golar, the historian, calls it, quote, the cornerstone for one of the most lucrative branches of magazine publishing, unquote. It was distributed through the Woolworths department store chain. There's some nostalgia for you, Woolworths. Remember, you used to be able to get a burger, a hamburger, or a, a soda from a soda jerk at a Woolworths department store. I remember even in the 1980s, up until like 1987 or so, there was a Woolworths here in Marietta, Georgia, near the Big Chicken that had uh, basically a little diner counter inside the Woolworths drugstore. It was pretty cool. Anyway, Woolworths distributed that, though it was unclear whether it was sold or given away. The cover displays no price, but Goulart refers either metaphorically or literally to the publisher as, quote, sticking a 10-cent price tag on the comic books, unquote. In 1934, Dell published the single issue Famous Funny Series 1, also printed by Eastman Color. Unlike its predecessor, it was intended from the start to be sold rather than given away. The company formed a partnership in 1938 with Western Publishing in which Dell would finance and distribute publications that Western would produce. While this diverged from the regular practice in the medium, of one company 
handling finance and production and outsourcing distribution, it was a highly successful enterprise with titles selling in the millions. Most of the Dell produced comics done for Western publishing during this period were under the Whitman Comics banner, later also used by Gold Key Comics. We'll talk about Gold Key in just a moment. Notable titles included Cracker Jack Funnies, published between 1938 and 1942, and Super Comics, published between 1938, the year Superman was introduced to the world in Action Comics number 1, and 1949. That's when Super Comics were published, between 1938 and 1949. That comic book historian I referenced, Mark no, this is a different comic book historian, actually. Comic book historian Mark Carlson has stated that at its peak in the mid-1950s, quote, while Dell's total number of comic book titles was only 15% of what it published, it controlled nearly a third of the total market. Dell had more than a million-plus sellers than any other company before or since. Almost done wrapping up this history of Dell Comics, and we'll bring our guest on. Dell Comics was best known for its licensed material, most notably the animated characters of Walt Disney Productions, Warner Brothers, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, MGM, and Walter Lance Studios. Now, Walter Lance, of course, did the cartoons for Woody Woodpecker and Chili Willie and Andy Panda and many others. But Dell also... Um, had many movie and television properties that they adapted to comic book format, such as The Lone Ranger, Tarzan, Felix the Cat, Howdy Doody. It's Howdy Doody time. That's kind of where my It's Palm Blast time comes from. It's Howdy Doody time. A little throwback to that. They also published Yogi Bear and other Hanna-Barbera characters. From 1938 to 1962, Dell's most notable and prolific title was the anthology titled Four Color. Published several times a month, the title, which primarily consisted of standalone issues featuring various licensed properties, saw more than 1,300 issues published in its 23-year history. That's a huge number. My gosh. It often served as a tryout title, much like DC Comics' title, Showcase. And Marvel, I'm interjecting here. Marvel Comics had something called Marvel Superheroes, which published new material briefly, which introduced Captain Marvel, the Marvel Comics version of that character, and um, introduced Carol Danvers, introduced uh, the first solo Doctor Doom in issue 20 of that book, but I digress. And then it became a reprint title, uh, reprinting issues of The Incredible Hulk. Um, they also published The Twilight Zone. And the Twilight Zone, by the way, was continued not by Dell, but by Gold Key Comics, the competing company formed when Western Publishing entered it ended its partnership. Responding to pressure from the African-American community, get this, the character Lil 8-Ball, little like little, but L-I-L, apostrophe for slang, Lil 8-Ball, who appeared in a handful of Walter Lance cartoons in the late 1930s, and in those initial appearances constituted what animation and comics historian Michael Barrier described as being a, quote, grotesquely stereotypical black boy, unquote. And it was discontinued as one of the featured characters in the Lance anthology comic book titled New Funnies. The last appearance of the character was in the August 1947 issue. Wow, little eight ball. Jeez, that's pretty offensive. In 1962, the partnership with Western ended, with Western taking most of its licensed properties and its original material and creating its own imprint, Gold Key Comics. While most of the talent who had worked on the Dell line continued at Gold Key Comics, a few creators like John Stanley stuck with Dell and its new line. Dell also drew new talent to its fold, such as Frank Springer. Don Arneson and Lionel Ziprin. Dell Comics continued for another 11, ye 11 years with licensed television and motion picture adaptations, including Mission Impossible, Ben Casey, Burke's Law, Dr. Kildare, Beach, Blanket, Bingo, 
and a few generally poorly received original titles. We'll talk about some of those today. Among the few long-lasting series from this time include the teen comic 13 Going on 18, which lasted for 29 issues, written by John Stanley, uh, Ghost Stories, which had 37 issues, Number one of that title, written by John Stanley, Combat, 40 issues of that. Ponytail, 20 issues of that. Kona, Monarch of the Monster Isle, 20 issues. Tonka, the Jungle King, 10 issues. And Naza Stone, Age Warrior, which lasted for nine issues. Dell additionally attempted to do superhero titles, including Nukla, N-U-K-L-A, and superheroes starring the Fab Four as the group's name was spelled on the covers. Brain Boy, and a critically ridiculed trio of titles based on universal picture monsters Frankenstein, Dracula, and Werewolf that recast the characters as superheroes were published as well. Dell Comics ceased publication in 1974, with a few of its former titles moving to Gold Key Comics. Dan, bear with me. This is much briefer. I just want to talk about the history of Gold Key Comics really quickly, and then we're going to show some covers, have some trivia, giveaways, and some fun. You're going to look at a bunch of covers today. And then I'll get to the comments in the chat and put them on the screen, as promised. So, Gold Key Comics. Here's the origin of Gold Key Comics. Gold Key Comics was created in 1962 when its parent company, Western Publishing Company, switched to in-house publishing rather than packaging content for branding and distribution by its business partner, Dell Comics. Hoping to make their comics more like traditional children's books, they initially, initially eliminated panel line borders using just the panel with its ink and artwork evenly edged. But not bordered, by a container line. Within a year, they had reverted to using inked panel borders and oval dialogue balloons. They experimented with new formats, including Whitman Comic Book, a black and white 136 page hardcover series consisting of reprints, and Golden Picture Storybook, a tabloid sized, sized 52 page hardcover containing new material. In 1967, Gold Key reprinted a number of selected issues of their comics under the title Top Comics. They were packaged in plastic bags containing five comics each and were sold at gas stations and various eateries. Like Dell Comics, Gold Key Comics was one of the few major American comic book publishers never to display the Comics Code Authority seal on its covers, and also they never had the issue number on the cover, which is very confusing for collectors like you and I, uh, for any collectors out there. Friend of the show, Danny Cochran, was incorrect. He got into an argument in a previous live stream with our guest, Dan, in South Carolina about that fact, and of course, Dan in South Carolina was correct. Gold Key featured a number of licensed properties and several original titles, including a number of publications that were spun off from Dell's four color series or were published as standalone titles. Gold Key Comics maintained decent sales numbers throughout the 1960s, despite its offering of many titles based upon popular TV series of the day, as well as numerous titles based on both Walt Disney Studios and Warner Brothers animated properties. It was also the first company to publish comic books based on the current NBC series Star Trek. We'll show every cover of that with the lot with the real covers of the actors in a little while as well as the last issue of the original star trek run whitman uh tom i saw your text if you're watching i will send the link in just a second when i bring my guest on when i can do that um da, 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 da. And we're going to show all the monsters, Tom. I know he's a huge monsters fan. I'm sure you have a lot to interject about the monsters when I get to the monsters and I show every cover of the Gold Key Monster comic book series. Okay, while some titles such as Star Trek and The Twilight Zone were published for many years, many other licensed titles were characterized by short runs, sometimes publishing no more than one or two issues, like The Invaders, which lasted for four issues. I'll show those later. Gold Key considered suing over the similarly themed television series Lost in Space for its, for its resemblance to the pre-existing comic book titled 
Space Family Robinson, but decided their business relationship with CBS and Irwin Allen, and that was more important than any monetary reward resulting from such a lawsuit. As a result, the Gold Key series adopted the branding from Space Family Robinson to Space Family Robinson Lost in Space with issue number 15 from January 1966, though its narrative had no connection to the TV series. I'm going to scan through here because i got to bring Dan on. He's been so patient. I told him I'd have a little brief history, five minutes. I think I've gone a little bit longer than five minutes, and he's been very patient backstage. And then I can send Tom Williams, a.k.a. Basil Chesterman, the link so he can join the conversation. Editor Chase Craig stated that Gold Key would launch titles with Hanna-Barbera characters like the Flintstones with direct adaptations of episodes of the TV program because, quote, he had studio approval rights and the people there could get pointlessly picky about the material, but they rarely bothered looking at any issue after the first few issues. Therefore, it simplified the procedure to do the first and maybe the second issue as an adaptation. They couldn't very well complain that a plot was taken from the show was inappropriate. Okay, over the years, Gold Key lost several properties, including the King Feature Syndicate characters Popeye, Flash Gordon, The Phantom, etc., to Charlton Comics in 1966. Numerous, but not all, Hanna-Barbera characters also took Charlton Comics in 1970, and Star Trek. They lost Star Trek to Marvel Comics in 1979, when Star Trek The Motion Picture was released in movie theaters. The stable of writers and artists built up by Western publishing during the Dell Comics era mostly continued into the Gold Key era. In the mid-1960s, a number of artists were recruited by the newly formed Disney Studio Program and therefore divided their output between the Disney Program and Western Publishing. Writer-artist Ross Manning and editor Chase Craig launched the Magnus Robot Fighter science fiction series in 1963. Jack Sparling co-created the superhero Tiger Girl with Jerry Siegel, co-creator of Superman in 1968. And they drew the toy line Microbots one shot and illustrated comic book adaptations of the television series Family Affair and Adam 12. Dan Spiegel worked on Space Family Robinson, The Green Hornet, The Invaders, Korak, Son of Tarzan, Brothers of the Spear, and many of Gold Key's mystery and occult titles. Among the other creators at Gold Key were writers Donald F. Glutt, Len Wine, who created Wolverine, allegedly, uh, Bob Ogle, John David Warner, Steve Skeets, and Mark Evanier, and artist Cliff Voorhees, and many other talents. Glut created and wrote several series, including The Occult Files of Dr. Spectre, Dagar the Invincible, and Trag and the Sky Gods. Also in the 1970s, writer Bob Gregory started drawing stories mostly for Daisy and Donald, and artist writer Frank Miller, who later went on to Daredevil in Marvel Comics and created Elektra had his first published comic book artwork in the Twilight Zone for Gold Key in 1978. Okay, according to former Western publishing writer Mark Evanier, during the mid-1960s, comedy writer Jerry Belson, whose writing partner at the time was Gary Marshall, who created Happy Days and all of its spinoffs, for television, also did scripts for Gold Key while writing for Levy while writing for leading TV sitcoms like the Dick Van Dyke show. Among the comics for which he wrote were The Flintstones, Uncle Scrooge, Daffy Duck, Bugs Bunny, The Three Stooges, and Woody Woodpecker. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
Leo Dorfman, creator of Ghosts for DC Comics, also produced supernatural stories for Gold Keys, similarly themed The Twilight Zone, Ripley's Believe It or Not, Boris Karloff, Tales of Mystery, and Grimm's Ghost Stories. One of Gold Keys' editors at the time told Mark Evanier, quote, Leo writes stories and then he decides whether he's going to sell them to DC for ghosts or to us. He tells us that if they come out good, they go to us. And if they don't, they go to DC. I assume he tells DC the opposite, unquote. I'm going to skip ahead because I got to bring Dan on. Um, oh, wow. Editor Frank Tedeschi. I'm probably screwing up his last name. Editor Frank Tedeschi, T E D E S C H I, who left in 1973 for a job in book publishing, helped bring in such new comics professionals as Walt Simonson, who later drew for Marvel. Thor, he uh, created, co-created Beta Ray Bill, and he drew for Star Wars, the Marvel adaptation. Great artist. He has a very unique signature. I have many signed comic books by Walt Simonson. But anyway, Frank, who left in 1973 uh, to work in books, helped bring in new comics professionals such as Walt Simonson and John David Warner. During the 1970s, the entire comics industry experienced a downsizing, and Gold Key was among the hardest hit. Its editorial policies had not kept pace with the changing times and suffered an erosion of its base of sales among children who, instead of buying comic books, could now watch cartoons and other entertainment on television for free. It is also alleged by Carmine Infantino. I never liked his art. I hate to say it in Star Wars. Marvel Comics, I just, I'm sorry. I know a lot of people like his art, and he's a classic from the Golden Age. I just, it's kind of like Stan, uh, Steve Ditko, rather. When Steve Ditko returned in 1989 to do Speedball for Marvel Comics, his artwork looked kind of passe, I think, and kind of uh, old school, old hat, old fashioned. Because you had people like Neil Adams come along in the 60s, in the mid to late 1960s, that really took comic book art to another level. But anyway, Carmine. Uh, it's alleged by Carmine that in the mid to late 1960s, DC Comics attempted to pressure Gold Key from the comics business through sheer volume of output. Okay. Among the original titles launched by Gold Key in the 1970s were Baby Snoots and Wacky Witch. By 1977, many of the com uh, com uh, by 1977, many of the company's series had been canceled and the surviving titles featured more reprinted material. Although gold key was able to obtain the rights to publish a comic book series based on Buck Rogers in the 25th century between 1979 and 1981. It also lost the rights to publish star Trek. I know I already mentioned this to Marvel comics just prior to the revival of the franchise via star Trek, the motion picture with the final Gold Key published Star Trek title being issued in March of 1979. I'll show that cover in just a little bit. Uh, in this period, Gold Key experimented with digests with some success. In a similar manner to explore new markets in the mid-1970s, it produced a four-volume series with somewhat better production values and printing aimed at emerging collector market containing classic stories of the Disney characters by Carl Barks in the late 1970s Somewhat higher grade reprints of various licensed characters were also aimed at new venues like Dynabrites and Starstream, a four issue series adapting classic science fiction stories by authors such as Isaac Asimov and John W. Campbell. Golden Press released trade paperback reprint collections such as Walt Disney Christmas Parade, Bugs Bunny, Comics Go Round, and Star Trek The Enterprise Logs. Almost done, I promise. In the late 1970s, the distribution of comic books on spinner racks and at newsstands, drugstores, and supermarkets continued. But Western Publishing also sold packages of three comics in a plastic bag to toy and department stores, gas stations, airports, and bus and train stations, as well as to other outlets that weren't conductive to conventional comic book racks. The newsstand comics were returnable and the dealer could return old unsold com 
comic book copies to the distributor for a full refund. But the bagged comics were not refundable. To discourage unscrupulous dealers from opening the plastic bags and returning the non-returnable issues, Western published the newsstand versions under the Gold Key Comics label and put the Whitman Comics logo on the bagged versions. Is it? This is interesting. This explains a lot. In case you were wondering, like I was, the difference between Whitman and Gold Key, that's the reason. That's pretty interesting. I'm going to repeat. Western published the newsstand versions under the Gold Key Comics label and put the Whitman Comics logo on the bagged versions. Although, meaning three comics in a bag. Hey, kids, comics. Although, otherwise, the issues were identical, except for that label, Gold Key and Whitman. Western, at one point, also distributed bagged comics from its rival DC Comics under the Whitman logo. Former DC Comics executives Paul Levitt stated, quote, The Western program was enormous. Even well into the 1970s, they were taking very large numbers of DC titles for distribution. I recall 50,000 plus copies offhand, unquote. In 1979, Western ceased to be an independent company when Mattel Incorporated, the toy company, purchased the company. The new management stopped selling returnable comics at newsstands, preferring the non-returnable, non-returnable bagged comics sold at toy stores. In a 1993 interview, Del Connell, the managing editor at Western's West Coast office in the late 1970s, recalled the Western Comics line was killed by distribution. Perhaps you know that by the early 19 by early 1980, our comics were only being distributed in bagged sets of three. The Whitman label replaced the gold key imprint at that time, as the comics could no longer be found on newsstands but in department variety and grocery stores. Our new management assumed that comics could be treated like coloring books or puzzles. That proved an ill-fated decision. The following years were characterized by delays and erratic distribution, unquote. Eventually, arrangements were made to distribute these releases to the National Network of Comic Book Stores. Western also appeared, I'm sorry, Western also prepared in the early 1980s for deluxe Carl Barks reprint project books aimed at the collector market, which was never published. In December 1983, a struggling Mattel toy sold Western Publishing to real estate investor Richard A. Bernstein. Bernstein closed Western's comic book publishing division in 1984. Let's see when we get to the end here. Okay, here's the very end. Very end, I promise. Three of Gold Key's original characters, Magnus, Robot Fighter, Dr. Solar, and Torok, Son of Stone, were used in the 1990s to launch Valiant Comics' fictional universe. Dark Horse Comics and later Dynamite Entertainment have published reprints, including several in hardcover collections, such as original gold key titles as Magnus, Robot Fighter, Dr. Solar, Mighty Samson, Mars Patrol, Turok, Son of Stone, The Occult Files of Dr. Spector, Dagger the Invincible, Boris Karloff's Tales of Mystery, Space Family Robinson, Flash, Ah, Gordon, The Jesse. Marsh drawn Tarzan and some of the Russ Manning produced Tarzan books. They started several revivals of characters under Jim Shooter, former president of Marvel comic books and VP of Marvel comic books in the 1980s, including Dr. Solar, Magnus Turok and Maddie, Mighty Sampson. The checker book, publishing group in conjunction with paramount pictures began reprinting the gold key star trek series in 2004 mm -hmm. okay hermes press reprinted the three series based on Irwin allen science fiction shows as well as gold keys dark shadows my favorite martian and the phantom okay 
Bongo Comics published a parody of Gold Key in Radioactive Man issue number 106, volume 2, number 6 from November 2002, with a script and layout by Batten Lash and finished art by Mike DiCarlo that Tony Isabella had dubbed, quote, a nigh flawless facsimile of the Gold Key comics published by Western in the early 1960s from the painting with tasteful come on copy on the front cover to the same painting sans logo or other type presented as a pinup on the back cover unquote in june 2001 dic entertainment announced they would purchase golden comic golden books family entertainment for 170 million dollars the equivalent of 281 million dollars in 2022 and take it out of bankruptcy. However, DIC Dick would pass off the purchase due to high costs. And instead the golden books, family of entertainment was eventually acquired jointly by classic media owner of the catalog of United productions of America and book publisher, random house in a bankruptcy auction for the lower 84.4 million equivalent to 139 million. 0.5 million in 2022 back on August 16th, 2001, right before 9 11. In turn, Random House and Classic Media gained ownership of Golden Books' entertainment catalog, including the family entertainment catalog of Broadway Video, which includes the pre 1974 library of Rankin Bass Productions and the total and the library of Total Television, as well as production, licensing, and merchandising rights for Golden Books' characters and the Gold Key Comics catalogs, while Random House gained Golden Books' book publishing properties. Random House had previously acquired Dell Publishing through a series of mergers since 1976, effectively reuniting the remnants Gold Key Comics and Dell Comics. On July 23rd, 2012, Classic Media was acquired by DreamWorks Animation for 155 million bucks, equivalent to 198 million in 2022, and renamed Dream renamed it DreamWorks Classics. On July 1st, 2013, Random House merged with Penguin Group, forming a new company called Penguin Random House. In April 2016, the acquisition of DreamWorks Animation, owner of DreamWorks Classics by NBC Universal, was announced. I guess it's owned by Xfinity, formerly known as Comcast. They had to change their name because their service sucks so bad. Comcast did. They had to become Xfinity. In 2021, but at full disclosure, I am an Xfinity client. <laughs> they have good internet. In 2021, comics creator and hacker Robert Willis obtained a trademark registration for a logo identical to the Gold Key logo later that year. The trademark registration was purchased by the newly formed Gold Key Entertainment LLC. Gold Key Entertainment LLC consists of comic book enthusiast Lance Linderman, Adam Brooks, Mike Dines, D-Y-N-E-S, that's how you spell his last name, and Arnold I don't know how to say his name. Arnold Guerrero, G-U-E-R-R-E-R-O. And Linderman describes trading a copy of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one. That's a soft, sore spot for me. Oh, I don't, I shouldn't get into it. I'm digressing here. And I'm about to, I'm going to bring, if you're still there, I'm going to bring you on, Dan, in South Carolina in one minute. A friend of mine stole my first print copy of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one and traded it to a buddy of mine for a stack of, of uh, adult magazines. Scott Holcomb stole one of my copies of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one, and my good buddy still has that stolen copy. Jeff Logan still has that. Unbelievable. Anyway. Linderman describes trading a copy of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles number one from 1983 to Willis for the rights to Gold Key in a YouTube interview with Carlos Collects Comics YouTube channel. Gold Key Entertainment is currently working with creators to produce new titles. Okay, next will be the trivia game. We're going to bring on Dan right now. Dan, I don't know if he's still there. Let me get to that screen. Dan. I am from, from South Carolina. That's the longest five minutes you've ever heard of, right? More like 45 minutes. 
Oh, good grief. I'm so sorry. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm doing great, my friend. I love talking comic books and doing show and tells like this. I had to give that history. I mean, I learned a lot just preparing that information. That's uh, interesting stuff. 90, 98% of the titles you mentioned, I have at least one copy of one of them. That's why I wanted you on. You specialize in collecting comic books based on TV shows and movies, cor correct? Oh, yeah. That's my main thing. Good grief. There's 89 comments I got to get to in a moment. Um, tell us I'm a little gonna, bit about you start the comments. I'm going to go smoke. <laughs> oh, okay. 10 minutes to get through that. No kidding. Well, I'll do that in a minute, but I, I just want people to know who you are. Now, you're in South Carolina, obviously. That's why I call you Dan in South Carolina. I don't know if you want to identify your last name or not. That's up to you. I'm Danny Staten. I'm in South Carolina between Greenville and Anderson. And how did you get into collecting comic books and when? Oh, I've been collecting comic books since I was a kid. I've had 10 or 15 comic book collections in my life. And at one point or another, I usually get too many comics and wind up selling them all and starting over for some reason. Oh, wow. That's cool. Well, yeah, it's tough for me to sell comic books. Like if I have a duplicate copy, that's one thing I'll do a trade, but that's something that really, uh, it's like nails on a chalkboard. I just get really weirded out. I had, a, out. I had a really huge comic book collection around 1995, over a million comic books. And I discovered eBay and sold a, every one of them on eBay in a year. Did you do well? Like what year was this about or what, what time? 95. Frame did you sell? 95. Ooh, yeah. So, see, that thing, you, you when you think about what you could have gotten now, you know, and that was before there was grading companies. None of the comics I sold were graded. They were all just like what I've got now, pretty much. I've got maybe a hundred graded comics, but I, I, I try to stay away from them because I like to be able to open them and look at them. And if you do a graded comic like we was talking about before, once they're sealed up, they're they're useless. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you do a channel like I do on the Daily Dan blog where I review a comic book and show you the inside of it. If it's in a plastic binder, I can't open it up and show you the inside of it. Wow. Can you hear that beeping in the background? Yeah. It's not okay. here. I had this girl calling me trying to throw me off and cause me problems, so I had to take my phone off the hook. Let me let me move that. that that's going to be terribly distracting. Let me just... Yeah, I'll just do that. Okay. All right. So 1995, I think that's the year eBay was formed by Meg Whitman's boyfriend. And you know the story about eBay, how it got founded, don't you? Yeah, I've heard a little bit about eBay before. She wanted a Wonder Woman Pez dispenser. She collected Pez dispensers. Her boyfriend created eBay to help find a Pez dispenser, a Wonder Woman Pez dispenser for his girlfriend, Meg Whitman. And she's no wow. longer an, a CEO uh, or have anything to do with eBay. She, uh, she now is with another big corporation I won't mention. But anyway, um, yeah, th see, that kills me because I sold some comics to buy an Indiana Jones pinball machine back in 1996. And when I think of what I would have gotten now with grading and with eBay, you know, that this was right when eBay was launching. It just ugh, but I've gotten most of those books back. But it's like, damn, <laughs> well, almost the entire almost everything I had back then were uh, Marvel and DC superhero comics. And that's mainly what I was into my whole life until the last maybe 12 to 14 years when I got into classic good stuff, comic books and started this collection. And now I've got way too many of them. Pretty well, there's lots of shows I would still like to have, you know, I haven't got an I dream of genie or a Beverly Hillbillies, but they're two I'm actually looking for right now. Wow. Well, um, the, the value of these really fluctuate, of course, the Star Trek gold key comic books, which I'll show every main issue with had, which had a photo cover in a little bit. Uh, those have value. Anything Star Trek does. But uh, and so do the Munsters. You can see uh, the number one right here and the number six but right behind my head of the Star Trek comics. I've, I've got a lot of the original gold key first run. Those I, are awesome. got about, I got about 30 of them. That's awesome. And I like they had photos on the inside cover of the initial issues. And I'll show that later. The inside of Star Trek one, I took photos and the invaders books, but um, I love it. Yeah. There's four issues of the gold key invaders and uh, that's issue three, the moon tilters. I got number three and four. Wow. I've got a really nice copy of issue one. My issue two is in rough shape. I'll show it later. I took photos of all you these. Got, you got one and two, and I got three and four. 
<laughs> I got all four, but yeah, I hear you. And it's kind of funny, Dan, some of the TV shows that gold key publishes comic books. It's like, what were they thinking? Like had nothing to do with anything kids would be interested in, you know, like in some cases, like uh, the governor and JJ, I'll talk about that later, which was a sitcom um, that lasted for a season and a half, two seasons technically, but really a season and a half. Uh, and I, it didn't sell well. There were three issues of that. And it's like, why would they publish a comic book based on an adult sitcom? I don't get it. Anyway. I'll say some pretty weird comics in my time. Yeah. Now, are you a fan of grading comic books? I know how to grade comic books, but it don't really matter to me what the grade of a comic book is. As long as the cover looks good and I ain't hanging on the wall and talk about it on YouTube, eh, it don't matter to me if it's a slab or uh, see, you know it's a necessary evil obviously because for one thing it'll preserve a comic because as you know i mean nothing lasts forever and over the course of say a hundred years a comic book will just erode into basically dust <laughs> now, i'm not, not going to be around to worry about that <laughs> i don't plan on living to be a hundred and i'm already like i'm already like 57 so well they they mean oh god they, meaning the experts, many have said that a vacuum sealed slab will make a comic last a hundred years. So you could pass it down to a child, a relative, yeah, nephew. I, I'm, I'm going to leave, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that notation in my will that whoever inherits this crap can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, in, if the case doesn't spontaneously combust, like happened, which happened to me, I'm going to show that right quick. This issue. CGC 9.6 Incredible Hulk 296 first UFOs. I don't know if you can see that. It just cracked. It cracked apart at the base. So I'm going to resubmit it and have them re-slab it down the line. But uh, I don't know why that happened because I keep my books in an air-conditioned area. Uh, I treat everything very, very well. I don't know why it just burst apart. That's bizarre. Yeah. But it is a necessary evil, especially for resale value. Obviously, I'm stating the obvious here. Uh, you know, there's several grading companies, obviously CGC, which has had some problems lately with the recent controversy. Um, and then you have uh, uh, CBC, PGX, you know. But CGC is, of course, generally for the layman, for those that don't know comic books, are the number one grading company in terms of resale value and uh, in the comic book collecting community. I'd say you most know, of my comic books are either a 7.5 or better. Damn. I have a lot of them that's in really, really good shape. And once in a while, I'll get a replacement comic. Like I had a girl from uncle, which was probably like a, probably like a three really tattered bad, but I found a new copy, which is probably a nine. So I, I'm going to send the old copy to somebody and I'm keeping the new one. Is that handy where you could show that girl from uncle? Yeah. Thanks, because I didn't pull any of those Somewhere up here. to show today. If you give me one second, I'll pull the old copy, too, so I can show you the difference. Thanks, Dan. And in a moment, take a smoke break. I'm going to go through all these comments and put them on the screen. And uh, okay. so you can have a smoke break. And uh, and then I'm going to start showing some covers when you get back. And we're going to have a trivia game giving away some. Uh, look at this cool card. From Batman, nineteen eighty nine. We're gonna. I'm gonna wave five cards per winner. Whoever correctly answers the trivia question and says claim, okay, so win. And I'll give you a choice of prizes. I'm gonna give away. Now, here you see the tag. Huh? This is a a girl from Uncle. Oh yeah. Number five is in really really rough shape. And I recently got another number five on the wall, and I'm gonna replace it. And I just got this one, and just did a video about it, and it's a really probably my favorite girl from uncle cover oh how cool number four yeah and that's the two girl from uncles i picked up i have two number um threes i love the uh photo covers the best of the gold key oh yeah that's my favorite that's, when, when it was coming on and they were talking you were talking about the westerns mm -hmm. I, and the super comics i picked up my 1945 copy of super comics and that's oh, one of the wow. first appearances of Dick Tracy. Oh, wow. And that's one of the oldest ones I've got. 
And we're going to talk about this after we do the comics, but you have a huge autograph collection. You don't need to show anything now. I just wanted to let people know it's extremely impressive. You had, you've had autographs passed down from family members, your father, and, I mean, incredible I'm stuff. My mom. My mom was a photographer, and she did a lot of photo shoots for people. And whenever uh -huh. she'd get autographed pictures, she'd bring me one home. Or sometimes she'd actually take me to the shoots with her, and I'd get to meet people. Oh, that's amazing. Sincerely, that is just so cool. 90% of it would probably be wrestlers. She'd worked a lot for professional wrestling. <laughs> That's did she do anything with Turner with um Ted Turner's wrestling? Yeah, she she took pictures for wrestling from nineteen seventy four to two thousand something. She was involved in several different companies and taking pictures for their little fan magazines and their little programs and uh, Wrestling Illustrated. Well, do you remember rest, Mr. Wrestling number two? Yeah, he was James, Tim, yeah, his was a guy named Tim Woods from right down here in Georgia. That's amazing. Yeah. I actually met him a few times in my younger days. He passed away not too long ago, and he, he was a character. I love those Superstation 17 wrestling shows from, like, the late 70s, early 80s. Man, that was a lot of Tommy Wildfire Rich. I'm getting off topic here. Uh, the junkyard dog, all those yeah. characters, man. I remember it was it was big in 1979 when we first got cable. Yeah, I got to watch uh, the Superstation Wrestling for the first time. Yeah, Saturday night at 6:05 become a big event in our house. Everybody gathered around the TV to watch wrestling from Georgia, and if we had <laughs> just got our first VCR, so if we missed it, we could record it. Oh man! And our friend Al Hardy, friend of the show, he's a a uh, part-time co-host, he worked at Turner. And and they I think he said they would tape on a Tuesday or a Thursday. I'm trying to remember. Tuesday, I think he said Tuesday. It's either Tuesday or Thursday. And he'd meet all those guys. And uh, Bill Tush, friend of the show, you know, he was on TBS in those days in another capacity. Really funny guy, anyway. And a good friend of Al Hardy's and Tom Williams. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, if you want to take a smoke break, I'm going to acknowledge the comments now. And then we'll get back on topic and start showing some comic books and well, give some stuff away. While you're talking to the people in the chat, there's no reason for me to interrupt you or be part of it. I'm going to put myself out for about I'll seven, do it for eight, you. seven or eight minutes. Okay. Well, I, I don't know if it'll take me that long. Will it take, I guess there's a hundred comments, but probably mostly from our friend Sarah, which well, is you fine. Remember, you don't got to read every one of them. I know. I'm going to just, I'll go through them and uh, be right back. All right, brother. I'm going to take you off the screen. There you go. Okay. There we go. And then he'll come back when he's done having a little smoky toky. Okay, so let me just start with the comments. I'm sorry, listeners, if you're listening at Fistful of Radio or Apple Podcast or Podbean, wherever you might be listening. I hope this isn't too, uh, you know, visual. But again, head to the YouTube channel, The Nostalgic Podblast. Hit the live tab and look for the picture of Dan and I with a bunch of movie comic books in the between us that Sarah designed. Hello to Wood Trainer SDG. It says hello from the past. Hello to you. Southern California Sarah says, hello, brother, to Wood Train. Uh, and this was a while back, I think before I got started. Shock Theater Official says, my movie stuff. Hello to you if you're still there. Oh, and Danny, who is taking the smoke break, said, great news. The NASCAR Daytona 500 has rained out. I thought it'd be a great day to go live because there's no football anymore. There's no baseball yet. So I figured now most sports fans probably won't care about comic books, but there are some crossovers, some crossovers that are fans. Oh my gosh. Bob thrash Pondo ponds says, hello, cats and kittens. Hello to you. He has an awesome channel. If you like TV trivia and he does it every Sunday night at seven 30 for about an hour to 90 minutes. And uh, I would highly recommend you check it out. I'll be there uh, in the chat uh, playing TV trivia. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me just go scroll through here. And Sarah says, Chance, I've got your radio on my channel now, meaning on Fistful of Radio, which you can stream from anywhere, fistfulofradio.com. Yeah, I, I, I'm playing the history of Star Trek for its 57th anniversary, which was last year in 2023. It's a repeat, but I thought it was a good show. Uh, and actually, you recommended I r run some of my previous shows about Star Trek, so I picked that just for you by request. And she says, Chance, I've got your radio on my channel now live and your link to radio for your show here in my chat. Love you, brother. Hope it helps. Well, thank you, Sarah. It definitely does help. 
Uh, let me just go through here. A lot of hellos. Um, hello to Nocturnal Miss So. She says, afternoon, a afternoon all. I met her through uh, K-pop. Letter K, letter P, letter O, letter P, underscore J-U-N-K-I's YouTube channel. Katie in Michigan State. Hello to you. Uh, Facebook user. I'll go on Facebook in a minute and see who this is. It doesn't show me. It used to show me who is commenting on Facebook. Someone on Facebook says, so good. Uh, the comic book G-Man says, love it, my man. Thanks for being here, comic book G-Man. Great channel. Check him out. Um, Esmeralda is here. Esmeralda, did you get your cards? Let me know in chat. I, you may not have gone to your P.O. box, but they should be there by now. I mailed you some Grease 1978 Tops cards and some extras, a, a Batman card. Um, so check that out if you're near your P.O. box, if you haven't already got. I'm just wondering if you received them by now. You should have. Uh, let me just go on here. Nocturnal had said, nice. Not sure if I have any Dell or Gold Key comics. I need to keep searching boxes. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, they're a lot of fun. Again, I like the photo coverage. We're going to look at all the monsters in just a little bit. Esmeralda said, my favorites are graphic novels about Harry Dresden. Cool. Uh, and she's in Oregon State. Terrell, how you doing? Says, happy Sunday, Chance. Hello to you, Terrell Eugene Bellinger. Hello, Terrell. And let's see. Going down the list here. Facebook, Fat Comic Book Guy 2246, Dan Comic Channel. Okay. Cooking with Silence is here. Hello to you. Saying hi to Sarah, my flock YouTube channel. <laughs> Danny was joking in chat while I was reading the history of Dell and Gold Key Comics. Wait, did I fall asleep? <laughs> and Sarah laughed at that. Hey, man, we're an educational show. Um, but I hear you. All right. Esmeralda says, I learned so much about the history of things from chance. Thank you. I, I try not to be too boring, but I, I want this to be informative as well as hopefully entertaining. Esmeralda says, I remember when comics were sold in bundles. I always thought it was because at least one of them was not popular. And that was why. And that's part of it. Facebook user found a bunch of gold key comics at an estate sale, the FBI story, et cetera. I bet I know who that is by guessing. That is probably Rick Clark, but I'll get on Facebook in just a moment uh, and, and say the names of the folks that are watching on Facebook Live. We're also on Twitter Live and obviously on YouTube Live um, and Twitch. Esmeralda says, when they sold the bundles of comics, you could see the one on the front and the back, but not what was in between. Correct. That's a great point. And that had a great mystery element to it. Made it a lot of fun. Mm, 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 mm. And Nocturnal Miss So says, um, same, still bad as Xfinity. Yeah, no, they have great internet though, but as a company, they sort of suck with their customer service and they sneak up that bill on you. You got to watch that statement from uh, Xfinity. You sure do. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me just go down the list here. Terrell has said hey to Dan in South Carolina. And 1995 was great on eBay, says a Facebook watcher. We got on in 1999. Yeah, I started in 98 or 99 myself. Yep. That's when it all began. I mean, in 1995, that's when Windows 95 came out. It was so primitive, you know, and so slow. And you had that AOL. You've got mail. Let's see. Cooking with Silence says, oh, shit. His baby mama is catching up with him. I don't know what he's talking about. One of them says Cooking with Silence. Uh, let's just continue on here. End of, this is a new uh, viewer. Individuals. Individual list. I see mind. That's an interesting YouTube identity. YouTube ID, individual list 
icy mind. Cool. It says, wow, we not sure enough. A wall of some cool graphics of comics. Wow, we not sure enough. A wall of some cool graphics of comics. Interesting. Let me just continue down. Almost done. Hello. Yep. And there, there I'm going to, I'm putting on the screen. Sorry, listeners. I know this is very visual oriented. I'm just putting that uh, YouTube channel on the screen because I'm probably misspeaking it. Individual list. I C M I N D. Dan, I see you backstage. Okay. I'm going to bring you right back on. <laughs> Debbie does Dallas, the comic book said someone on Facebook. That's got to be Rick Clark. Got to be Rick Clark. I know your sense of humor, bro. Uh, individual said no info on comics. Just enjoy people talking about them. Just like the guy from Jay and silent Bob. It's a massive comic guy, which I don't know till later on. <laughs> I know. Okay. I know well, we're through the history part. Uh, let me bring Dan right back on. Hello, Dan. How was that smoke break? That was a good one. It had been a long time. I don't usually go like an hour and a half without smoking. No, that's cool. I, I mean, usually, I'll be honest. I'm a chain smoker. I smoke, you know, like a pack a day. Sometimes more. Go. I smoked a pack a day. I quit in September 2010, and I smoked a pack, and half a pack to a pack. General, on average, about half a pack when I smoked. I like Marlboro, Marlboro Lights. What yeah, I, smoke, I smoke cigars. Oh, I do you inhale? Cheyenne, Cheyenne filtered cigars. They're, they're less in nicotine, less in, in bad for you stuff, more natural tobacco. Even though I smoke, I'm still trying not to kill myself. Oh. Esmeralda says, I like to play with things, so I never leave anything in packaging. I know it destroys the value. But, hey, you know, things are meant to be enjoyed, right? Not just to hold up and look at like a beer in a beer commercial on TV. Um, Facebook user, the grading companies are really backed up half a year plus turnaround. Yeah. And CGC was hiring new people to get caught up, but uh, then the scandal broke. So I don't know what's going on with them. Jim's camera at dawn says, greetings, everyone. Hello to you. And individual says, thanks for the shout out back in the day. I thought it was just Batman, Superman. Oh, sh oh, shit. Batman. Ooh. I have no answer. By the way, I want to bring up a point I was going to mention about Batman. Interesting. Wouldn't Batman have made a great gold key comic, but because DC owned it, that never happened. That would have sold so huge. Don't you think, Dan? Oh, yeah. Well, the, actually, uh, the DC comics were based, a few of them, on the TV show. You can tell by the art that it's the Adam West and Burt Ward, Batman and Robin. I've actually got an old Batman around here somewhere from back in that time period. Yeah, I just, I can't you just see though a gold key, like a monster's cover? I'm going to get to the covers in just a moment. Uh, a gold key cover of Batman that all, with all that great color, the colorfulness of it. Oh, that Bam, awesome. that, you know, it's, it's too bad because of licensing and legal rights that could never happen. Esmeralda, compliment you, Dan. That is impressive. Dan, talking about your collection. Jim's camera at Don says, Dan, did she photo cowboy Bob Ellis, your mom? Uh, I don't think so. I know Cowboy Bob Orton, Cowboy Ron Bass, and about 20 others like Blackjack Mulligan. She did a lot of cowboy stuff, but I don't remember that guy. Very cool. Uh, and, and Facebook, probably Rick Clark, says the company I worked for did the printing for WCW. Talking about wrestling. <laughs> Esmeralda says Al Rocks. Talking about Al Hardy. How about that? Well, if you want to do the crossover real quick, I've got quite a few um, wrestler based comic books. <laughs> Let's do that. Why don't Why don't we do that? You want me to grab a couple off the wall? Yeah. Well, why not? And well, I'll finish. I'm wrapping up on the comments, and I'll I'll stay current. Uh, Terrell says the Simpsons actually had its own series of comics back in the day. Yes, they did. And to your point, individual says the Simpsons. Oh wow. Uh, hang on, listeners. Almost done with this. Okay. So real quick, if you're going to talk wrestling, you got we just want to talk some wrestling comics. I've got this one from 2014, which is Randy Orton versus the Wyatt family. And this is a really cool cover because two members of the Wyatt family, Luke Harker and Bray Wyatt, have passed away recently. And this was the last comic book cover that had them on the front of it. Oh, wow. Now, I love that comic book. Then you got the Faces of Foley, which is about uh, the wrestler named Mick Foley, which is Mankind and Dude Love. 
and you got this comic which has all his characters in it. Another wrestling based comic book. And of course, it wouldn't be cool if you didn't have the zero WWE release of The Undertaker. Nice. In, I love The Undertaker. In his own comic book. And this is one of my favorites because it's a, it was a wizard one off, and it's a, an issue number zero. And you know, most of them start with a number one, but this is a zero, and I love the zero issues. And my main man sent this to me himself, the boogeyman, Jimmy Valiant. And this is his first comic book, which is relatively a new one from 2020. That's awesome, man. They have that personal touch, right? What I hate about quite a few wrestling comics. That's pretty neat, man. You got a cool collection. What I hate about grading in terms of autographs, like say, you know, you were there with the famous person that signed your item, but unless it's witnessed, I don't like how with CGC, for instance, not to, I'm not trying to pick on CGC, but it's not really recognized unless you have an authenticator or a handwriting expert give you some sort of proof. And I hate that because I have Walt Simonson, who has a very unique autograph, talked about him earlier. He signed the first Beta Ray bill thor 337 at a convention back in 1983 when i was just a little kid i know it's real but to the grading companies it's not real it's, there's no proof mm. so what do you think about that well once again you got the autograph authenticators that they can bring in to give you the authentication thing but it costs a little bit extra uh, Terrell asked, did Gold Key ever have its own superheroes in the vein of DC and Marvel? They had their own characters. Yes. We talked about it at the top of the show in the historical area. If you want to go back after we're live and replay it, we we're talked about that. Okay. Esmeralda Chance, they have not arrived as of Friday, but the bad okay. weather may have delayed them. Talk about Dale. Dale. Dale turned Dracula into a superhero. I have a couple of issues of that. Dracula, the superhero comic book. Have you ever seen them or heard of I them? I have. I've seen the Dark Shadows Gold Key, which is Dracula themed, but not that. Uh, Esmeralda, about the grease cards I mailed, um, Sarah gave her prize to Esmeralda. She says they've not arrived as of Friday, but the bad weather may have delayed them. They should be there hopefully by tomorrow in your P.O. box if you get a chance to look. Here's the number six. Thing. Here's the number six from 72 where they turned Dracula into a superhero fighting crime in the big city. Oh my god, I've never even heard of that. Yeah, it's an offbeat it's an offbeat comic. It's very kind of hard to find too. But I'm a Dracula guy. Like I said, I've got a ton of anything that says Dracula on it from my horror movie stuff. If it says Dracula on it, I usually pick it up just for the heck of it. That's pretty cool. Uh I have a whole whole collection of vampire comics. Hey, our friend Sarah in Southern California says, I love Star Trek and X-Men comics the best. Uh, let's see if we have any questions for you, Dan. Um, individuals, individual list, I see mind. I'm, I'm probably screwing that up. Says, I could not really go from bubble to bubble because the bubble I grew up on was popped. LOL. I barely read book unless it was like facts book or a biography books, hence kind of why, okay, individualistic mind. Okay, well, to each their own, that's fine. I'm sorry, we're an educational show. I'm sorry. Um, individual, Sarah says to him, cool, he talks about music. Oh, that's very cool. Okay, well, that, I'd, I'd like to check out your channel. If you have creation, yeah, stuff you great. That's pretty cool. Let me make sure I'm not skipping anybody. Uh, 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 uh. Since we're talking about music, let me point out. I just picked these up, and these are really cool. Iron Maiden has just come out with a new set of comic books called Legacy of the Beast, and it's um uh, Iron Maiden from the Eddie character. Oh my God! Hold that pause. I created with my friend Danny Cochran. We did the origin of Eddie when we were kids. I I found that artwork the other day does it cover well, yes yeah, told another one of your comic books because legacy of the beast is the origin of eddie and oh my books. god D did he did he kill his parents we I, had haven't, I haven't opened them and i haven't looked at them i just picked them up this yesterday i i shouldn't put this up this is terrible but in my story eddie like oh i, I don't even want to say it but it, yeah don't he say tried it. To kill his folks his mom lived and his mom went after him with a with a um with a hatchet 
and then she shot his his arm off, his mom's arm off. Anyway, uh, and then she um she shot him dead, and they're like, "Do you want to have him buried?" And she goes, "Fry the sucker!" So they the the uh, they they take a blowtorch and torch up Eddie and he rises from the dead out of the flames on our comic book. Anyway, I, that's all I'll say about that. But we did a crazy origin of Eddie. Sorry. Go ahead. I've got to, I've got to be real prepared. So I've got like hundreds of comic books all around me so I can go to any pile and try to pick out whatever you bring up, even rock and roll or whatever. I have oh, quite yeah. a few rock and roll comics besides Iron Maiden. You know, I've got like the Alice Cooper comic books, Kiss comic books. Do you have the quite Kiss magazine with the blood? Um, not the original big one they done. Most of the Kiss comics I have are newer releases from the 90s. Up. It's hard to get the old 1980s and 70s Kiss comics. Do you have their appearance in Howard the Duck, Kiss? No, I don't have. I had some Howard the Duck stuff, but I recently gave that away to a friend of mine. You have a big heart. You give a lot of stuff away. Yeah, I've wow. given away about, I give away about 10,000 comic books this year so far. <laughs> is it is it to orphans, uh, needy charities? Who, Most of the people this? who just send me these little, they send me these emails, you know, and they'll talk about a comic book and they'll send me their address and I'll pop them off one. Well, I, I've got too many. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get rid of a lot of the superhero stuff. So anybody that sends me an um, email and talks about like, like the X Men or the Joker comics or Superman comics, I got some for you. Free. Just, I'm getting rid of them. But how do you know it's not a dealer pretending to be a collector? I that's don't, just gonna if somebody an address, you know, I don't care. Damn, I hate to put that out there. Okay, man. I don't want you to be taken advantage of. No, Shit, I'm, I'm giving them away. I'm giving them away. Anyway. I don't <laughs> um, individual I just, I just my friend Eric, um, who runs a channel called Paranormal Highway. Sarah, please put that link in the chat. And he's one of my best friends. I sent him the uh, last Starfighter comic book. Because he was a big last Starfighter fan. So I just sent that out last week and he got that and he was like, oh, I can't believe you found one. I want to thank you for turning me on to the Mongolian Monster Channel about Bigfoot and other phenomenon, Stevie and Mon they're great people. They're on live yeah, Tuesday the best night people I know. in Florida. Yeah, they're they're great. I like their show. You know, that was that was like the first live stream I ever went on and talked to anybody on, probably. They're a lot of fun. Um he was the one who got my courage up to come on and actually talk about stuff on YouTube. And that was be before I really ever even had a channel much, you know. Wow. I think I put up like five or six videos when I first talked to him. Uh, individual says, Batman is my favorite. They had an auction for his car back in the day. Yeah, several. Because there's replicas. And yeah, yes, sir. Uh, Jim's camera. I just, video, I just watched a video where the wrestler named Jerry Lawler bought huh? the Batmobile. Now, I think it might have been one of the original Batmobiles used in the TV show, and he bought it, and it's at his house. Well, that's pretty damn cool. Damn. He He's a he great artist, it. Too. Does he wax it? <laughs> Keep it in good shape? with garage yeah, yeah. In the video. Damn, that's freaking cool. Do you remember the Space Giants? Used to run on TBS. It was a Japanese import. It was like a monster show. It was like Ultraman's. Spectrum. I remember something like that. I thought it was called Godzilla. Battle of the Planets G Force or something. Is that that's an anime. This was a live action show. Okay. I, then you don't, that's fine because I'm going to show some clips of that later in the comic book. Uh, I should get to some comics. But, but I do got a Battle of the Planets comic book around here somewhere. You do? Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. I almost caught up on the comments. Uh, Jim's camera at dawn says Danny is near one of the black beauties used in the Green Hornet show. You know what that means? The, the, I, think, I, think I, I think I just got called a bad guy. No, I think he, he's talking about your background. Do you have a green hornet back there? I absolutely somewhere in one of these boxes have a green hornet comic book. Not on the wall? Okay, I don't see Not it. on the wall. I haven't reviewed it. Anything you see on the wall is something I have talked about and made a video on on the Daily Damn blog. If one of these comic books has been wrote on the side. You see the little, the date, the number and on the front of it like these, like these night stalkers. You can, you, you, I have talked about it and made a video about it on YouTube. I have hundreds of comic book videos on the Dunny Dan blog. What's weird is that they didn't have the issue number. I talked about it earlier on the gold key front covers. Remember, my friend Dan was arguing with you, and of course, we're right. He was wrong. Nothing against him. But it is weird they don't have the issue numbers on those gold key front covers. Uh, a lot of the Dells are the same way, too. You just, 
they don't put the information's on the inside the you actually have to open the book and look inside the cover to get the information. I usually try to write it on the back of a comic like this once I open it up so I don't have to open it back up again. That's pretty but I very rarely open them if I'm not looking at them. Esmeralda says, I love Dark Shadows. Uh, I gave I have, Al Hardy I have Dark the whole run. I have the entire run of the original Dark Shadows series. Number one through, what, 36? Every Dark Shadows comic book ever made in the day. It's the only one, I, the only series I have the whole run on right now. I gave Al my copy of Dark Shadows 1. He should have it on his wall of his home studio. Uh, let's see. Facebooker says, went to a WCW match at Center Stage. Sting was there giving out little purple Scorpion Sting cars. Pretty cool. That's got to be uh, Rick Clark saying that. And he says, I used to direct some of those matches at Center Stage when I worked at Turner. That's, that might be Al Hardy. That's probably Al Hardy. I can't see who the hell it is on Facebook, but I'll get on there in a second. Um, this says Facebook user. We're going to talk about the monsters here in a second. I'm almost caught up on the comments. You know, uh, I've got a monsters up. comic book or two. I got some of the, I got an original one from the original run, and I've got some of the newer ones they come out with. Somewhere. Esmeralda says to you, Alice Cooper had a comic. Alice is fantastic. Alice Cooper has had a bunch of comic books. He actually, they actually a whole new run, a whole new Alice Com Cooper series that come out. As a matter of fact, if you go to the fat comic book guy, I think I just put up the um, Alice Cooper comic book covers for the new comics for this month. It's ah. three of them come out this month. Uh, individual says, yeah, comics was not my cup of tea. Well, I'm going to show some covers, photo covers of TV shows you probably liked. So hang in there. But he says, yeah, comics was not my cup of tea. So I could not read the comics with all the bubbles till I got older. And I just really didn't care to read them. Not only a classic rock band, but a comic book. Meaning his channel is talking to Sarah. I think he's referring to what Sarah said about his channel being about rock and roll. Uh, Thrash has got to take off. Great to see you. We'll try to make it back. If not, hope to see you on my channel at 730. Bob's TV Trivia, 730. Hey, time. I'm wearing a Thrash Pondo Ponds official T-shirt on this live stream. There you go, very Ponds. Cool. Very, very cool. A Ponds save every one of us. Terrell says, while not a comic per se, I will always have a soft spot for Charles Adams' original Adams Family cartoons. The characters weren't even named until the original sitcom came to existence. Yeah, and that was in um, the Saturday Evening Post, was it? The Charles Adams, Adams Family? I want to say Saturday Evening Post, but it might have been uh, the New Yorker. I, I think it was the New Yorker. I think it was the New Yorker. New Yorker? Okay, someone in chat will know. I swear to it, I don't remember. But like you, it seems New Yorker more, but sticks out in my mind a little bit more. Ah, it was me, Tom, Basil Chesterman. Okay, he's talking about directing Turner. I should have known because Al was in the film department. I wasn't thinking. Tom is a director currently with the Weather Channel people, but he used to work at T uh, Turner Classic Movies and uh, Cartoon Network and uh, before that, Superstation 17. That's how he met Al. They worked together in the 80s. Pretty damn cool. I know Al Hardy left Turner in 1991, he said. Anyway, um... Jim's camera at dawn says, and Tom may join us on camera later. He's uh, he's busy right now, but he texted me. He may come on. Jim's camera at dawn says the owner of Black Beauty lives near Inman, South Carolina. Oh, he's talking about the Green Hornet's car. Yeah, yeah. Who goes to the shows and the auto shows and shows off the car? Yeah, I know who he's talking about now. It just Man, I'm clear. sorry, Jim. You must have thought, what an idiot! The car. Yeah, I, I'm very familiar yeah. with the car. I, 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 I was when I hear Black Beauty, I think about a stupid horse. This, Oh, man. And as Marilla says, I have to check that out about Alice Cooper. Thanks for the info, Dan. All right. Now, I think we're all caught up and we can start showing some comic books. And I know you'll have a lot of input. Uh, let's see here. It was the New Yorker. Okay. Thank God oh, no. it entered my mind the correct thing. I hate to make mistakes. So the New Yorker magazine had the Adams Family by Charles Adams uh, strip. The Adams, comic, the Adams Family comic book is another comic book that has eluded me over the years. I haven't never even seen one. And those didn't come along till the 70s, until after the show, long after the show was canceled. 
Really? I didn't know that. But I knew they were out there. I'd seen the covers on YouTube and stuff, but I'd never had one or I'd never seen one in person. Esmeralda says, Dan, to you, Dan, I've been going to Alice Cooper concerts since Welcome to My Nightmare in the 1970s. Yeah, I seen my mom took me when I was like 10 years old to see Alice Cooper. So that was in 75 or seven, something like that. I've seen yeah. Alice Cooper quite a few times since. And my sister and her husband just went recently and saw Alice Cooper last year. Let's and they start sent me videos from the concert and I put them up on my channel. So there you go. You do? Say your channel again. You can find me on the Daily Dan blog. The Daily Dan blog. Well, we're going to start. But I, mostly, I, mostly I do a paranormal investigations and Bigfoot and cryptid stuff on that channel. But I do do a comic book review once a week. Very, very nice, Dan. Hope any any other comic book stuff you want to see, you have to go to my comic book channel. Now, we're going to start with some television shows that were adapted into comic book format. Here's a Dell series, and they didn't have any photo covers from this show. This was an anthology show. Let's just put up issue number one from December 31st, 1963. The Outer Limits. The, oh, that's the Outer Limits. limits. Another one, you know, I do not think I have an Outer Limits comic book, but I've got quite a few Twilight Zones, old and new. Wow. So the Outer Limits aired on Monday night in season one on ABC. It only lasted for 49 weekly episodes. It was canceled in the middle of its second season. What's interesting to me, Dan, is that a lot of times after these TV shows were canceled, the comic books continued on. They were based oh, yeah. on these TV shows. Now, I'm going to show you issue three. I have this in the background. No, more I'm not going to show all of these covers. I'm about to show all the monsters in just a sec in just a minute or two. But uh, I like that cover. Let me see where it is behind me. Here it is behind me. Ah! Yeah. There it is. Um, Here's a cover I like of Outer Limits. And that, by the way, I didn't mention the year, did I? This was published on June 30th, 1964. The show was still on the air at that point. It was uh, in production. It just started production of its second season at that point in time when that book came out. I like this. I like flying saucer covers. And this one's pretty bad ass, I think. This is from December 31st, 1964. The show was just about to be canceled. It was canceled. Last new episode aired in January 65. Check out these. Hang on. Let me make you big. Uh, 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 uh. Hang on a second, brother. Wait a minute. Here's a oh, UFO nice. Posters. I love this one. This is what I actually had back in the, my youth, and when I and I got rid of it, and when I saw another copy, I had to pick it up. And here's another great one. This is the number two from the UFO and Flying Saucer series of 1970, and that's one of my favorite UFO covers. Now, you didn't write on the comic book. That's on the plastic bag. It's on the plastic. Right? Let, I me know know. That, <laughs> let me know that I've reviewed angry it. angry girlfriend variant joke there. Yeah, all right. all right. I was the victim of the angry girlfriend variant. We won't go there. All right, so. Yeah, I need to been there. Do, um, let's see here. Let me go and show another book. I love that flying. Now, I like this cover, too. This one uh, was published at long after the show was off the air. This is issue number 12 from March 31st, 1967. Now, listeners, I that cover. listeners, I know, listeners, this is going to be extremely visual, extremely boring to the listener out of Atlanta, Fistful of Radio, or uh, wherever you might be listening. So go to the YouTube channel, The Nostalgic Podblast, hit the live tab. And you'll see Dan and I with comic books between us. Del we can always book. describe the cover as this large green creature comes up over a roller coaster at an amusement park somewhere in caveman days. What? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the last issue of The Outer Limits. This was released on uh, September 30th, 1969. And it was a reprint of the second issue. That's what I didn't like about Dell and Gold Key. Towards the end of the run, they would start reprinting the covers and the issues themselves. Yeah. Of stuff they'd already published. But that's, that's yeah, how they're, they're, doing doing better, they're doing better than these guys that put out the walking dead comic books. I got 
15 issues of number one with different covers. I fell for it two or three times. I'd see Walking Dead and I'd buy it kind of cool cover and it'd be the same number one over and over and over. Oh, I bet I got, three, I got three copies of the number one. One of them in black and white. Yeah, and then you have these collections too. There's a Walking oh, Dead. Uh, Walking Dead. Reprint of the first several issues. I've made up my mind. I'm not re I'm not buying nothing else that says Walking Dead on it. Ooh. I'm through with the Walking Dead. Let's get to the monsters now. I want to show some monsters issues, and God, I gotta take a whiz, but uh, that's the sides of point. Um, look at this cover. I love seeing the monsters in color. That's the cool thing about this particular series. I love these monsters. Good, get that. I have to go to the restroom. Let's just all marvel at this cover, listeners. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. It's going to be pretty visual for the next half hour or so. I'm going to go through these covers. But check that out. Now, I, I, I'll be right back, Dan. I've got to... Uh, These are 97, Monsters. Let me make you big. Hang on. Let me... Uh, All righty. So, you going to the bathroom, and I'm just going to entertain everybody, right? Okay. Keep it clean. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I'll, I'll leave the vampire erotica put up for right now. There's a copy of the Monsters, and this is one of my favorites, and I'm going to show Chance when he gets back. This one actually has the little package from where they had the Monsters bubblegum cards. I hear that cover for the bubblegum cards are very rare and very popular. So I guess I'll go through some comic books while Chance takes a break. All right, join me as we look through old Westerns. I'm showing you first this Beetle Bailey cover, an original Beetle Bailey on Dell. I love the old Beetle Bailey comics, even though I don't have a bunch of them. But earlier he was talking about when Dell first started back in the old days, they did Western comic books. So I'll go through a few Western comic books for you. Like Gene Autry. I don't know if anybody out there is even old enough to know who Gene Autry was. But I love Gene Autry, and I also love his really cool horse champion. Who got his own comic book in 1958, as well as a really classic. Now, this was a TV show that some of you may remember. They showed it on PBS quite a lot. And it was the Cisco Kid. That's right. Cisco Kid, the comic book adaptation. How many of y'all out there in, in YouTube land ever had the Red Rider BB gun when you were a kid? Remember the old Red Rider BB gun? You would cock, you'd pump, and oh, you yeah. would do the... Shoot the BB gun in the backyard thing? Well, check this out. Did you know Red Rider was a TV show and a comic book? And the BB guns you bought as a kid were actually based on the Red Rider comic book and TV series. Now, this is a really cool old book I picked up, and I have to love it a lot. It's the Annette Funicello Zorro cover. Yeah, I love Zorro. Zorro was a great comic book. This one's from 1959. Wow. Oh, he's back. Have you ever seen that cover? Keep going. Keep going. I'm loving it. Yeah, Guy Williams. His real name was Armando Catalino by birth. Okay. Now, here's a, here's a couple of, well, I got quite a few of these. I'll go through them fast as I can. And this was a um, Wide Eagle, the Indian Chief Comics. I don't know. A lot of people probably won't remember. This is a very, a very offbeat series of Indian Chief comics. White Eagle, the Indian Chief on some of the older ones. 1950s. Most of these are 57 and 58. But I have quite a lot of them because I found a guy who was selling a collection. And all of them, what I really like is all of them are probably 9s or 9.5s. They're all in excellent condition. And then I have some of these. Jace Pearson's the Texas Rangers. Now, you got to remember, Texas Rangers was where Lone Ranger spun off from. And I got the original Texas Rangers before the spinoffs of the Lone Ranger. As well as, yo ho, the Lone Rangers Horse Silver. Now, these are some real rare comics you hardly ever find from the early 1950s. This one right here is 1954. And I actually got some Lone Ranger, but they're up on the wall. I'll have to pull them to show you. Um, here's a Rex Allen. These are comic books. Most people in this comic watching this show probably won't remember because they're all 50s and come out way before most people were ever, ever even born. Has anybody ever heard of King of the Royal Mountain? 
That's a Canadian comic book about a Canadian hero. I thought that was really cool. I like these Tonto comics too because you hardly ever see comic books that, with the Long Ranger that don't have the Long Ranger in them. But Tonto has adventures on his own in this series of comics from the late 40s and early 50s. I did not know that. Yeah, there's a whole series of Tonto before the Long Ranger and after the Long Ranger gets killed, he goes on. Wow. This is real popular with Native Americans. Anybody know who Dale Evans is? I do. Uh, Dale Evans, he had a husband named Roy Rogers. Yeah, <laughs> and, a, and a horse named Trigger Roy had. And there's Roy Rogers. And that's an original Roy Rogers, too, from 1957. And, of course, Roy Rogers had a horse named Trigger. And, of course, Trigger had his own comic book series, too, because, you know, he's a horse. I always joke that I wish I had Mr. Ed and not Trigger. <laughs> let's, a, let's a look at, the, at a handful of old Western Dale from back in the day, champ. I, I, mean, I want to see cover. this monsters real quick. I don't know if you saw it. But this old Monsters comic I got from it's from 1997. It's one of the new series of Monster comics. And check it out. It's got the little original 60s bubblegum card pack in there with it. Amazing. Yeah, I found that. I found them at different times, but I put them together because I thought it would look cool. Keep going, my friend, because I love Westerns. That's my blind spot. I love Westerns, but I don't know a whole lot about them. So keep going. More westerns? Oh my god! Okay, I got a few more westerns. No, you don't have to do just westerns. I, I don't mean to throw you off. <laughs> just, just keep going. It doesn't matter. You don't have to stay on westerns. I'm, I was just throwing. Well, I've got a bunch of these westerns, but they're gold key, not Dale. They're the Bonanza series. That was a house cover, and I've got a couple of these up on the wall too. But whenever I saw the Bonanzas in such great shape at a reasonable price, I couldn't help picking them up because they had the original Lauren Green covers, the original. Michael Landon covers. And this one has, has to be the number two, the old one of the oldest ones from 1962. And I so got lucky when I found the number two of Bonanza. And it's the original cover with all of them on it. Wow, man. And to me, that's probably my favorite Bonanza comic book that I have. I have a lot of modern stuff like Jonah Hex, but I won't go into all the Jonah Hex modern stuff. I think we should move on from Westerns before we bore everybody with Cowboys. You good? No, I'm serious because there's so much more to get to, Chad. All right. Well, what Besides, you got? That was about that was about most of my Westerns. That's what I was telling you about earlier, though. I said I do have a Battle of the Planets. Nice. Nice. Yeah, I love new one, man. Well, I can't wait till I get to Space Giants. I found some wild clips I'm going to share with folks later on. Okay, you got to work on it. I've got a catastrophe happen. Are you okay? Well, let me let me uh, now. Uh, uh, I have like sure. one second. Oh. Okay. Now uh, let's see here. Terrell says I didn't realize that the actor who played Doctor John Robinson in Lost in Space, Guy Williams, real name Armando Catalino was a guy who played Zorro in the original Disney TV show until I watched the reruns of the preteen. Yeah, the Disney Channel used to run Zorro from the 50s all the time. You ever be going through a pile of comic books and find one you have no clue where it come from or when you bought it or what it is? Yeah. <laughs> I, all the time. I guess, I guess when I bought one of the other comic books, this one must have been stuck to the back of it. And I've never even heard of Atomic Mouse. <laughs> It's an old comic book, too, with a 12-cent cover. Oh, man. I, I, have I, have that, no, I have no clue where this thing come from. <laughs> I have that Space Family Robinson behind you with the pterodactyl. Really? I have that. And uh, and can you pull that time tunnel behind you? And then I'll get back to the Munsters. I'm stalling in case Tom wants to jump on. He's a Munsters fanatic and expert. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Look at that. Let me make take the comment off so you can see. Look at That's that. number two. Look at that. That's not a photo cover, obviously, but it's a nice painted cover. Well, it's got Gorgeous. the photo at the top. 
The show only lasted one season, 30 episodes. It runs on MeTV. Saturday, mo- technically Sunday morning, Saturday night. Esmeralda says the best horse is Mr. Ed. We're talking about I know, I'm looking for Mr. Ed. Mr. Ed's another one on my list of walks. And Jim's camera at Dawn says, I've got stories of all Jim, my... There's something you brought up earlier. My little brother and sister. I can't, tell you, I can't tell you what numbers they are because they don't put them on the front. But I just picked these up recently and I have the... Nice. That's with Dan Hill. Hey, he quit the show. He was a devout... Um, he was devoutly into Judaism. And so he quit on religious reasons. And then... Uh, uh, the brother of James Arness took over. Who's the brother of James Arness? Do you know, Dan? Not really. I Marshall, can't Matt Dillon, Peter Graves, Peter Graves. And he yeah, took over as the head of the IMF, <laughs> Impossible Missions Force, in season two of that show. But Dan Hill, who you just showed on the front of the cover, he was the original head, and he was only in season one of Mission Impossible, the original. You know, I'll be honest with you. I haven't seen an episode of Mission Impossible probably in 25 years. Do you get me TV? Yeah, but it's not one. one of, right now, I'm currently rewatching all the Wild Wild West, and I'm like 25 episodes behind yeah. in season two or something. Yeah. Season Maybe one season. was in black and white. <clears throat> that was the Yeah, I know, but, but they messed me up because they only showed like the first 10 episodes in black and white. Then they jumped to season two. So there's quite a few episodes I didn't get to see. I love me TV, but I think they have a new program directors making all sorts of mistakes, skipping episodes of Beverly Hillbillies that they think are not politically correct and the like. And it never used to be that way. They skipped an episode of Matlock that dealt with a stripper. I mean, th- this is TV. I mean, this is not nudity. I mean, what the hell? Anyway, but I digress. Um, you're getting a compliment, several compliments, but Wood Train says, I got a crap load of Mad Magazine. So do I. Do you collect Mad or did you collect Mad? Dan? Well, I've got actually got some Mad Magazines I just got, but I, I, I look through them and I plan on giving them away and sending them to people. I don't really collect them. I got, I got a friend that really likes Mad Magazine, so I'm probably going to send them to him. To Bob. Thrash yeah. Planet Fun. Esmeralda says, oh, I'm more than old enough to know who Gene Autry is, to your point a while back. I'm, I'm behind mm-hmm. on the comments. Comments. There's my southern accent. Well, um, most, most people... Wouldn't know who Gene Autry or Roy or Rex or Durango Kid or any of these guys was. Right. And I, you were taught, I, I, I sort of spoke over you. I want to make sure you heard this comment. Jim had a lot of stuff torn up by his little brother and sister when he was growing up. <laughs> a lot of collectibles. Uh, to you, Dan. Dan, how many comics do you have, if you know? Polar's asking. Polar Kaiju. I, don't, I, I quit counting when it hit a million. What? Yeah. Oh my goodness! I only have fifteen thousand. Well, I've got probably close to that here, but I have a storage unit that's running over. Actually, three oh. storage units that's running over. But oh my! I, I need to come with a whole bunch of cash and <laughs> and, a, and a truck and a truck. Oh my god! Oh I, my I got god. I'm coming over. I got other stuff besides comic books too. Lots of other stuff. Still images. Publicity images. Well, I need to come over. You invited me. Definitely taking you up on that. No reason not to. I'm so close in here in Georgia. Yeah. Well, feel free to come up and bring some money and give it to me because I will sell a lot of this stuff. Stephen Hill, not Dan Hill. You're right, Terrell. It was Stephen Hill who was the original uh, actor in Mission Impossible who played the leader of the IMF. You're right. I don't know why I said Dan Hill. I'm thinking of Dan in South Carolina. <laughs> Stephen Hill. Yes, and he quit based on religious reasons. It was interfering with his uh, worship. And uh, pretty interesting. Um, I'm not even going to cut. He was in a good fugitive season three, too. With, um, you ever watch Arrested Development, Dan? I think I saw it once or twice. It wasn't really my cup of tea. A young Jessica Walter was in an episode of The Fugitive opposite uh, Stephen Hill, a black and white. Anyway, enough said. Nobody cares. <laughs> uh, Wood Train wants to know do you collect sports cards at all? Dan. No, I've got a few. I, I, I actually had like 10,000 wrestling cards from WCW and WWF, but once again, that stuff I've gave away. And I, I, as a matter of fact, I picked up a book earlier when we were getting ready to go live and we were talking and I picked up one of these books and one of them was just slapped full and falling out everywhere of wrestling cards and stuff that I still didn't even know I still had laying around. 
Very cool. Uh, that's going to take me three hours to clean this mess up in here. As you move around, you don't have to pull it. I see the Ripley's Believe It or Not behind you. Yeah. Pretty and cool. My favorite are these Night Stalkers uh, that are based on the original Carl Kolschak TV series. Yeah. Now, they were, when I found out they existed, I had to have them. Uh, Wood Train says, is this Danny Staten in the flesh? Because usually you have like a uh, a little image up. <laughs> yes, it is him. Uh, Jim's asking you, Dan should change his avatar to the amazing comic book Dan. <laughs> well, I do have a comic book channel just for comic books. You What's can it find called? It's called the Fat Comic Book Guy. I need to subscribe to that. I didn't know that. No, I dropped a link in chat earlier. Maybe Sarah, if she's still around, to do it again. I don't Damn. know if she's still watching. I didn't, how did I not know that? I feel so stupid. Wood Train says WWE cards today, the new ones are worth a lot. WWE Select. Really? I just gave away about a thousand of them to a friend of mine in New York that has a wrestling channel. <coughs> Okay, now I feel like a real nickel and dimer. I'm talking about giving away five Batman 89 cards, five Star Wars 77 Tops cards, uh, 1977 Star Wars comic book. You're giving away the big stuff. Good grief. And uh, Witch Train also says I have over 250,000. Well, well, let me point out something that the people, some of the people I'm sending like thousand wrestling cards from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Or people who sent me stuff. I'm not just saying, hey, here, here you go, buddy. You know, this guy sent me a lot of stuff, and I thought, well, I ought to send him something back. That's an important distinction. Uh, but the, guy, the guy I sent that stuff to sent me this incredible 20 pounds of gold, <gasps> gigantic, full-size wrestling belt that belonged to Andre the Giant. So. Holy smoke. And Andre the, the Giant, the original yeah. Bigfoot on the $6 million man. Yeah, this, this belt was made for Andre the Giant, and he was supposed to win it, but he passed away and did not never get to win it. So it's never been worn, but it was designed for Andre the Giant. Oh, my God. He was, supposed to, he was supposed to win that, but never did. So when, when my friend decided to bestow that on me as kind of a reward for being his first moderator on his channel, you know, I sent him quite a few things. See you later, Jim. Um, let's see here. And you Here's can find him at Matt Keto and Wrestling. Wow. Wood Train says, uh, B Ron Breaker finally signed to WWE main roster SmackDown. Yeah, that's one of them Steiners, right? All right. He just said that. Yep. Right when you said that. Rick Steiner's son. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I'm done. I'm going to get back to the Monster comic book covers. I just love seeing his in. In color, I didn't. I don't think I mentioned this yet. This was released issue one on December thirty first, nineteen sixty four. I know I showed it, but I just want to put that back up on the screen because I think it's a really awesome cover. Just seeing them in color. Do you think that show would have been better in color or in black and white? I liked it in color. In the movie, yeah, because you had a movie that was released ironically right after the show was canceled. Only lasted two seasons. <laughs> Monster Go Home in full color. So they were still the way they looked, the same age, still young-ish, all the main characters. Of course, you had different Marilyn Munster between the seasons, you know, Beverly Owen, Pat Priest, and whatnot. And Pat but, but you know what the most controversial cover of the original series was, don't you? Have you ever heard of the story? Yeah, but tell us. The tell story, that story. That, that the Monsters comic book, the original one that come out um, 1968. Number 16 is the only one that you'll find that's got Herman Monster smoking a doobie on it. How cool is that? I'm going to show you. Have you it. ever heard of it? Have you ever seen it? I did not know that. No, I'll be honest. I didn't know that. <gasps> Look at that. It looks like he's blowing into the tire, though. Herman is so he's blowing up the tire. Look, look, Herman is so puffed up. Oh, it's a double yeah, on top. It made it look like where he's smoking a doobie, see? Oh, yeah. Instead of blowing up the tire. Yeah, it's, it's a trick cover. Double entendre. It's supposed to be blowing up the tire, but it's really a doobie he's hitting. Uh, Esmeralda says, either way is fun referring to the monsters in black and white or in color. 
So let's get back to, yeah. I mean, uh, da, 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 da. Sarah's requesting I do a dual shot. So I'll let her play director. Well, that is best when we're just talking like this. I don't know. I, I don't like to look at my ugly, ugly I'm mug. I like to look okay. at my Oh, shit. No, wait, 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 wait. No, don't, don't. What did you do? What did I do? Uh, I hid my face for one minute while I do something. Okay. Um, 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 um. Got it. Okay, now we're both together again. And wow. I can now get back to the comic books. So, <clears throat> Gold Key Monsters. Let's move on to issue two. That's number one from December 31st, 64. There's the second issue from March 31st, 1965. Let me go through these quickly. It says, Lily gets such a charge out of Herman. She could die laughing. <laughs> See what she did there. There's issue three from July 10th, 1965. How many issues are you going to go through? All of them, but there's not that many. I'm going to go oh. through every single cover. Uh, how many um, are there? Uh, there are only, now they started reprinting books. So there's only 16 original issues of Gold Key Monsters. Oh, okay. So um, I had a text come in that says that's some BS about Herman Munster. It was the stem he was blowing of the tire. Yeah, but but they made it look like a doobie. Okay, it was very controversial at the time because somebody actually said it looked like a joint, and it was in it was it was, it got him some backlash. Wow, uh, I didn't mention this yet. Terrell said getting back to our limits was revived in on TV in the 1990s yet by Showtime pay cable. Three decades after the original series was canceled, it went on to last longer. I didn't care very much for that remake. There were a couple episodes that were good, but uh, anyway. Oh, thank you, Esmeralda. Two handsome gentlemen. <laughs> you need to check your glasses on my end. But anyway. Uh, so what was the name of the Munster's car? A little trivia for people in chat. What was the name of the Munster's hot rod? First person answer correctly and says, claim will get your choice. Of either a Star Wars comic book, five Batman 89 mint condition top cards, or Star Wars 1977 tops cards. You got to be the first one to answer correctly and say claim if you want a prize. Or just answer for the fun of it if you don't want a prize. What was the name of the Munster's car seen in that image on the screen, which is Munster's issue number three from July 10th, 1960? Well, I should know that. I bet no. if Dave Sunstorm was here, he'd know that just like that. But but you're not eligible, so it's all good. Here, let me slide over so you can see my fat face. Matter of fact, um, while you're going through these comic books, I'm going to take a couple of minute break and get me some coffee. Okay. Ooh. And that'll give, you, give a chance. Okay, well, here, let me do this. Oh, there. There's that. There's that. Now, someone answered Monstermobile in Facebook land. Monster Mobile. Let me get back here. Sarah says, Dragula claim. C L I M E is how you spell claim, but it's okay. I know what you meant. Spelling doesn't count. She spelled it C L A M E. Dragula. Oh, Sarah, are you eligible? Yes, you're eligible. Even though you did it, you designed our, you improved our, my thumbnail image of today's show. You are eligible for prizes. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Look at that car. Isn't that cool? But you're not correct. I'm waiting for the correct answer. What was the name of the monster's car? Not had a correct answer come in. Uh, Esmeralda in Oregon State guesses the hearse. A Facebooker says the Monster Mobile. Polar says the Monster Coach with a K. And you're correct. Polar Kaiju had the correct answer. You didn't say claim, you didn't specify which prize. So I guess you're just playing for fun. So cool. That answers that question. Let's get back to some other covers while Dan's away. Here's the fourth issue of the Munsters released on September 30th, 1965. Polar, if um, I'm going to have another question if you wanted to uh, play for a prize. But remember, first person answered correctly and says claim wins. And then you can tell me after the fact what prize do you want. 
Um, but there's issue number four from September 30th, 1965. I just think they're so cool in color. Now, that's really a bong that he's holding there. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just joking. Just joshing. Trivia question. This must be from Basil Chesterman. Did the production company pay for the car? Question mark. What do you think? Here is issue number five. I love anything with Grandpa Munster, the great Al Lewis. And of course, as most people know, these two work together on Car 54, Where Are You? Before the Munsters became a show. And I got some facts about the Munsters to go over a little in a little while. So they just look so cool in color to me. Look what that says. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read this for the listeners. Grandpa's relatives come to visit and drive him bats. Probably his ex-wife, right? And his ex-wife in the uh, Rob Zombie Netflix version was played by Catherine Schell, otherwise known as Maya in Space 1999 Season 2, The Shapeshifter. And, of course, uh, Daniel Roebuck played him in the uh, Munsters version. He was, was on Matlock a lot. That guy lost a lot of weight. If you watch the uh, – he was in every season of Matlock, Roebuck, and he also acted in The Fugitive 1993 movie starring Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones won an Oscar for playing Lieutenant Philip Gerard in that picture. But uh, Roebuck was really rotund and heavy in the early Munsters, and he got really thin. He lost a ton of weight. If you get to, like, you know, season eight of um, Matlock – he looked so thin. I mean, but he was so heavy. It's really shocking to see him in season one when he's really, really overweight. There you go. Look at that cover. I love that. Look at Herman's outfit there. I wish I could zoom on it. That came out in April 10th, 1966, the sixth issue of the Monsters. The next was the seventh issue of the Monsters, uh, which was published on. Let me put Dan back on. You're back on. You're oh, cool. Well, you can hear me or not. I'm sitting here talking to myself. No, no, no. Now I can hear you. R repeat. I may shut up. And what were you saying? I was saying that last cover is what these are covers I've never seen before. That is the coolest one ever. Well, that's the purpose of this show. I wanted to show all of them. I'm going to show all the main Star Trek covers too well, in a little bit. You know, yeah. in my life, as far as just shopping and going out looking for books and going to comic shops, I've only seen one Musters comic book original ever. And I bought it. Wow. Well, that is cool. I'll leave it up for a second. Esmeralda says Car 54 was fun. Yes, and who else was in that show was uh, the actress who went on to play the maid in different strokes and um, starred in The Facts of Life as Edna Garrett. Charlotte Ray. Anyway. Uh, but I'm all right. I'm, you did? Yeah. God they rest were, her soul. She was they a were fun The Facts of Life. They were doing what? They were filming a show called The Facts of Life. The Facts of Life, yeah, the spinoff of Different Strokes. They yeah, were filming I, in South Carolina, or would you live somewhere else? Oh, I was, in, I was in California. Oh. You know, I lived in Los Angeles for a while in Burbank and San Francisco in my younger days. Wow. Let me get continue with some more Monsters covers. There might be some more you've never seen. There you go. You've seen that one? That was, uh, I already said this, but June 10th, 66, issue number seven. Here is issue number eight. From August 10th, 1966. Hmm. Here's issue number nine. From October 10th, 1966. This is after the show was canceled. The comic book continued on. The show only lasted two seasons. It ended in um, spring of 1966. Here's that one. There's another funny cover with Grandpa from December 12th, 1966. That's the 10th issue of the Monsters. It says, Ghost signals from Transylvania raise home and spill it to lazy spirits. Oh, that's annoying as hell. Um, here's issue number 11. Notice the bat. Now, speaking of bats, Batman killed the Monsters. The ratings of Batman on ABC destroyed the ratings for the monsters. People had moved on. The mo the monster craze was starting to fizzle out. The Outer Limits had been canceled, but for a while in the early 60s, to say the mid-60s, monsters were huge on television. Let me look something up really quick. Do you have anything to add about the Batman craze? 
I was Are you alive then? Yeah, oh yeah. I, I loved Adam West and Burt and Burt Ward. I love the original Batman show. I still watch it occasionally now. <clears throat> it comes on before something else I watched, like Star Trek or something. Well, the Munsters aired uh, on CBS Thursday nights throughout its entire run at 7.30, from 7.30 to 8. Started on September 24th, 1964. It ended on September 1st, 66. That was a rerun. That was not That was the first, last time it was on primetime television. Let me look something up. Yeah, so like that, I, you know, I was really young when they were originally on, but I watched them in reruns in the 70s constantly. Well, I'm fixing to tell you what they're up against in the ratings. Um, 1964 Thursday night, the first season of the Munsters, it was up against Daniel Boone. You have any Daniel Boone comics? I know you do. You have autographs of Fess Parker and stuff. Yeah. Uh, don't dig it out, but there's one on the wall somewhere. But get this. The Munsters was opposite the Flintstones on ABC. That's a tough competition for the Munsters in season one. Mm. And then in season two. It was up against a ratings blockbuster, Shindig, on ABC. Never heard of it. <laughs> You've never heard of Shindig? Are you kidding? No, I don't know what that is. It's like a music show, like American Bandstand. That's probably why. And it was opposite Daniel Boone still in season two. But, uh, yeah, Basil Tom Williams says how Batman really killed. Uh... So look how they did a bat. You know, of course, it's supposed to be a vampire bat, but it kind of looks like the Batman bat signal to me a little bit, not really. <laughs> Let me move on. Here is issue 12. This is a really gorgeous cover. I think from April 10th, 1967. Great. The use cover of huh? It's a great use of colors. Have you seen it before? Yeah. I think I've seen that one once or twice. And not in much on YouTube channels like yours. Ah, it says Lily is tied to her harp string. She's playing a harp and gets carried away. By a sour note instead of sour note, sour not. Okay. Uh, here's issue 13. What was the name of the Munster's house? Trivia for a prize. Pick your prize. First person. Did it have a name? Maybe it didn't have a name. Like the robot in Lost in Space did not have a name. It was just the robot. But they had a B9 classification, which came along in season two episode, The Ghost Planet. But I digress. Only one episode was the robot classified, and it was by an alien species of machines they call them the b9 robot but he pretty much was just the robot what was the name of the house first person to answer correctly and says claim gets a prize or just answer for fun if you don't care to have any cards or a comic or anything and that was uh issue 13 from june 10th 1967 after the movie monster go home after the series was canceled the comic books continued on let me check chat nothing really going sarah's there love you dan she says the address is Mockingbird Lane. That is correct. That's the street. 1313 13, Mockingbird right. Lane. Like unlucky numbers, right? 1313. 13. But the house itself, did it have a name? It may not have had a name. Anyway, um, continue on. There's the 14th issue, which is a reprint. They started reprinting. And um, that was a reprint of issue number two. Let me see if I can put that. I can't do side by side. But let me show you the original number two. Look how they just changed the color. There's issue 14. There's issue two. So it went from purple to green. And yeah. that's from August 10th, 1967. Issue number 14. And then issue 15, another reprint cover where he's holding a bong. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> from November. I'm sorry. From November 10th, 1967. And That's that a was a reprint. You got a big cup of Folgers because the best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. You were away when I showed the original. It's a reprint of issue four right here. See, they just changed it up. Same picture. They just changed the colors and the wording. But it's just a straight up reprint. Okay, you're really original. good at that. Yep. Cheap, cheap, cheap. And then here's the last issue, the one you talked about, the controversial cover. That's the very last one from... January 31st, 1968. And that's Ooh. the one that got him killed right there, buddy. That's the huh? what now? Is that why this, do you think that's why the comic got canceled? Yeah, I know it for a fact. That's because somebody said that was, he was smoking pot on it. And, that's, and the people, people, people trying to say he was blowing up a tire, but they thought that was a joint and they, yeah. Holy smokes. No and pun intended. on that comic book series. Wow. 
F and A. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and that's the last issue. 16 total issues of the original Gold Key Monsters. Monsters, monsters. I'm going to ask another trivia question in a moment, but I want to cover these covers. You're going to love these, Dan. You ready for this? Bewitched. Bewitched issue number one, Dell yeah, Comics. Bewitched is a comic book series I have been on the search for. I've been looking for one of these books for a long time. This one, the Andy Griffith Show and Mr. Ed, the, these are Beverly Hillbillies. I Dream of Genie, my, probably my top five that I want to find a copy of. There's 14 issues of Bewitched by Dell. And that's the first one from March 31st, 1965. Nice photo cover. And that was a pilot publicity shot from the very first episode or pilot, if you will, of Bewitched, which debuted in September 1964 on ABC TV. Here's issue two. Animated cover. Drawn cover. It says, get down here, mister. Jeeps can't fly. And you see uh, Darren driving a Jeep with a door in the back seat and Samantha next to him in the front. And it says, the old West will never be the same. Not after two witches take over. And they're they're flying over uh, an old West town. Those that can't see the cover here on the YouTube channel, the Nostalgic Podblast. Here's the third cover. I love this cover. And she got his name right. There's kind of a screw up. And Dora says, where's Darren? And Samantha says, I don't know. And then uh, Raven says, neither do I. And then Darren says, I do. Now get me out of here. And he's inside a crystal ball. But she should have said Darwin. That's kind of a screw up from the comic book writer at Dell. You know, because that was the running gag. She never got it. The only time she got his name right was when Tabitha was born in a really sweet scene. And uh, and he's shocked that she got his, got his name right. Anyway, so there's kind of a mess up there. And it says on the cover, when witches get together, what strange stories they can tell. Here's the fourth cover. Chime in if you've seen these. Dan, have you ever seen this one, the fourth issue? I've seen all the covers, I think, but I've okay. never had one. Well, this is from December 28th, 1966. And the dialogue balloon for listeners, it says, uh, let's see. Don't play those cards, Endora, says Darren. And then Samantha says, mother. And then you see prominently big on the cover, Endora saying, be quiet. Oh, I will make you both vanish completely and it says endora proves that witches do come true <laughs> instead of wishes witches all right here is from may 31st 66 bewitched issue number five it says which way did he go and samantha says stop playing games mother where's darren around new idea around and she has a <laughs> there's one two three four five circular images of darren's head flying about her Here's issue six. And that's another publicity shot from the pilot or first episode. Uh, the dialogue balloons say, Samantha saying, answer the phone, Darren. It's our baby, Tabitha. I need to get this one because they got the spelling of Tabitha correct. Originally, the spelling, I've talked about this ad nauseum, was spelled T-A-B-A-T-H-A, -A -A, like taking a bath, Tabitha. And then in season three she was introduced in season two in the middle of season two season three they changed it to tabitha t-a-b-i-t-h-a so it was extremely rare to find print anything with the correct spelling tabitha and it said so in the end credits of her season two debut episode introducing tabitha like taking a bath and on the doll the tabitha doll it was spelled with the a like taking a bath there you have it there and i have a cover of my collection with the tabitha i recently got thanks to earl shaw huge comic book dealer in the southeast based out of the athens georgia area anyway got it at the atlantic comic convention recently but i like that cover she says answer the phone darren it's our baby tabitha and darren says our baby she's a witch too and then endora says these mortals will believe anything and what does it say in the middle it's, hard. it's so small wow oh, it's the baby talking it's tabitha i want a drink of water says Tab Batha. Maybe bathwater. Um, and then there's the one I have with Tabitha, the original spelling. I got that one recently. It says Tabitha goes to the state fair and Darren goes silly trying to figure out which which is which. Now they used that um play on words in the show, I think after that comic was published. And that comic came out on November 30th, 1966. I don't think I mentioned this one before it. Issue six was out August 31st, 1966. 
This is shortly after that episode aired, introducing Tabatha. Now, here is the eighth episode released on February 28th, 1967. I'll mention this. An interesting distinction about the Bewitched Dell series is it ran as the show was still on the air. It's one of the few comic book adaptations where you had new issues coming out while the show was still on there. A lot of them kept going in comic book form after the show had been canceled, but not Bewitched. I like that cover. Uh, the caption reads, Samantha's Messed Up Magic, a trip to the 21st century. Of course, that would that's when they were in the 20th century. They would have been in our time. Oh, well, that. Anyway, so that's issue eight. Here's issue nine from March 31st, 1967. Living with a witch becomes a three-ring surface as Darren becomes a clown. But I like that cover. Look how pretty Elizabeth Montgomery is there. Gorgeous. What a gorgeous lady. And then here's the 10th issue. Gorgeous, gorgeous from season three. That looks like, now there were twins that played Tabitha originally, Diane and Aaron Murphy. And as they grew, they didn't look alike. They weren't identical twins. They were fraternal twins. So then Aaron Murphy took over the role completely. That looks like Diane Murphy. Um, I could be wrong. Someone will correct me. And the cover reads, a little witchcraft never hurt anybody, but this is ridiculous. But look how pretty Liz Montgomery is there. That's from June 30th, 1967, when production of season four of Bewitch had begun. They always would start in June and then it would, you know, air in September in the fall. Take three months to produce these shows with post production and music and everything. Here is the 11th issue of Bewitch from September 30th, 1967. It says, When a witch turns into a fairy godmother, even Prince Charming gets a new look. Cinderella 1967. Thoughts, Dan? Let me shut up and let you talk. What? I'm enjoying your. All right. Well, I don't want to be the hog here. Yeah, I don't have anything to chime in about any of these books. I will. I, I'm enjoying seeing stuff I have never seen before. Okay. Well, thank you. And here's the next. I might have seen them years ago on YouTube or something, but I don't remember some of these covers. I really don't. Does this one look familiar to you? Vaguely, but it just it's, ain't ringing a bell. It's it like, should. I just showed it. It's a re it's a re I mean, like before now, like maybe 10 or 12 years ago, I thought I might have seen these on YouTube or something. Well, this was out September 30th, 1968, Bewitched Issue 12, which was a reprint of Issue 1 from March 31st, 65, this one. They didn't change it much, did they? There's Issue no. 1. And I bet some people got fooled, you know, at comic shows. and so, Maybe the dealer didn't know it was a reprint because you don't see it, the issue number on the cover. So a dealer could legitimately think that's the first issue when mm -hmm. it's really the 12th. You got to really look at that fine print on the inside, right, Dan? Oh, yeah. This is my favorite of the Bewitch covers. I'm sure you've seen this one. This is from the last day of 1968, December 31st, 1968, Bewitched issue 13. That's a very... Oh, he froze. Oh, no, he froze. That's a very... And that's the effort. You froze. What did you say? Now you're back. What did you say? That's a very, and then it froze. What that's a very, a very popular cover. That's the, well, actually the cover most people want. From season four, right. And that's the effing song she's performing. I'll try to uh, play it. I, that'll probably get me a copyright thing. or I'll play it later. I got to remember to do, remind me before you go, uh, I'm going to play the effing song. I can pull that up really quickly. And that's a season four episode. She's playing Serena, her troublesome cousin. By the way, Bewitched was the first show to have the star play dual roles. I mean, the Patty Duke show had done it before. I'm talking about the, the magical shows. And then Jeannie copied it. And Liz Montgomery reportedly got very angry that I dream of Jeannie totally copied that with Jeannie one and Jeannie two when it had been done. And ironically, the first episode of Tabitha's birth was where she was introduced, where Liz Montgomery played her uh, cousin, Serena. And the credit was Pandora Spocks, not in season two when she's introduced because Star Trek hadn't even debuted yet. But as the show went on, it would say in the end credits, Pandora, it's like Pandora's box, a little play on words, Pandora Spocks, like Mr. Spock as Serena, when it was really, of course, Liz Montgomery wearing a wig, a black wig. But Jeannie stole that whole thing. They, they just put a black wig on Barbara Eden. I mean, it, what a rip. But they both were screen gem shows. So I guess legally, no action could be taken. You'd be suing your own company, right? Production yeah, well, that was, a lot, that was a lot better than Death Row and Death Ring. Oh, yeah. On the first season of Beverly Hillbillies, Max Bear Jr. playing Jeff Ring. That was ahead of its time, right? With a gender bending well, comedy. You can, yeah, you can say that. Hell, that was even before. The devil made me wear this dress. 
Flip Wilson on the Flip Wilson show and drag. Esmeralda says Bewitch was a wonderful comedy. And she also says, now that is a great cover. Looks like how I dressed back then. That is awesome. Awesome, awesome. So that's how some people in my family dress now. Hey, have you got anything to say? I'm gonna try to pull up that effing song while you talk. Is there or do, you, do I need to give you time to prepare? Do you have anything to show really quickly? I probably need a minute. No. Do, 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 do. About, well, Bewitch. About Bewitch. Is there anything? Do you remember watching it when it originally aired? Let's say. Let me try to open your mind a little bit. What's the best episode of Bewitched, in your opinion? Do you have a favorite episode? The one with the spaceship maybe landing when uh, Aunt uh, Aunt Clara summoned a spaceship. I don't know. I guess I guess my favorite episodes would be the ones that had the Doctor Bombay in them. You know, the magical witch doctor guy. I kind of like Joy his his appearances. I also remember uh, quite a few episodes where Paul Lynn, I think, would pop in there as Uncle Somebody, and that was rather Arthur amusing. And Dora's brother. Oh, I should have said yeah. that as a trivia question, but uh, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that them were some of the funniest episodes. Okay, I'm going to try to pull this up and not uh, get slapped down. I might get slapped down, but it's only a minute long. Usually I can get away with about a minute for fair use. Okay, we'll see because we, I, we I wouldn't do it on my channel, but you go right ahead. Well, this is an educational lecture, so I'm not doing this for profit or anything, so I don't care. Let me just hang on. Give me a second. Any other uh, Bewitched favorite episodes, Dan? Mm -hmm. I can't think of any right off hand. I really can't. Like I said, it's been quite a while since I've actually even seen an episode of Bewitched. Well, hell, it airs all the time on Antenna TV. And oh, I, it's I, don't have, property. I don't really watch a lot of television. I watch maybe four hours of TV a day, five hours tops. And the rest of the time, I've got other stuff to do, mostly YouTube. That's good for your brain not to watch too much TV. Yeah, but I watch way too much YouTube. Not. Yeah, that's still watching, isn't it? Let me uh, now. Right, when we get done here, I got to try to fit a dinner in and get something to eat before I watch Thrash Bondo Ponzi's show tonight. His show starts at 7.30, which is just under three hours from now. Oh, crap. Yeah, which means I got to cook, eat, and do all my stuff before his show comes on. All right. I'm going to try to play the effing song. It's about ready to go. I like this wasn't my favorite song. Serena would sing a couple times on the show. This wasn't my favorite of her songs, but it is pretty notable. Let's watch it. Oh, oh Larry, that tablet is getting prettier every day. Oh, thank you. We're proud of her. Oh, thank you. Well, um, I guess I ought to go in the kitchen and help Samantha. Oh, wait a minute, Lulu. Don't walk out on the entertainment. Sit down, everybody. Make yourselves comfortable. <laughs> I know a little ditty recorded by the Belters on the flip side of America the Beautiful. It's called the Iffen Song. Iffen, 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 you want to feel my embrace. Don't you ever wash your face. Iffen, you really care for me. Don't you comb your hair for me. If and you want to leave me weak and weepy, you got to look wild and weird and creepy. If and if and if and if and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I'll go put on a new face before dinner. I'm hard and cotton top. I'll be right back. Did I go down? Did it go no. down? I don't know. Well, okay. And I tried to pull one that wasn't uh, in the best wow. quality. I thought I could get away with that. And as Marla says, I remember this. And she always would flirt, uh, Serena, with uh, Darren's boss, Larry Tate. All the Did time. that guitar even have strings on it? Because the way she was holding it, it just... No. You can tell she wasn't playing it, that's for sure, because she never moved her hand at all. I love that cover. So here comes the final cover. The final cover is another reprint cover, a reprint of the second issue. And uh, let's see. Let me find that's not second. Bewitched. That's the Monsters. Oh, Jesus. Lord in heaven. I, I've lost my mind. It's right here. That's the 14th. 
And it's a reprint of the second issue of Bewitched. Look how they didn't change a thing. Uh, here is the second from June 30th, 65. And then here is, thank you for, here's the 14th issue from December 30th, 1969. While the show was still on the air, because Bewitched ran until 1972. Eight seasons. So there you go. Now, let's talk about I Dream of Genie, Dan. Do you have any of the I Dream of Genie comics? There's only two. Yeah, of the that's, on my list. that's on my list of comics I actually want. Well, here's from March 31st, 1966. How many of these are you going to run through? There's only two. Only two? Really? I, it didn't sell didn't well, that. apparently. Yeah. Dell Comics, I Dream of Genie. And the cover says, uh, this would have been Captain Nelson before he's promoted to major. He says, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And then Jeannie says, you better believe it. And he says, I believe it. <laughs> and it says, Shades of Aladdin. The Arabian Nights were never like this. I can't read what's in the middle. It's too small a print. But, uh, yeah, so that would have been released in the middle of season one of Our Dream of Jeannie. Jeannie debuted in September 1965. This was out in March 31st, 66. So that was uh, when season one, the only black and white season of the five seasons of I Dream of Jeannie aired. So it, seems like, it seems like it should be more I Dream of Genie comics than two. There's only two, my brother. Here's the second issue, which was released when season two was on the air on NBC. And this hit news stands and comic book spinner racks on November 30th, 1966, the final original issue. That's the one I've seen before. On. At shows and online? Yeah. Yeah, but I would have sworn there were more copies, more issues than two. The text reads, all systems go wacky. There's a genie in outer space. And let's see here. What was I going to show you? There actually was another uh, genie comic book from 2001. I didn't pull the image because I'm only talking about, we're talking about Dell comics and uh, gold key comics. But that one came out on New Year's Day 2001 by Airwave Comics. There was another Genie comic book in 2001. Wow. How about that? And uh, that would have been the year of 9-11, unfortunately, 2001. Now, finally, we're going to talk. At the very beginning of the show, I showed a nice little one-minute NBC original 1966 preview for season one of Star Trek. So let's talk about the comic book. Hey, I got that. I know. Why don't you go get it? It's right there. Let me make you big. Make you big. And take that off the screen. Let's see yours. Yeah, oh, cool. Cool. Way cool, man. The thing about grading books, you can't show the inside. I'm going to show the inside of Star Trek issue number one. Right, you can now. see a whole video on that because I made a video where I review Star Trek comic book issue number one on YouTube, and you can see every page and all its horrible art and incredibly bad story. Wow, miss misprinted language. <laughs> well, let's look at the inside of this book. Now, this book, you know, the, is cover, the covers are great, but Star Trek comic books are notorious for being crappy. Drawn crappy, not sticking to the story, not even calling the characters the right names. It's, <laughs> I know. It's, it's, they're really kind of pathetic inside. I know. Now, this was released on July 10th, 1967, but I love the cover. And that's early Spock makeup. It's in between the pilot and production of the first regular episode, which is the third production titled The Corbomite Maneuver. Notice his collar is a little bit bigger on Mr. Spock there in that image. He had more of a collar in the first episodes they produced, uh, Mud's Women and uh, the Corbomite Maneuver, which also had, the Corbomite did, Ron Howard's brother, Clint Walker, played an alien in that episode. With the I remember that very well. If you open up this book, here's my copy. You see a nice shot of the USS Enterprise. If you want to read the text, it says, This is the Enterprise, a ship of the Starfleet. Before Starfleet Command, I suppose. Yeah, I think that was before. So I heard the term Starfleet Command in Arena where he's communicating Captain Kirk. He's fighting that giant lizard Gorn creature and he huh. does entry to Starfleet Command. And that was 19th in production order, including the two pilots. But so this comes out, you know, when 
season one was still on. No, it was season two had begun production, but in terms of air dates, only season one had aired. Anyway, it says this is the Enterprise, a ship of the Starfleet. It's five year mission in space to probe the far reaches of the galaxy, to search the unknown, to unlock its mysteries, to boldly go where no man has ever gone before. Now, that is politically incorrect. It's supposed to be where no one has gone before, which we first heard in Star Trek The Next Generation. How about that? How about them apples? Oh, I thought I pulled the back cover, too. Uh, what you got? Let me take the... Oh, you got nothing. Show that again. Oh, what you got? Uh, you getting uh, something? I was looking oh. for something. You couldn't find it. Uh, somewhere around here, somewhere around here, I've got little Star Trek figures, you know, the Gorns and all that. Uh-huh. I do not know where they are right now. Well, God dang. Maybe you can find them. Uh, I'm, I've, I've got, if you should see this mess, I got boxes everywhere and stuff pulled out everywhere and scattered <laughs> about. I'm going to quickly pull up because, you know, I only have a limit of 100 images that I can do. And um, so I just deleted some. I'm quickly uploading things I have on my computer that I'd taken from this Star Trek issue one. So bear with me, folks. Uh, okay, here's one. There's the inside back cover, and you can't really see at the very bottom. Kirk has the weapon only seen in Where No Man's Gone Before, which was the second pilot. First one was Shatner. You never saw that little laser cannon, or I guess an space AR rifle. It's like an a, a space AR, if you will. Space rifle. Raff, what is it? A space rifle. Ah, look at you. Let me get to the back cover. Uh, 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 if you're watching on TV, maybe you can read that text. There's the back cover of issue one. I got this copy from Barry King, BK on the air. He, he uh, sold it to me. I have another copy. It's in storage in my mint condition, but the back cover is a little torn, but that's okay. It was really nice of him to sell me that. Um, let me find one other thing. How nice was he? What did he sell it to you for? Uh, I don't recall. We did like a group deal. It was a very fair price though. Um, let me see here. I thought there was more to that I wanted to show. Inside back cover. There was another image. Oh, well, well, let's move along. Let's move along. We don't have all day. Um, I'm, 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 let me just do, 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 get to the next one. Okay. Star Trek, Star Trek. All right. So that's issue one in the nutshell. Let me just show you the covers of the rest. The second issue, that first one, like I said, was out on July 10th, 1967. Here's the second issue from March 10th, 1968. It says, Prisoners on the Planet of the Condemned sentence Captain Kirk to share their fate. What do you think of that cover, Dan? That's pretty cool right there. You seen it before? Yeah, I've seen it, but I don't have it. I've got it, and I got this one too. Another early shot of Leonard Nimoy's Spock. He doesn't quite have the bowl cut yet. He's actually got like a little part. Look at his hair. His bangs are not like straight bowl cut. Well, Wait, what you I don't think. Well, that one was out September 10th, 1968. The fourth issue, June 10th, 1969. The show had just been canceled. That one I have. <laughs> yeah. And notice the price jump. I didn't mention this yet. They went, it was 12 cents the first two issues, and then 15 cents with the third issue and beyond. So there's the fourth issue. Here's the fifth issue, which I've got. I've got most of these. I've got that one. Yep. And that was out September 10th, 1969. Fall of 69, when Trek was off the air. It had been canceled. There is uh, the sixth issue from December 10th, 1969. Think fast, Mr. Spock. A freak impulsion is creating galactic disaster. That's a shot from, oh, look, let me put you. Hang on. Let me get you. Let me. I'm your point of yours. All behind me. Look at that. And that shot, of course, is from a mock time, the first aired episode of season two of Original Trek from September 67, but it was the uh, 34th episode in production order. It was actually 31, 32, 33, fourth one film for season two, but it was the first one NBC chose to air. Introduce Spock's wife to Pring. Yeah, man. I got oh, that one. Not Hang on. on the wall. Hold that up again. Hang on. Let me put you so low. I got that one, but it's not on the wall. I got several of them that's not on the wall. That's a nice copy, Dan. Yeah, number four. 
Do you want to open it up and see if there's pictures on the inside or no? Not really. Okay. I don't. I don't, like open, I don't like to open them until I have to. No problem. Um, let's see. Yeah, my show ain't worth it. Let's see. Now we got the seventh issue from March tenth, nineteen seventy, which was reprinted as the forty fifth issue. Yeah, I have that I like one that. too. Kind of a pop art looking cover. And the eighth. Cool. Cool. Did you have the original or the reprint? Because they no, look the, the same. The original. The 45th. Okay, yeah, with the 15 cents. It'll have 15 cent price tag. Yeah. And um, here's the eighth. I love this cover from September 10th, 1970. Star Trek had been off the air two years already when this was published. Oh, now that's what I don't have. And that gorgeous cover with the transporter. Yeah. They stand I would helpless. Beg your pardon? I would like to have that one. They stand helpless before an alien who dooms them to infancy so they can turn them into little babies dr smith was turned into a baby and lost in space once before in season three i have it on 16 millimeter film <laughs> he was turned into a actually i think it was a nine-year-old not a baby but or an or a toddler anyway let's move along but that's a great cover huh and this was right when star trek hadn't quite like it was in syndication but the conventions hadn't started till 1972 so right now star trek was really after its death getting resurrected with the public and with young people uh and that's from september 10th 70 here is from february 10th 1971 the ninth issue of star trek that's a good one too do you have it no that's another one i don't have i've got a, most of the ones i got is from probably 12 up I have a, I have like six of the original, one, two, three, four, five, but most of the ones I have are 31, 29, 18, numbers like that from later. Wow. Numbers. Let me see uh, some comments because I've been neglecting the comments really quickly. Uh, Wood Train says I have four Bewitch comics in original print. Cool. At least I got something worthwhile from my ex stepfather. He was a total douche. <laughs> oh my God. Esmeralda says, I really liked Aunt Clara. Her mistakes were so funny. Yeah, and touching too, because she had Alzheimer's, right? It, it, like, and even in her first episode, she had a doorknob collection. Very moving scene with Darren and her. Um, I remember this as Esmeralda. Esmeralda, as a witch, getting back to be witched, um, she did not need to move her hand to play. She did her nose. Um, Wood Train says, Danny, four to five hours of daily TV is a lot. Yeah, you, you're doing a lot of commentary tonight, Dan. This is like your busy day, I guess, because I'm taking a lot of your time. Uh, as well, the Mud's Women was a great episode. Yep, it was. It, it featured drugs. You know, uh, Harry Mud was giving these women drugs to create an illusion effect and make them look gorgeous. And to enhance poor, unsuspecting men who had dilithium crystals, rich miners on Rigel 4 <laughs> who mined dilithium crystals for the Starfleet ships. And so there was it was fraud. It was straight up fraud, what Harry Mudd was doing. Um, and Terrell says, I'm surprised to be which comics didn't continue after the recasting of Darren from Dick York to Dick Sargent in its last few seasons. I'd written that down. That was my theory as to why the the comic books might have tanked. Uh, maybe they had to do a new deal with Dick Sargent, you know, for licensing of his image. Who knows? You know, it always comes down to money, doesn't it? My flock, Sarah, Southern California says, I've got Star Trek figures too. Ben Compton says, Star Trek issue one is what I need. I guess he's got the rest then. Damn, that's impressive. Sarah says, I've been to a Star Trek convention. Cool. Here is issue 10. This was the end of the photo covers. My favorite where you had a animated cover, issue 10, May 10th, 1971. I got a text from Al Hardy. I'm going live with Tom. How dare you, sir, when your your fellow host is live on the air, and I and you asked me for the link, and you didn't even come on. So now I'm pissed. I'm pissed at Al and Tom right now. They're going to go live. No one's going to watch them. Go ahead. Go live. Go live. I don't care. And I don't send me the God-blessed link. F you. I'm kidding. I'm only kidding, fellas, but damn, don't bother me for a link when I'm live and then you don't come on and then you go live talking about your bull crap, which no one will, will watch. You watch. You'll have no views. Anyway, Star Trek, 
this was an animated cover, obviously painted cover. Um, that's when I still collected them, but I wasn't all that interested. That's from May 10th, 71. Now we're going to flash forward to the very last Star Trek cover, issue 61 from March 10th, 1979. This is the last of the gold key Star Treks. And that's when they reverted the rights to Marvel Comics to promote the movie Star Trek, the motion picture. That's what it looks like. Dan. Now, this is a picture of my copy of the Invaders comic book one from September 30th, 1967. On the air, season two of the Invaders was underway. The first couple episodes, or three episodes of season two, had already aired. Um, my cover, look at that. My copy's in great shape. There's gold key issue number one. Look, Dan. Isn't that a weird cover? Look at Roy Thinnis there. That's from the mutation of publicity shot from the third episode. And that episode introduced that the aliens burn up and die. All right. I didn't maybe back up. That's the show about a race of alien beings coming to take over our world. It was like V before there was V and it was a Quinn Martin production. Um, it began while season four of the fugitive was on the air. And then season two began after the fugitive had ended and uh, it aired Tuesday nights on ABC, debuted on January 10th, 1967. Look at the inside front cover of this book. Doesn't that look like a nice condition copy, Dan? Oh, yeah, pretty good. Look at the inside front. Look, it's, just, it's a gorgeous copy I have, but I love those images. That's from the very first episode of the pilot titled Beachhead, where Roy Thinnis architect... David, as architect David Vincent is running from the alien deadly invaders and the invaders need to regenerate every once in a while because oxygen is deadly to them. That's why it was strange. Why do these aliens want to take over our world, which has oxygen on it, if it kills them or they have to keep regenerating in these tubes to maintain a uh, fake human form. And they had no pulse, no heart. They didn't bleed when they were cut. And it was a very serious show. That's why I'm surprised they made a comic book. This show had death in it. And I mean, they didn't even really have merchandising. They had a model kit from EMT of the ship, but like their weapons, they had a weapon that would induce a uh, stroke, heart attack or a cerebral hemorrhage. I call it a death disc. And they'd put it on the back of the necks of human beings. And the longer it was on them, the quicker it would be fatal to them. And, uh, well, I'm, and then again, why would they make a toy? It's like they didn't know the show. It's almost like these people creating the books or deciding to publish them never watched the show. Go ahead. Yeah, well, you get a lot of that, believe it or not. I think the people who did the Star Trek comics never saw the show neither. Right. Here's, Here's a few the, other a few a few other stuff that most people hadn't seen. Here's the brand new one that just come out. It's the number one for Star Trek Discovery, the new show. One second, I'm going to make you big so everyone can enjoy that cover bigger. Go you know, ahead. They got a new one out called Discovery, and that's the number one comic book for Star Trek Discovery, where they made the Klingons look ridiculous. Here's the number one for the Star Trek The Next Generation series. Oh, wow. Yeah, I have that. Well, that and was here's, the second one. Here's, there was here's one, one for that. the Light Storm of the Deep Space Nine series. Wow, look at that. Here's the Japanese number one for Star Trek. Oh, wow. Here's the number one for the official Deep Space Nine. Wow. And this is the number one for the new Star Trek series, Divided. That's, that hadn't even been released yet. I have a lot of like I said, I have a lot of offbeat Star Trek stuff. Like this number one, it's an annual. Lots of Deep cool. Space Nine stuff. And you know, there was a second Star Trek comic book series that come out too. And this was the DC run. Most people don't realize that DC did a Star Trek series too. Here's one, Mar here's one of the old Marvel Star Treks you were talking about that come out after the motion picture. Yeah. Next Generation. I have a lot of Next Generation comics. But that's a no this is a number three for that series that come out right after the motion picture. 
Oh yeah. Well, no, that was that was like 1990, I think, or 89, the one you just held up. That was when Star Trek Five. Well, this was, was not 92. 92. Okay. Yeah. And the next generation, when you showed, there was one before that. Star Trek series based on the movies. Another Deep Space Nine. I had a big love for the next generation. And that's Renee. What's his name from uh, uh, the one you just showed? Can you show that again? B back up. No, not that one. I can't even pronounce his last name. He was in Benson. Yeah. Remember Benson. <laughs> I, I know you guys are talking about. And there's a new move. The, the new series of movies actually had a comic book series come out too. Based wow. on Pawn. Pawn! And then I got the Voyager comics. And here's a big double size Star Trek number 50 from back in the day. I'm sorry, I'm covering up with. We had a great comment from Terrell. That's nice. Look at that. I like that art. Here's the Enterprise comics, Waypoint, with Archer. With Archer. Scott. Bacula. Yeah. From uh b -b 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 have you ever heard of Star Trek Year Five? That's a re re kind of a recent series they've done. No, please tell it's me. I, I'm not familiar. It's supposed to be the, the final year of the, the original mission. It's a little something they've come out with recently. That's another generation. Hey, here's a comic book series most people hadn't heard of. You know, they had a Starfleet Academy. Not Which another is more like that stupid Star Trek cartoon they come out with. Another one. These are all original old Star Trek comics from the second and third series. I have that. I have all those DC ones. Yeah, that was when the Wrath of Khan was out. Yeah. Wrath Wait, I didn't do the Wrath of Khan. Ah! Here's another Sorry. con comic book. <laughs> this is the one where what's his name? That, that Admiral guy gets his arms and stuff all blowed up. I have all the con series. Nice. Yes, Terrell. Renee, whatever you just said there. <laughs> I can't pronounce that. I'm going to finish it up with some Voyager. I guess the S is silent there. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. That's the, that's the, a bunch of the extra comics I've got. It's not really original stuff, dude. That's so cool. Um, man, so where was I? Do you have any more to show? Because I got to use the head again. <laughs> any Twilight Zone? Any uh, anything? Just Twilight Zone's hanging on the wall, but right, right behind me. I don't want to bother you to yank something off the wall. Do you have anything in front of you or anything interesting you could show the viewers and listen and tell the listeners about? I don't know why you want. Yeah, give me a subject or something. I guess. Any all right? Uh, just movie and TV. That's what we're talking about today. Movie and TV. More westerns. Uh, you showed us what wrestling already. Wrestling comic books and items. Well, you were talking about them lost in spaces earlier, and I have Space Family Robinson. Time. Yeah, Space Family. That's a good one. I. That's the number two. Yeah. But this is the number two before they had the um, Lost in Space title. Back when it was just Space Family Robinson. Them come out in 1963. Here's another one from 1963 featuring the Space Family Robinson. This one's a number six. Now, as he, as Chance pointed out earlier, later on they got the rights to Lost in Space. And after that, any comic books that come out actually said Lost in Space on them. And I've got these things laying around here everywhere. Yeah, another one with Lost in Space. As a matter of fact, somewhere, <laughs> somewhere on the dark side, there's a few more of them comic books floating around. I may have to look them up. My bad. Now, here we go. 
Another cover for Lost in Space. And they're in different piles for different reasons. I'm planning on getting rid of these. I'm showing you now. They're, they're kind of promised out to somebody. But that, that was some original Lost in Space comic books. And some of the ones that actually had the the uh, Space Family Robinson covers. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I, I, I have pretty much anything you could call out, I have something to talk about. If you like the horror comics, you know, I have quite a few of them, too. I haven't really been covering stuff like Elvira, Mistress oh, of the God, Dark. Cassandra, Cassandra Peterson. And I love the Elvira. I love the Elvira comic books. I got quite a few of them on the wall. And some I haven't got to yet. Well, can't show that on YouTube. Can't show that cover on YouTube. Anybody <laughs> have a puppet master? We'll go through some puppet master comic books while we wait on chance to get back. I'm here. I'm I'm just watching, loving it. Please go. Continue. I have the uh, I have a partial run of the Puppet Master comics. Ooh. I had a chance to get them all, but I skipped a few titles because they were hitting me a little more expensive than I wanted to pay. But I really like the Puppet Master movies. So when I had a chance to pick up some of the Puppet Master comic books, you know, I couldn't resist. Pretty. I hate that glare. That's okay. I don't know. I should have named all these numbers off as I went, but that was the first the first ten and six a few from the from the later episodes. Well, that's very very cool stuff you got there, my brother. Let me just do one thing here. Here's a Lost in Space that I have. This is like from 1991 from Innovation Comics. Can you see that cover? They they really sexed up the women. I mean, they got their boobs hanging out. Can you see that? Oh yeah, and um, what was going on in reality was USA Network, starting in 1989, reran Lost in Space with restored from the 35 millimeter elements the episodes for the very first time. They look gorgeous, and so Lost in Space was sort of back in the limelight on a national scale in the USA, thanks to the USA Network, and that was what led to the sci-fi channel, believe it or not, the ratings were so good. They played lost in space and land of the giants back to back in 1989, 1990. And so USA networks launched the sci-fi channel, which started in the fall of 1992. But anyway, look how they just, they, they make the women look like uh space sluts or something. Here's an instance of the for you right here. You were talking earlier about Boris Korloff. Right on. And I have some of the original Boris Korloff tales of mystery. Oh, damn. I have a, a couple of them anyway. That's awesome. And you know, there's, all these are gold key, right? Yeah. They're the old gold key Boris Korloffs. Yeah. But did you know that when gold key, when gold key quit making Boris Korloff tales of mystery? Mm hmm. Did you know that Whitten had picked them up and made more Boris Korloff later on? I did not know that. I you see, because you look at these these over here, and you can tell that all these old old extra wide. And by the way, they're extra wide. They're they're really big comic books. They're they're way bigger than a normal comic book. On the originals, you have to buy special bags for them and stuff. But they have the gold key. But when they Started again making them later on, and Witten took it over. They made them normal size and sold them for twice as much. And you know, once again, you'll find a lot of them, as you put out earlier, reprints. 
<laughs> reprints. Yeah, it's a dirty yeah. word. Yeah. And I heard you say something earlier about Starscream. Yes. I have some star screens too. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I have somewhere in here quite a few star screens, original comics. I don't know where they come from, but I've got them. So I do have quite a few of them too. You have an awesome collection, my brother. Way better than mine. I thought I had a great collection, but I only collect pretty much Marvel 1960 to 93. And then I have other stuff, as you've seen today. Well, like I said, I, I do somewhere around here have superhero comic books, but they're, that was my thing in the 70s and 80s. I had nothing but superheroes. I didn't have nothing else. Well, sell me the superhero books. <laughs> and, and as I got older, the superheroes didn't mean much to me, and I sold most of the superhero stuff from my collections that I have here. Now I have very few, mm. but I do have Batman and some Spider Mans and some Jokers and a bunch of them freaking X Men comics. And I had I, ha I had about ten thousand Superman comics that I pulled out of a storage unit, and I got tired of looking at them, so I just got rid of all of them. I probably ain't got enough, maybe a hundred of them left to get rid of. Ah. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, now, I already showed this, but I just want to show again how gorgeous my copy of Invaders Issue 1 is. I like the question mark over there. Look how big the alien weapon is. In Season 1, their laser guns were much larger, that's what she said, than they were in Season 2. They streamlined them for Season 2, and of course, a, a laser gun. I know I showed this, but there's the inside front. Here's the inside back. Nice shot of Roy Thinnis, and then here's the back cover just a gorgeous copy and that's the regeneration tube i referenced earlier where the aliens would have to regenerate themselves and maintain their phony human form now here's issue two this is a terrible copy i have this was released january 1st 1968 when the invaders was still on the air season two was on the air on abc there with the little eye orbit of doom how many invaders orbit comics are there doom. say what how many invaders oh. comics were there Four. Just the four. Yes. And here is, that's because the show got canceled. And I guess interested Wayne. There's the inside front cover of the second issue showing the alien saucer ship. Easy for, I almost said a bad word. The alien saucer ship. She stores on the sea, sea shells on the seashore. And there's the inside back cover of issue two. And then here is the back cover of issue two. Kind of a psychedelic groovy looking cover. Here's what you have. Issue three. Released May 31st, a day that will live on in infamy in my world. I've talked about it in the very first episode of Nostalgic Pod Blast. That's when Cumulus sold my radio station down the river. And the FCC approved the sale May 31st, uh, 2019. And also, some idiot lady hit my car. Nope, nope, just describing her. I, I'm not saying women are idiots. I'm saying some idiot. I'll just strike that from the record. An idiot hit my car. It's been repaired since my Audi. That same day when I was coming back from a station party. Anyway, here's issue three from May 31st, 1968. The Moon Tilters. Here's my copy. I just, last year, I actually watched the entire series of The Invaders again. Yeah, there's 43 episodes on DVD or what? I watched it on um, MeTV, I think. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They oh, and, to... and it's still set, so ever every Saturday it records an episode still. Yeah, and they edit a lot out, but some of the episodes are actually time compressed. You know what time compression is, Dan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, they, they speed up the frames per second so they don't have to cut as much out. They actually have Prince the Sci-Fi Channel first aired by World Vision, the old distributors, before Aaron Spelling's company bought the rights to all these Quinn Martin shows, right? And CBS Paramount now owns The Invaders, and they put out the DVD starting in uh, 2008, 2007, 2008, 2008. And Roy Thinnis recorded new introductions for every episode, which is just so cool. And they released the extended version of the pilot in the season one set of The Invaders on DVD. I highly recommend that. There's so much more to it. And Grandma Walton was an alien in that. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Ellen Corby, who later played Grandma Walton on Walton's Mountain. Uh, mountain? Where'd that come from? Mountain played an alien so there's the issue you've got here's the inside front cover of issue three from may 31st 68 
Pretty cool. So you don't have to open yours up. I did it for you. And then there's the fourth and final issue from yeah. September 30th, 68. The show was already off the air. This is fall of 68. That was the first year Invaders was not on the ABC schedule when this hit newsstands. And they did away with the inside photos on the inside front cover, inside back and back cover. There's just an ad on the back cover, so I didn't photograph it. But there's the final and fourth issue of the Invaders comic book. And I used that once to design a case. Let me make myself big of a VHS. It's right here. Let me show you this. The Invaders. Look, I used that image wow. with someone I knew. She helped me design it with Photoshop. But that's from the comic book. I just scanned the comic book cover, or she did, and designed that. And look at the back. There's the back from the cover of issue three, the moon tilters of Vincent holding the gun, which is from an episode titled Panic, where Robert Walker Jr., that same season he played Charlie X in Star Trek, the kid with the powers, he plays an alien with a virus who's freezing humans to death when he touches them. And the aliens want him dead because he's going to expose the fact that there's aliens taking over the earth if he's caught. Anyway, so yeah, use the comic book art to design that case and look at the side look how look how good a job we did that's better than like the columbia house people did just <laughs> back in those days but uh look at the ship i got from a star log the ship in the upper right there is from a star log magazine article on the invaders i think in star log issue 18 had an episode guide and so and what else do we do we she and i put together same cover And there's a shot of the alien saucer from uh, the mutation. The third episode, Suzanne Plouchette played a mutated alien. I Long got before one. the Bob Newhart show, huh? I said, I actually got a channel called Starlog. It's channel? Yeah, a YouTube channel called Starlog based oh, on the Starlog yeah. magazine. Me too. I subscribed to that one too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I said <laughs> Starlog. Matter of fact, I just bought some Starlog magazines, original copies from like the nineties or so. That's I have issue one through two hundred originals, and they reprinted want, some I, of those. Huh? I want I want some of the original Starlogs. I want the one that had the um the episode guides in them for Star Trek and the Night Stalker and all that. Because when I had them, I had took up the. I was a young person that didn't have enough sense to keep them intact, and I took the episode guides. I still have the episode guides out of them, but I don't have the 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 books no more well that's before the internet that's all we had you know we're older people that's what we had as episode guides we were nerds we wanted to know the air date and the guest stars and all that stuff man before you could watch this stuff before there was a me tv before there was even a tv land before there was even uh nick at here's, night. Of fact, here, here's a really oh, other yeah. reruns huh local here's, here's the here's the episode guide for the night stalker from one of them magazines back in the day, but that's all I kept. And it's like the episode guys. Here's one for voice to the bottom of the sea. And these are actually from the old original magazine. Incredible. Space 1999. Technical journal. Yeah. With that's a supplement to the technical journal. I have it. It's a red, yeah. Red uh, cover, like hard vinyl cover i have yeah, that in another room that stuff around here somewhere where i can't get to it in other boxes but i have a whole big stack of the episode guides did you know starlock did a reprint book like a, a nice soft cover book called episode guides they had a couple volumes where they just had episode guides just like they had starlog monsters they had starlog aliens they had these like basically they were reprints but a great collection of previous issues with a nice wow. full color wraparound. I have them. I, if I could get, I, I'll try to pull it out or in a future time when we're on together, I'll have them ready and I'll show if you've not seen them, maybe we could trade. I have a, a lot of bonus episode issues rather of star log. And I have bonus of those books. I'm talking about those double books. screen. Oh, okay. Well, well, you're like me. I hate seeing myself. Well, so it's no use for us not to share the screen. If I'm not showing nothing. <laughs> Okay. My, big, my big ass head sitting there, you know. Oh, get out of here. So, right, we concluded on the invaders. There's that. And um, 
What did you like the Invaders? You said you watched them on Sci Fi. Oh, I love the Invaders show. I, I wish they went on for years. But, but I didn't finish my point. Was that they? they it's funny how MeTV. Most of the episodes they air are old prints, like where the colors washed out and they're time compressed from World Vision. Time compressed. In a way, that's good. They don't have to cut as many scenes out to get the commercials in. But sometimes they will play. It'll you'll you, how you know is at the end if it says World Vision, that's an old print. And if it says CBS Paramount, that's from the DVD release, the remastered from 35 millimeter DVD release. And there's Wait. more editing in those because those are not time compressed. But you know, I have some. I have I have DVD sets of some shows like the like um Time Tunnel and the Monsters. Stuff like that. I have. I, I've never opened them and I've never played them because I watched it on MeTV. But I actually have them DVD copies. But those are uncut. You know, you're missing like four or five minutes per episode of an hour show from back then. MeTV cuts. Not them. The distributor cuts scenes so they can play more commercials. You know that, I'm right? Aware, but I've, I've seen most of them, and I can pretty much remember what's missing and what's not from most. Well, what of them. they're doing with Time Tunnel, it's kind of fun. They're only cutting primarily the cliffhanger. So you're not really missing anything from the story of that week's episode. In most cases, they're cutting the cliffhanger ending in Time Tunnel on MeTV. The ones that uh, Fox sent them now owned by Disney. I guess Disney's in control now of the Fox library. In fact, I know. Hey, let's move on to another comic. I know you said you don't have this. This comic is from December 31st, 1969. Again, a weird show to make a comic book from Room 222, which was a show about high school. Now, maybe the thought was... It's a show about teenagers. Maybe teenagers will buy it. In the boardroom, when they were deciding at Dell what comics to publish that are new, maybe that was the thought process. I don't know. Did you ever watch Room 222, Dan? I've seen the show. I didn't think it was very good. It was like like the Mod Squad. You know, it's a, it's a show, but it's not that good. Anymore, it's dated now. Yeah. Yeah. It was ahead of its time, though, because you had black, uh, as you see, two black actors in the leads. Lloyd Haynes, who was in Star Trek Where No Man's Gone Before, the first one was Shatner, the second pilot. He played one of the helmsmen. And then the network recast a lot of people, including his character. And uh, and then you have uh, Denise Nicholas, who went on to do In the Heat of the Night with uh, in the late 80s and early 90s with Carol O'Connor. She played his girlfriend on that show and she directed and no, she wrote some episodes, not directed. She wrote a lot of the, in the heat of night episodes. Anyway, I liked it. I like Karen Valentine. I, I, I liked the show and it was a dramedy, but Dan, it had a laugh track in season one. There were five total seasons, actually four and a half seasons. Season five was canceled midway through. <sighs> Mark Hamill was in one of the very last episodes of room Two Twenty Two in 1974. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just all over the place here. And, you know, it was on Aspire, which is a black cable network recently. Well, recently, like in 2019, and they censored episodes. There was an episode um, that dealt with, I won't say homophobia, but bullying of a gay student. And they'd written on his locker, I won't say the word, F-A-G-G-O-T. Yeah, I know what you're saying. And on Aspire, they blurred it out. And I thought, you're ruining the effect of that scene. Cause it was a dramatic scene. The guy sees it and it gets really emotional. And so, you know, I don't know. I mean, why do they, do they think we're all, are we being dumbed down? I mean, I don't know. You know what? We really need to do like a second part to this show one day because I'm not going to be able to stay on here much longer. I have 6% left on my laptop. Three hours okay. is about the max amount of time. All right, well, I'll, I'll hurry up here and show you issue two of Room 222 from April 30th, 1970. Here's issue three of Room 222 from June 30th, 1970. You know, if I saw a Room 222 comic book, I'm not sure I'd buy it. <laughs> well, again, it's, it's, it's kind of like the governor and JJ I'll talk about in a minute. Let me hurry along. Now, here's the fourth issue from January 10th, 71. Again, the show was still on the air. But I guess it didn't sell well because they already started reprinting. They reprinted the first issue. All they did was change. Look at the Dell corner box upper left. See it there in issue one. There it is in issue four. Yeah. Another case where you got to know what you're doing when you're buying it because you might think you're buying the first issue and it's really the fourth. You know, I, might next, look, I might have to look inside a couple of my comic books just to make sure. Yeah. Now here well, is Land of the Giants. Everything. November 10th, 1968. Dell, Land of the Giants, issue one. Oh, uh, that's one I wished I had. Oh, Al Hardy's here. Hey, Al. Hello, Al. Al. I don't think you can hear us. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. I, I, I'm so glad you're on. Yeah, I had a question. Yeah, it's hey, perfect. Oh, 
hey, this is perfect time. And now you got some more guests to take over from me. My thing's about to die. And you can have me on next time. Okay, Dan. Thanks for being a part of it. I'll just remove you from the stage. Thank you, Dan. I, I would hang Bye, out long five percent. I just don't think the laptop's well, going to hold. You want to hear? I was going to. Now this guy on the far right, Al, worked on. Uh, it was a Turner with the wrestling stuff. Fine. Your mom photographed these wrestlers. So before you go, Al, do you have anything to add? When did you meet all these wrestlers at Turner? And I'm sure Tom did too. Tom may have directed them. Yeah, yeah. Tom met him. He he met him the same time I did. Uh, I'm sure they taped every Tuesday. Move the comic and, book. Okay. What? He's telling me to move the comic book. Sorry, go ahead. There. Oh, oh. and uh, anyway, they taped every Tuesday, and so I I met Andre the Giant. I, I met all of them. I, they were all, every Tuesday. They were there. They taped every Tuesday. And I've Gordon, been to the I've been to the TV tapings that are a couple of times back in seventy nine and eighty. Well, uh, Turner used to be on West Peachtree Street, and then we moved over to Techwood, and uh, but they had kind of. Well, they didn't have their own studio, but they had a larger space uh, to allow more guests to watch the show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been to the Peach Street, the Peach Tree Street place a few times. Yeah, that um, was West, that was West Peach Tree Street. And um, I, I've been to the Omni a lot. I used to go to the big wrestling shows they had in the Omni. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, they had those. But I, I met all of them, and uh, it was funny. Uh, they had a what Tom knows is right across from Control C. They had a bathroom and they had showers and all that stuff in there. And after they finished, you know, doing their thing, they had to go in there and take showers. <laughs> they all were in it there. Was, it was not very pleasant I, smelling. I yeah. went in there. This is a true story. I went in there one day to take a leak and Andre was in there and Gordon Soley was, they were all taking a shower, butt ass naked in there. You know, I'd paid much. I, did, I just kind of like looked the other way. And that's a true story. Yeah. Hey, yeah. um, look at Tom's background, Dan. He's at the Weather Channel. Look at, isn't that cool? Look at that control yeah. room. That is awesome. Yeah, Tom, Tom and I, I Tom, Tom and I worked together at Turner, and then uh, he freelanced. When well, see, Turner went through massive layoffs, and I got let go after thirteen years. And Tom, you you let you got let go after how many no, I, years? I, I never got let go. I I quit. <laughs> oh, I thought what, they what MSNBC. Oh, that's right. That's right. Well, you saw all the changes going on at Turner, and they weren't all yeah. that great, you know. I, I, I was the last director uh, uh, left on staff out of eight. We oh. had eight at Turner Studios, <clears throat> and so I was the last one left. Uh, and I was busy, uh, not necessarily doing stuff I really wanted to do. Right. right. But uh, you know, that's that's the nature of the business that we're a man, and. Uh, so it's, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I, I did a, shoot, a few shows with Rick Kaplan. Uh, yeah, I remember. CNN, I remember. And he, uh, he said, Hey, uh, you know, come up to MSNBC. So I did. And, uh, and I regretted yeah, it. You didn't, you didn't stay at MSNBC too long. I though. Almost two years. Yeah. Really? That long? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Anyway. I, I, you you and you and Don Imus. Yeah. <laughs> you and Don Imus. Just like you and Don Imus. He and Don Imus. Yeah. He, he right. was he was a he he could be nice, but uh, most of the time he was just a grumpy old fart. And uh he um Yeah, he, he left had, him he had, no, in, he had no reason to be a grumpy old fart. I mean, but he was that was his uh, stick though, I think. But anyway, he uh, came across that way. But he uh, he left MSNBC and went to RFD TV. Remember? Yeah. Well, he, he kind of had okay. to because he had that uh, racial incident. Sure. Oh, that's that. right. MS. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 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 We won't go. Won't, we won't go. We into won't that. go there. But yeah. And so uh, <laughs> and then he had that ranch outside. I think in New Mexico. Yes, he, he did. had a ranch out. Yes, there. he did. Yes, yeah. he did. So, yes, he did. But anyway, I digress. I digress. Esmeralda says hello, Al. Hello She's there, Esmeralda. I see her. Yeah. Ta da. Yeah. Well, um, why are you working today, Tom? Well, there was make money. There was a, a well, he don't day. usually work on the weekends. No, no, I don't. But no. uh, there, there was a um, basically there was an opening two weeks ago, and I was asked if I could fill it. So oh, okay. I said, yeah. And I regret it because um, I uh, don't get paid overtime because of. Uh, I took off Monday. So, oh, anyway. oh. well, 
Well, you know, California has been getting a lot of bad weather lately. So, and it's really bad out there. Well, people build houses up on the side of hills and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. And you know, yeah. when it rains, it, it, it's going to, that, that mud is going to slide. Yeah. Some of the right? footage that we, that we've gotten through, gone through, it's just amazing. Uh, they, huh, I just hope they all have flood insurance. Yeah. Well, yeah, well I, you know, I, California I, used to not get any rain, and now they're just getting more yeah. rain in a day than they would get in a month. So, Chance, I, I got a question for you. Um, what what um, what does lamb chop? From Sherry, Sherry, Lewis Sherry Lewis and Star Trek have in common. She wrote an episode, The Lights of Zitar, season three. She co-wrote it. And that was about exorcism with Spot Scotty's girlfriend. One of the few times you saw Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott in a romantic relationship. You saw it in season two, Who yeah. Mourns for Adonis. Um, and then in that episode. Well, you will was, all die. Wait. She was supposed to be. You will all <laughs> die. She's possessed. She was supposed to be in that episode. And then uh, the producer hired his girlfriend instead so she wasn't too happy about that but uh that's just that's the story her her daughter tells mm -hmm. um so she she came up with a name of the um uh, of the um uh, and everything so alien, that's a shame that's a shame because she was really wanting to do that because she really uh, enjoyed uh star trek so I love Sherry Lewis. I know you probably did too. She's been gone since 1998, believe it or not. Oh, she died young. She she certainly did. Yeah. The song that never ends. Remember I think that? her. I think her. I think her Muppets are in the Smithsonian now. Well, her her puppets are, but her daughter has the originals and oh, still okay. doing uh, Sherry Lewis's uh, bits mm -hmm. and sounds just like Lamb Chop. So uh, it's it's great. I mean. She, she has a she, she has a weird nose. She has a thing across her nose, makes her nose really big. It's like she's had a uh, a nose job that, that went bad. But I don't know. Her mm. name's Mallory, I think. And mm. uh, but she but she's a very delightful person on camera, and she carries mm. herself very well. So she picked that up from her mother, obviously. You know, you know, because her mother was very good. Was Danny's very battery died. I'm going to show Tom for your benefit some Munsters comics. I don't know if you're watching earlier, just for you, because I know you're a huge Munsters fan. Maybe some of these will jar your memory. Do oh, you yeah. have any of these in your collection? I've, I've got a couple. I've got that one that you just showed. I don't want to cover you up. I'm trying to figure out how I can do this where I'm not blocking your face. Um, well, that's okay. Block your face. That, that's okay. Well, let me just quickly go through. That's the first issue. Yeah. There's the second issue. Do you have any of these? No, I've got that one. And I got What's the, the name of their car? You'll know. What's the name of their car? The I Munster asked. Coach. The Munster Coach. You got it, it my it's man. Made, it's made by Barris, and uh, he uh, he he took it and uh, made that car, and he made Dragula as well, the one that Al Lewis drove to win the coach back after yep. Herman lost it in a uh, hot rod contest that you know Eddie put his dad up to. My dad can beat your dad, you know that type of thing. So. It was a it was a very good uh, it's a very good episode and there's a company, it's on the East Coast and I forget their names and they'll make you a monster coach if you're paying them like a hundred and seventy five thousand dollars you know yeah and uh, I've mm. seen pictures of some of them and they look good and, and matter of fact that might be who Butch Patrick got his from I don't know I can't speak for Butch Patrick of course but uh, you know. They, uh, he has that one. And he has Dracula. Although I think he sold them and got two um, two different ones. So I don't know why he did that, but uh, I I think he did. And I asked that, that trivia question. Someone had guessed Dracula in the chat. Is the that that's not Dracula yeah. like drag racing and Dracula? Yes. And, yeah. Correct. Correct. Uh, and, and, you want to you want to hear a sad story about the monsters? Well, when it comes to sixteen millimeter film. Okay. Uh, I was at Turner when yeah, they were this. converting from 16 millimeter over to, to, to digital tape. Right. And we had the whole series of the monsters, every one of the episodes in MCA cans. And I had a chance to get them. I mean, they said you can have them if you want them. And so they kept them over at the field shop. Now Tom knows about the field shop. 
That's where they kept all the remote gears and the trucks. And the film department had a big room over there where we kept a lot of film. And uh, by the time I got over there to get them, they had already thrown them in the dumpster. Well, <laughs> listen, an even better, worse story than that, my office, when I was at Turner, overlooked the loading, one of the loading docks. The loading dock with the big dumpsters out there. Yes. And I saw uh, Hoffines. Jim Hoffines. He was a great a, guy. Carrying a bunch of MCA reels full of film mm -hmm. onto the dock and hosing them down with water. Oh, yeah. Once water hits film, it's ruined. It's 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 because you know, the emulsion sticks together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw that. And I knocked on the glass, and he ignored me. Yeah. <laughs> I said, "Don't do that." I know well, I got a full run of I drew my genie as well as you, um, and it was not watered down. But but no, my garage flooded at the time. And oh. almost got it. Well, I had I had all the genies. I had all the Stooges. I had all the Andy Griffiths, the Love American Styles, Lost in Space, yeah. uh, some Space 1999, some of those. I didn't have all of them, but I, I had a ton of them. Yeah. Space yeah. Giants, which I'm sure after you sign off, I'll play some clips because you guys don't care about that. But I'm no, I have I had some of those. Yeah, you had all of them. You said all 52. I, well, I did. There was not that. Well, it was, you know, I did have, but I didn't like them. I I let those go yeah, as soon as I got them. Understandable. It's you know, it's yeah. it is what it is. It's Japanese adapted to America. Americana it doesn't always work, does it? You know, the only reason I got into television back when I lived in North Carolina is I love film and I wanted to work in the film department, have access to all that film. That's, you know, and then from there I learned how to be a director and that sort of stuff. But, you know, I just wanted to be around that film. Well, and another thing they used to, the traffic used to come through the film department and go through the drawers of all the commercials. And when they got outdated, they just threw them away and nobody wanted them. I should have, you know, thinking back, if I'd have saved all those commercials, I mean, what a collection it would have been. That would have been a big one, too. Oh, and, you know, I still have some. I have all the a lot of the Coca-Cola ads. I have some Pepsi-Cola ads and that sort of stuff. But yeah. Not, you know, not not the ones that I could have saved a lot more, but I did. Yeah, I had so. several reels that I had built up of, of, of commercials, uh, network promos, and everything. Mm -hmm. Man, I wish I had kept them. I'm I sure. kept all the NBC programs because, <clears throat> excuse me, Channel 6 in my hometown was an NBC affiliate, and they used to send the little 30-second commercials yeah. and 60-second NBC spots. I still have a bunch of those. I'm sure they're all red, but now, Chance, have you got any of, of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mostly. and, and yeah. I wanted to watch film with you guys at Al's today. I didn't know you would be working, so it all worked out, and then I decided yeah. to do this with Dan, you know, I wasn't thinking because I'm like, well, I kind of would want to watch film with the fellas, but it wouldn't have worked anyway. So there's no. Well, problem. I, oh wait, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. I, uh, I, I didn't know it wouldn't be uh, doing anything. I had to come in here and set all this stuff up. You know, all, all of this, all of this wonderful equipment, and turn the lights on and, and do all that stuff myself. Set up the uh, audio console over there. You know, and uh, play the music. The music is playing in the background right now. You cannot hear it, but because uh, I got it turned down now. But I had I had a lot to do, and um, by the way, let me say, oh no, <laughs> don't eat at Panda Express. I will say no more, especially not at Six Flags. <laughs> oh, Panda Express Panda is kind of it's kind of cheap Japanese uh, Japanese Chinese food, you know. Yeah, it's, it's no food. China Moon. It's no <laughs> China Moon. No, and I almost went to China Moon, and I almost I came. That close to texting you say, hey, I'm going to try to moon. I would have met you. Uh, when yeah, I was on the I'll air. see you over there. And, and I went to, real quick, just a sideline. And I went to In-N-Out Burger. I went inside and went, you know. You mean like, Whataburger? No, no. Oh, Whataburger. Sorry. Okay. I wish In-N-Out. <laughs> and, and I said, I'm not going to wait in this stupid line. They've got two cashiers. I, I don't want it that bad. And uh, I they're drove 24 hours, though. You can go on the way home, they're 24 that's hour true. a day. That's true. That's the, I would go to Jersey Mike's and then I started thinking about China Moon. I went, Well, you know, uh, it's 1 30 or one, you know, whatever time it was. So then I decided oh, I'll just go to Panda Express. And boy, was that a mistake, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, god, when do you go on the air? And, oh, we, we don't know. It just depends on if you're you stand by there. You're just sitting around yes, waiting to get the work. What, what time do you get off? 
about, work about 10 30 11 o'clock Ooh, that'd be but a good time I, to go to whataburger i mean on the yeah, way home <clears throat> but i've got to go to uh uh work tomorrow at nine o'clock because it's an extended show tomorrow night and i asked if i could do it so um, i said well, sure why not I, as opposed to turning around and coming back here and here in the morning so anyway i digress al uh i know tom saw this because i saw him mouth Carol, hello eugene ballinger hello yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. And you get a lot of compliments, Al and Tom. Um, oh, yeah. Where is that? Yeah. Let me find. I put it on the screen, but I like what Esmeralda said. What a great group of gentlemen. So much knowledge. Yes, on we are gentlemen. Time. Well, thank you, Esmeralda. I'm not a gentleman. We fake I'm the it. only we, one that's not. We fake it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I owe you both an apology because I t Al's texting me. I'm going live with Tom. I didn't really slam you fellas, but I'm like, man, I'm like, I, they bother me for a link. No, come on. So I take it back. Well, I, I know what you text me. You, you they used the, the the D word. Well, what? <laughs> we are men. You said, said forgive no, and forget. No, you look, said look. you said what a bunch of dicks. Oh look, God! Look, 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 <laughs> don't say that on the air. Well, well you I, text it. You know, anyway. I take it back. It was wrong of me. I need to here. Let me smack my finger. <laughs> uh, all right. I won't do that no more. <laughs> anyway. Um, anyway, anyway, uh, 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 yeah, I, I just oh, monsters. I got Panda Express Cup. I, I need to turn that around. I don't want to give them any free advertising. Hey, what were you going to say about the Are monsters? you going to need a pot by you when you're on the air in case nature calls? No, nature already called. <laughs> oh, that's why you're warning us. I, oh. I told, I told Al earlier, I was like, don't go to Panda Express. Uh, like it's like, I'm glad there's not one. That I know, well, well, there's one close to me, but I don't. I, I haven't been there in a long time. Well, they they listen just like with what? everything, just like with everything. They they uh, uh, um, they they par down their uh, portions, and it costs more. It's it's, it's oh. just not worth it. It's not worth wow. It. But anyway, let uh, me so show you I, some more covers. Oh, go ahead, sir. That's true everywhere. So show me some more covers. I'm sorry. Okay. I, All I monsters. Know. There's the fourth. Yeah. There's the fifth. Uh. There's the six. Now the show was still on the air at this point. That's yeah. that's the Dragula, right? That that is. And Al was you know, if you see that canopy that's over uh, over top of the coach, the casket, uh, fumes fumes would go in there, and Al Lewis uh, could not sit in there very long at all because it just wasn't designed uh, properly uh, uh, as far as ventilation goes. Uh, you know those cars, the much the coach. The Batmobile, and they were all built quickly by Barris. And um, and Barris, look, look, I'm sorry. I've met him. He's a night, he was a nice guy. Uh, I met him at a car show up in Massachusetts or wherever I was doing a show. And uh, uh, a side note was a gentleman named Ben Novak, uh, which was, which had a movie done. A movie of the week done about him because his wife murdered him. And um, hmm. uh, what's his um, who was a oh, dang on it? Who was the guy that during the Jimmy Carter election was caught with somebody he shouldn't be with at the Omni Hotel? What was the actor's name? Come on, chance. What was oh, the no, actor's name? Are you thinking of uh, the 1988 Democratic Convention, Rob yes. Lowe? Rob Lowe. That was 88. That wasn't Carter. That was uh, Dukakis. Dukakis. Okay. Same thing. Yeah, yeah because right. they, that's what that's the year they had the uh, convention Underage. in Atlanta. Underage. But anyway, but anyway he, played, he played Ben Novak uh, in that particular uh, movie. And uh, I, took, I took Ben. Ben was in charge of our convention. I took Ben down to meet... Uh, Mr. Barris, and he was thrilled because he was having a, a Batmobile made uh, for himself. Um, so that was great. I, although Bar I don't think Barris made his Batmobile, but Ben bought some stuff from him because uh, Ben was a man there. You know, his wife killed him for the money, and she's in jail now, as, as well as her, her two cousins who she hired to beat him to death, unfortunately. But um, mm. he was, uh, he, he had the second largest 
Batman collection in the world, or in the United States, I should say. And I saw a lot of it. I've been to his house, and I saw a lot of it. Wow, he had some stuff. But uh, like comic books, like Batman One. Oh yeah, he had all Detective that stuff. Comics Thirty Nine. Yes, oh, yes wow. he had all that stuff. He had animation cells. He had a resin statues. He had he had all of it. Because let's face it, he was a man, right? And he said, "I want it. I'll buy it." And that's what he did. So, um, well, you know, when you have money, you can do that. Yeah, he lived on a lock on one of those locks in uh, Miami and he had two boats parked outside in the back of his house, <laughs> you know, and uh, it was, he was, uh, he was a Jewish gentleman and he was quite the character. He was quite what did this have to do with Rob Lowe? Did I miss something? Was it the director of the convention that had the, no, no, Rob Lowe starred in the uh, ABC movie of the week or what NBC or whatever uh, TV movie, I should say about the murder of Ben Novak. Got it. Okay. So there was um, an NBC movie or ABC movie, and and Rob played uh, Ben Novak in the movie. It was and it was on Dateline. MS, it was NBC. It was ah. on Dateline M, M, NBC and everything. But uh, I get I I I go full circle to say that Barris was that car was made from the original Futurama car that Ford made, and there was only one, and Barris bought it. And he and he had molds made and all that sort of stuff, but he also, at the same time, destroyed the the Futurama car, making the Batmobile for ABC for the Batman series, and that's a shame because that was the only Future Liner car out there. Now since then, uh, that same company that makes the the Batmobiles and the uh, uh, I think the Monster Coach and Dragula. Uh, makes a future uh, a future line of car that you can buy, and uh, uh, if you have that kind of money, and uh, from the original molds that this company bought from Barris's estate, I think I, I, I think I'm right when I say that, but uh, I could be wrong. But but Barris didn't, there wasn't that much designing work in the Batmobile because if you look at the future liner and look at the Batmobile. You know, there's not that much difference between the two. I mean, he did some design uh, things, but, uh, you know, th th and, th and I agree with Esmeralda. They are works of art. Yes, they are. But Barris didn't do that much to mm -hmm. the Batmobile to get it. But he, in all fairness, he only had a very limited time to make it. And he was the only one stepping up to the plate. His company, I should say, uh, was the only one stepping up to the plate to, to do it. So. He did it, so, and look what it got him. He originally sold the original, one of the original Batmobiles a few years before he uh, died at one of those uh, uh, Meekum auctions, and the thing bought like two or three million, or, or I forget the exact number, but about stupid money, you know? Uh, and the original Dragula is hanging in a, a, a restaurant somewhere up north, I think, uh, the original Dragula. So, um, anyway. speaking of things being retooled for other projects, the robot from Lost in Space was savagely butchered for a Saturday morning show called, I think, Mysterious Island. And they like took his bubble, made a big rectangular plastic thing. And luckily it got restored after that. But for a long time, the robot was just gutted. That's a shame, too, because uh, th those those should be. In the Smithsonian. I yeah, mean, like the Fonz's jacket and Archie's chair. Yeah, what about yeah. the thing Enterprise? About it is, if, if they rebuild it, it's still not the. It's not the same, really. No, it's not the original. No. no. Yeah. They had two robot costumes. They had a long suit that was for like when he's floating in space, and then they had the close-up, the regular one, and then you had the Bermuda shorts. They removed the tread section so Bob May, the guy in the robot suit, could get around the set easier. And then for long shots, he would have the tread section. And then, but so you had two suits really. You had the full suit, and then you had the special effects stunt robot suit, which I used in the very last episode, Junkyard in Space, beginning for the opening credits. You see the robot suspended from a magnet on a junk planet, like a giant junkyard in space. And that's the long suit. Anyway, there, and there was an episode where they showed both the robots in the antimatter world and the antimatter man communicating with each other. And one was Bob May, the other was just the long range robot suit in a cage. Anyway, right. I digress. 
Uh, here's another cover. This is the last one to be published when the Monsters was still on the air on CBS in reruns from August 10th, 66. There's that cover. Yep. And then here's got, the, yeah, I only got a couple of them. So there's, there's, there's not there's, that many more. But there's only yeah. 14 and 15, and I'm sorry, 16. I'm wrong. Um, and then here is the first one published on October 10th after the show was off the air. But it's a nice cover. Now that that one came out, I believe, around the same time the movie was released. Maybe I, I could be wrong about that. You're right. No, you are right. This was actually a couple months after it was in theaters. But yeah, the same yeah. general time frame. You know that movie wasn't very good. No, it wasn't, yeah. but you got to see them in color. Well, you got to uh, see them in color. In fact, when I was uh, in high school, I was an usher at the Bailey Theater. We played Monster Go Home. Yeah. And so uh, I was, you know, couldn't wait to see it. I, I, like I said, I, I enjoyed it, but, you know, just seeing them in color was what was really yeah. good. I had a 16 millimeter Technicolor print of that movie. We still kept it. Yeah. Well, Universal it's, did all their stuff in Technicolor back in the yep. day. Yep. Someone on Facebook says, hey, Chance, Dan, Tom, Al, love you guys. Oh, howdy. <laughs> okay, you reboot it. Okay. Do I need to get out of your way? Okay. Sorry. All right. Um, we just had a nice compliment on Facebook. I'll go on and see who that is and identify them. It doesn't show me in the stream yard for some reason. It says it Facebook them. user mystery. Yeah. Mystery. <laughs> Identify yourself. Thank you for was the your nice face comment. When you were scrolling through Facebook, was it making a chirping sound for a while? Me? You know, Who are you asking? No, all of you. When, you. when you scroll up on your timeline, it'll make a little chirping sound. Well, yeah. people complained about it so much, I think they just quit doing it. Hmm, I didn't know that. I never yeah. noticed that. Yeah. Uh, let me show another quick cover. December 10th, 66. With Grandpa. Yeah. Al Lewis. Uh, here's another one. Uh, there is the 11th. I like the big bat. It reminds me of Batman. And oh, I said this, Tom, you may not have been. What a shame. You might not have been watching or listening. What isn't it a shame that Gold Key didn't have the rights to Adam West Batman? How colorful those covers would have been with the villains. DC wouldn't let them do it. That would have been a hot seller. I know you guys would have been buying them. No, it would have been. It would have been. It would have been. And the shame that, uh, that Batman uh, not. The monsters off the air because they were hey, talking about earlier and gave you credit. I were you at, were you says, at, yeah, yeah, were you at Turner when uh, we had Super Scary Saturday hosted by Al Lewis? No, no, I had just came there when they stopped production. Of it. Oh, because he, he where, used to uh, he came down once the, a he came down once a month and recorded the wraparounds from the movies right, that we showed did. on Super Scary Saturday. And he uh, moved. No, he's good. Are you sure? Okay. Uh, when when I picked up my jeans, my I dream of jeans, yeah, that's where they were. Was was in the studio because it's still a studio at that time, right? And still was set up for Super Scary Saturday. The steps were there, the walls and and everything was still there, uh, but they had, you know, removed a lot of the lights. Mm -hmm. and stuff. Apparently, I used to see uh, Al Lewis. You know, you know the little eating area we had next to Headline News was called yeah. the Side Dish. Yeah. And I used to see Al Lewis in there eating lunch a lot of times. He would come down once a month and do all the wraparounds. Was kind yeah. of, he was a nice guy. I liked him all right. Yeah, he, he, he could be a nice guy. He could, he be, could be grumpy, but he was a pretty, pretty, pretty nice guy. Yeah. You know, Tom, I have a question from the chat in Facebook. Did the production company pay for the car? Yes. It went back to what you're saying. Okay. Yes, about the did. monsters and yes, Batmobile. Did. Yes, they did. But they did not own it. They, they basically, it was like a rental or lease, or whatever, because ah. Barris still maintain ownership of the Munster coach, Dragula, and, and the Batmobile, and uh, uh, several other uh, vehicles that were used in, in TV that he had his hand. And um, on, um, I forget where his shop was located, it was Santa Monica Boulevard uh, in Hollywood. You, you, could still, you could still go by there. I think the shop is still there, and you can still go in and, and see the Monster Coach and, and the Batmobile. A Batmobile, I should say. Whatever and, happened to it? Whatever happened to what? The, the, original, Bat, yeah. the original Batmobile was sold at Meekum Auctions uh -huh. two, two or three years ago. There was like three of them. I think mm -hmm. three of them. One of them was done in like black velvet. It was weird. It, it, 
they used that for the movie, I think. I could be wrong about that one. But um, regardless, the one of the original ones was sold at Meekum, and, and that went for several million dollars. Um, and then Barris gave his jacket uh, along with it, which had Barris all over it. And, and mm -hmm. It was kind of cool. And, right. and there were several, there, there's several videos on YouTube where um, they go into his shop and you see his, uh, where antique archaeology or the, you know, that, that stupid show on History Channel. Um, I call it stupid because me and Tom Hudgens, who we all know, mm -hmm. we were doing you. that way before. Way, we weren't doing televised, of course. Right. But Doing he's deceased kind of now unfortunately yeah unfortunately but we were doing this kind of stuff we go all over the place in my volkswagen or whatever car i was at it went to washington dc bought a bunch of magic posters all kinds of stuff we were doing we were stopping at antique stores we were maybe we, <laughs> who just would have been a great host of a show like that because he knew the talk he knew the lingo he knew how to dicker with these guys and he makes those guys look like amateur hour, in my opinion. Um, but then again, I was kind of close to him, so of course I would say that. But uh, th that being that being the case, it, it, the uh, we saw a lot of cool stuff back then, and, and and going back looking at it, it was cheap. It was cheap uh, compared to what it would sell for now. So, that, and that's how Tom made his living was selling a lot of antique goods and, and posters and jukeboxes and drink machines and and and, and whatnot. And uh, uh, he he made he made a good living uh, doing that uh, in and around his music store, which he he was had. a flipper instead of real yeah, estate he was, items. He was he he really was. I mean, well, he was he was a collector. He was a collector, but he did he didn't hoard his stuff. He would enjoy well, it, then let it go. Correct. He wouldn't yeah. like us, Al, right? We, we hoard. He's not like me where I hoard stuff. Sure. I so. mean, I mean, Al's got some films that we'll probably never, well, we all do, but we'll probably never watch again. True. And, and he could probably get good money for it, but, but it's so hard sell to sell it. it. No. So hard. So, yeah. so, you know, it's one of those things where, like you said, hoarder, but or collector, <laughs> however you want to word it. Um, well, I'm a collector. Know. Al's a hoarder to be specific. Uh, well, I think we're all kind of hoarders. I'm Something kidding, Al. Look, look behind you, Chance. That's 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 a hoard of stuff. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm no, just no, he's a collector. <laughs> he's a collector. It was Mary Smith who said, "Hi, Chance, Dan, Tom, love you guys." I'm in Facebook here, real quick. Um, I, uh, I had one other comment I wanted to read. Uh, Rick Clark says we had a 1978 Harlem Globetrotters pinball machine for many years. Yeah, he just said it earlier. He said a lot earlier. I'm just now seeing it. And he said, found a bunch of gold key comics at an estate sale, the FBI, et cetera. Oh, wow. The FBI well, story. I used to have, I, I, and I still got a few of them. I got a man from uncle, some man from uncle comics. Uh, I've got the, almost the entire uh, small Bantam books uh, that they put out from man from uncle. And I've got the lunchbox. I've got the marks, the marks toy company figures. Mm -hmm. Um, M A R X, but, yeah, marks, yeah. but but you know, it, it's and I've got them all and they're in boxes. And you know, if I was home, I'd show you, but but they're all in boxes. And I and unfortunately, I have no desire to uh take them out, but who knows? I could I could change. Susan could say, No, we need to get these stuff, the stuff out of the boxes, <laughs> and then we'll get it out of the boxes. And then I'll die. <laughs> I see your China, your China Express cut behind you there, Tom. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I That's okay. It. No, it's not bothering me. Let's give him a <laughs> it plug. It's so me. small. There. It's so small you can't tell, really. But, um, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where, just, just like, God forbid, when, when you know, all of us, you know, only so long on this planet, what happens to all of our stuff? you got to ask yourself that question. And, um you know, you, you enjoy it while you're here. We're, we're, all only, we're all only here for so many years, and we only we get to enjoy it 
while we have it. And part of the game is owning it, finding it, buying it, enjoying it, and either moving on out or give it to your son Chris if he likes that stuff. Son Chris, yes, you're right. but, but 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 an offspring or a relative may not be into that stuff anyway. You just no, but you know. he, luckily he is. I mean, luckily all my projectors and he knows what all I've got. He knows it's it's worth you know to the right person some some money and uh, and uh, same with Al's stuff and same with your stuff. Is you know we all have stuff that's worth some money. It's just yeah. finding the right person that's willing to go through it all and decipher, oh, this is worth something or this is not worth anything. Throw it away or, or whatever the case may be. And so, at the right time because we're yeah, in a horrible economy right now. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you I see mean, the comment, I mean, Tom? Do you want to read that from Terrell? He's, he's well, agreeing the, with what you said earlier. Well, the Muslims was canceled around the same time as the Adams family. Yep, and Batman, you may have probably, it, what, it did play a factor. Because in the color, Adams family's abrupt, abrupt demise as well. It, yeah. But you said, yeah, the monsters. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, yeah, they were in color, uh, and uh, the superhero festival or whatever you want to call it had, had, had taken its roots, and Batman uh, certainly did that. It, not, the same can be said. The same cannot be said. I'm sorry with Gilligan's Island, which is around the same time frame, whereas uh, the CBS executives' wife didn't like Gilligan's Island and that's why it was pulled off the air, which is stupid because well, a lot of the CBS good. executives didn't like any of the hillbilly shows either. Right. Like, you know, right. when Hee Haw first came on, it was on CBS and, right. you know, of course they had green acres and they had, uh, what was some other, the, uh, the Beverly hillbillies, Petticoat yeah. Junction, Beverly Petticoat Hills. Junction, all that. You know. uh, well, that's and, the, and the they were, Henning universe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they were all doing uh, pretty good ratings. Uh, Gilligan's Island was still doing good ratings. He pulled it off the air because his wife didn't like it. Well, you know what our I friend Jim Gossett taught me about that, Tom? What? He said Fred Silverman canceled all those urban shows. Yeah. I, he, was, yeah he was the president of CBS at yeah. the time. I never knew that. Yeah. Jim Gossett comedy. Yeah. Yeah, Jim Gossett. Yeah, I but was, why would they cancel something that had decent ratings? Exactly. You know, exactly. that doesn't make it, any sense to me. Oh, look what happened to Live PD, Al. It was the number one show on cable. It got canceled in 2018 by Arts and Entertainment Network. Yeah. Why? Who and then they tried, to, they, they tried to sue yeah, Reels for, for copying their idea. Oh, yeah. they changed but, the but, name, though. But they changed the name, so they, they couldn't. And one it. of the hosts they changed. Yes. Yeah. yeah who knows? Who, listen, who knows what goes on in the boardrooms? of the big executives or networks these days because it's all a totally different game back when I first started, when Al started, and um, it's all cable. And it's like they, they laughed at cable when it first came out. They said, oh, I'll never catch on. Or pay TV, he'll never catch on. <laughs> what were they wrong? Because th there was a show, shows, re actuality shows, reality shows, you know, they don't cost much to make. And that's why you still see. That's all you see so on network them. television I mean, I mean, is reality we're, shows. We're running one right now on the Weather Channel. I, I can't see. I don't know the name of it, but we've even got them. So you know they, they pull in the numbers. People still like back road truckers is what it's called, and people like that stuff. And that's and it's all fine and well, but uh, oh, I'm saying that couple again. Uh, it's so, okay. It's, it's one of those things that that's what your audience likes. Variety shows, you don't see those anymore. Nope. And they were great back then, except for the Brady Bunch. But yeah. um, I talked about that yeah. last time. Yeah. But, you know, you know, speaking of the old shows, I mean, I, I grew up watching all those, you know, shows we just talked about. And that's why I don't watch too much of MT, uh, me TV because I've seen them all. Now, Chance has not seen all the Beverly Hillbillies. I've seen them all many times. And I'm really not interested in watching but, them again but you know what would make you interested in watching them if they because you know they're out there you know what? somebody's got them if somebody would run the original network run of all those shows with the original commercials that is true man that is true. That, i'm telling you that's what tv would, land used to do with reruns they wouldn't show the yeah. original commercials but they would show commercials from around that time yeah 
And so well, every uh, once in a while, you'll see on the end credits, you'll see the product sponsorship yeah, yeah. on end credits of shows. They, you will still yeah. still see that occasionally. Toby Gillis has that. Yeah. Several mm -hmm. shows. My three sons, even sometimes Yeah, yeah. those those survive for some reason. I mean, I, mean, I saw I saw my three sons with Frederick Murray at the beginning. Hi, welcome to the show brought to you by Chevrolet. Heinz Ketchup. The show to Heinz Ketchup. It was yeah. Heinz Ketchup, wasn't it? And, and and they'll even have a cigarette pack, which I can't believe this happens. Like the Danny Thomas show, otherwise known as Make Room for Daddy in syndication. Mm -hmm. But Cozy would play those. Sometimes the end credits would show a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. And I'm like, in today's times, I'm like, that's surprising because <laughs> 1969, they outlawed uh, cigarette advertising on television. Yeah. They probably ran a disclaimer. <laughs> you know, for a long time, they wouldn't allow booze to be advertised on television. Now, you can see beer commercials, but not alcohol not but they not, can't drink the beer in the commercial they can't no, they, can't, they can't drink it no. no in an ad they they just hold up the beer i remember robert yeah. klein made a joke uh you know what this is son this is a beer you know what this is for he goes to hold up and look at daddy <laughs> wasn't that funny the joke but reference to beer commercials there oh yeah Ugh. but yeah. you rarely you rarely see movies today with people smoking uh back in the 40s and 50s and even 60s i mean you watch tv shows and movies and they're just buffing away well, Roy Thinnis well, on the Invaders was smoking. David Jansen oh, yeah. on the Fugitive, yeah, smoking like chimneys. Well, listen, right. there was a way. I mean, who knows what can happen down the line? If AI technology keeps going the way it's going, they can take the cigarettes right out of their hands very easily. Whereas before, own your content. Good point. They have to rotoscope it out, and, and it costs a lot of money. But if AI keeps going the way it is, take all the cigarettes out of the show. Boom, it's done. And you know, the, the original 45 record cov cover of the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, it had Paul McCartney holding a cigarette in his hand. On the I have that. But later years, they digitized that out. They well, took it out. Manny, Mo, and Jack from the Pet Boys, if mm -hmm. you recall, the third guy, the one on the far right wore the, the uh, circle glasses, had a cigar in his mouth. Right. That's right. Ain't there no more. Yeah. I there are no more. See, again, it, it's agenda. Agenda in business doesn't always mix. And it's a no. shame when agenda gets in the way, whether it's casting choices in movies, you know, they rechange someone's appearance the way they've been always presented. You know, it's like, why don't you just create your own character? I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Create something original. I have no problem with that. As nothing well, else. Well, what bugs me is, is they're letting the, the small majority, no matter who they are, rule what is done for all of us now it seems like whether you but want the repercussions when that happens right tom yeah exactly whether you want to call them wokes or whatever you want to call them the, the left or the liberal or whatever or the it far right or it doesn't yeah. matter if, if you ask the standard joe on the street they don't care so it, quit making your agenda everyone's agenda and let's do our own thing I, that's I don't know. Hey, you asked about Tom. I'm about Tom asked about uh, Jim Gossett, and then we sort of talked over each other. He just announced a new gig April 20th in Roswell, Georgia, at the old Hawks Grill location. That's a Saturday night. I'm I'm going April 20th. It, is is Kimmer going to show up? I don't know. Probably not. <laughs> Probably. Who knows? That's their thing. I, I might get involved. Yeah, yeah. with that. That's none of my business. <laughs> I think Al still watches. To. Al, you still <laughs> watch the Kimmer, don't you? Every once in a while, well, he, just, he, he just rants and rants. I mean, it's a, every once in a while, I'll tune yeah. in. But lately, I watch podcasts on usually Tuesdays and Thursdays right. when I take care of my friend's dogs. I come home and I bring my lunch and I'll sit down and I go to YouTube and watch podcasts. But I watch podcasts on movies and uh, people talking about the latest Blu ray releases, the DVD releases. Um, there's still DVDs being released. Honestly, yeah. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. But because like Best but Buy is not even carrying stores. retail stores are not even carrying DVDs. Well, well there's a website. It's it's, it's uh it, it lists all the DVDs released for the you know every Tuesdays when they come out. DVDs and Blu-rays for some reason they always come out on Tuesday, and so they re you know every Tuesday for the whole month they'll list the DVDs and Blu-rays hitting the stores or or buy them on Amazon or wherever. Uh, on every Tuesday for the whole month. Wow. Well, Disney announced they're not going to release any of their streaming Marvel shows on home video, whether it's Blu-ray, 4K, DVD. That was a few months ago, but I think they may have changed course on that decision. Yeah. 
yeah, because people cool. have been canceling Disney Plus like crazy lately because of the price <laughs> hikes. Yeah, it's well, been in the news. Yeah, you yeah. Know, people I, cut people cut the cable, but then they pay crazy prices to stream. Well, it didn't used to be that way. No, that, that's the way. It well, is. It's, it's like a drug dealer tactic, right? They give a free sample to get someone hooked, and then they charge. Yeah, out the yin yang. Not that it's, I know. It's, it's just like Prime. Money. Prime has started charging two ninety nine a month. To go commercial free, right? Uh, you well, know, extra two ninety nine, an extra two ninety nine a month. Yes. No, I you, opted to do that because when I watch a movie, I don't want to see it interrupted. I just don't. So. Yeah. Now, yeah. how about this? The Deadpool three trailer dropped during the Super Bowl a while back, yeah. and this is the first Deadpool movie with Disney in charge. It was a Fox property before, and it was edgy. Same with Wolverine when they did Logan. Those were two R rated Marvel movies. Right. Very edgy. Marvel has a no tobacco policy they've announced. Iger made a statement back in 2015. There'll be no tobacco use in a Marvel or Star Wars project. Wolverine smokes cigars. Our, everyone's got high hopes. And I'm not knocking Disney. I like Disney. I'm not, But it'll be interesting to see if they walk back that decision and statement from Iger. Because Wolverine's well known to smoke cigars. And are they going to make this a PC Deadpool? Deadpool was popular because he was so wild and R-rated and adult yeah. and off the wall. He really was. The trailer looks good. I yeah, mean, this remains to be seen. It does. So that's what trailers are supposed to do. But have you seen the trailer? Al, you've been to a lot of movies lately, so I saw it. I saw it uh, the other day. Now, now I know you're not a big Marvel. No, I'm not a huge that's Marvel fine. fan. That's that, fine. That, you know. But you like Deadpool, though, did you? Did, it did was not? okay. And I, I like, you know, some you of like the Marvel Logan? movies. Huh? I like you Captain like America. Logan a lot. Yeah, Al, you did. like Logan a lot. That was I tragic. Yeah. When they killed that family, that black family, I, was, I didn't like that. I really didn't like that in that movie. That was awful. Can I mention a movie I went and saw the, the other day? No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, I no, went don't saw, mention that one. I went and saw Argyle. Only, only if you promise not to tell everybody. <laughs> Argyle. It's Al speaking now. Argyle is a, is is, is it's a very different movie. It's it's about a lady. Cool, she fun. she writes novels and she she's written a novel called Argyle and she has a cat. You know, it's Argyle. It's a, it, but it's a spy thriller. And what happens throughout the movie? She writes this novel about a spy thriller, and she actually becomes a part of the story, mm -hmm. and the in the movie evolves into the book she's written. It opens up and she's having a book signing party. And they're asking her questions about this book called Argyle. And so uh, she writes the story and then the movie evolves with her in the story. She she becomes a spy herself. I just thought but, it. but it's great. It's, it's great. You know, um, Matthew Vaughn directed it. He directed X-Men. He also directed The King's Man. The movie's The King's Man. And so, uh, and Brian Cranston, you know who Brian Cranston is, don't yeah, you? Yeah. Of course. Say my name. He's yeah. uh, he's the villain in it, and he is wonderful. He makes that movie. I mean, he is just so good in this movie. Samuel L. Jackson is in it. He's yeah, he great. never heard of him. Gump, he? Huh? No, what? Just, I said, yeah, he played Forrest Gump, didn't he? No, I'm just kidding. No, you're crazy. Kidding. But you're funny. Samuel who, Al? Samuel, never Samuel heard of him. L. Jackson. Who, who's that? Sam he, he never, he's never in the movies. I've never never heard of him, never seen him. Oh, shut up. You know who he is. Overexposed, but a great talent. No, yeah. he's he's not actually he's not in it very much. He's he's only in it towards the end of the movie. Uh, but he's he's you know, his part is really good. But Brian Cranston carries that Spoiler movie. He is just so one. good. What? What? Spoiler alert number one. He just What's said number Samuel one? Samuel L. Jackson is at the end of the movie. Well, he's about Maybe an hour and a half into it. The movie's a little long. It's two hours and 19 minutes. Ooh, is it? But in the end credit starts to roll, and then it has a scene. There's going to be a sequel. And you see this building that's got the King's Man on it. Oh. And so Matthew Vaughn is going to do another King's Man movie, and they have a little scene from that. Well, and as it, long as it's not as bad as the Kingsman with Elton John. The I one with Elton John was horrible. But the others were, you know, but uh, he's going to do another one. Well, let me ask you a question. I know you went and saw it the other day, and you got a large popcorn bucket, 
Yes. And you got a large drink. Yes. How are you able to make it through a whole two-hour movie? without? Because I didn't drink all of the drink and I didn't eat all of the popcorn. But, you know. No, you had a little bottle next to you that you went in. Yes. I did. You, you, you know, and the thing about it is, I had the whole theater to myself. I yeah. went to one thirty show and I had the whole theater to myself. But anyway, did you talk to the screen? He's right behind you. I don't do that. But see, I had a gift card for Christmas, and the bucket, you know, the big AMC bucket's twenty two dollars. So I got, I didn't have to pay for that, and then I got a free large drink with it. Did, and so did that, they have any? Did they have any of the Ghostbusters stuff there yet? Uh, I didn't see any. No. Okay. They had a poster up for it. But several Ow. drink carriers are, are rather popcorn uh, things uh, for Ghostbusters. It looks pretty cool. Well, but think about when you get the bucket, when you leave, they'll fill it back up for free. Yeah. Al, yeah. you got to say your line. One of your many lines, along with I didn't care for that, is I'm an a a a a What? You say I'm an A-list member. An A-list member. I right. this member. It pays for itself. DC. Oh, Guy Ritchie's got a movie coming out. It's a good Nazi movie. I saw a trailer for that. What's it called? Uh, I like good, a good Nazi. What the hell I are you like talking about? I like good Nazi movies. Where Nazis Let me see. Hurt. I like Guy Ritchie's movies. Um, I like his movies he directs. Let's see. Uh, also, there's also a new Quiet Place movie coming out. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I, 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 what what more can they do with that plot? I mean, that they haven't already done. Um, I mean, I mean, the last <clears> one was <throat> a good movie, but what more yeah. can they do with it? And There's I, also a new uh, Mad Max movie coming out called Ferosa. Uh, really? Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. I don't care to see that. No, I'm so tired of those movies. And Ghostbuster: Frozen Empire. It, I don't care to see that. The they last had a new one was good, but I'm getting tired of that. I'm tired of these franchises like Jurassic World, Jurassic Park, Planet of the Apes. They had a new uh, trailer for uh, Fall Guy. And let's oh, see. I need here. to see that. It'll be on yeah, YouTube. The, Sorry. And then Monkey Man, Jordan Peele's new movie called Monkey Man. I remember, uh, uh, as Merle well said, oh, a whole theater to yourself. How fun. And it's, and it's great. When I used to work at Carmike, um, that's the theater I went to, your old theater. Yes. Uh, I had a print of a Dean Martin movie that Al owned at the time. What was that movie called? It had uh, uh, oh, it was a Technicolor print. Yeah, yeah. Dean, Dean Martin and um, oh, she's one of the uh, Rat Pack uh, honorary Rat Pack mirror. Not I Joey think. Bishop, was it? No, it was a female. Sammy Davis. Oh, was Joey Heatherton? No, not no. Not. She was not honorary. It was uh, she's still alive. Uh, she did that movie with. Um, Nancy Sinatra, uh, I don't know. Ni no, Nicholas Cage. Angie Dickinson? Was she play no, she played the uh Anne Margaret. Mother no, nope, the mother of uh of the president, and he was assigned to guard her, Nicholas Cage. I can't think of her name. She wrote the book. Um it'll come to me. Anyway, she was in it, she was a co star in the movie. I remember I put that together on the platter. And I was going to go out and watch it. For a 35-millimeter film, for those that don't know. 30, it was yeah. on a platter, yeah. a huge and, round disc thing. Right. Yes. And I put that sucker together, and I started running it. And I thought I had the theater to myself. I used one of the smaller theaters. And uh, started running it. And, and I got busy doing something else. And it was probably real number two or something into it. I, when I finally got down to the theater. I walked into the theater and stood there and watched I got ready to go sit down. There was two old ladies back in the back sitting there watching the movie. I, I apologized. That, I said, "I said I'm sorry," because <laughs> I didn't obviously didn't run the movie that I was supposed to be running because we'd already long past the time that that movie was supposed to start. And they said, "Oh no, we're enjoying it. No, keep it going." I went, "Okay." I mean, uh, anyway, anyway, it reminded me of uh, when I did that. So I remember when you uh, did that. I. Um... I mean, we could do that back in the day with film. You can't do that today because of digital. No, you, no, you can't. No, can't do you that. Can't. I still got a print. Of, I still got a print of thirty-five millimeter print of the Saint with Val Kilmer in scope, uh, which I've yet to uh, see a projector. Am I the only watcher? No, you're not the only watcher. There's more. I see a lot more that are 
combining Twitter, well, Twitch, YouTube, bro. Esmeralda streaming. said uh, Mad Max needed Tina Turner. That's true. God I rest love, her soul. I love, love Beyond Thunderdome. That was one of my favorite. You know, a lot of people didn't like it, but I liked it. Beyond Thunderdome. Well, 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 what I'm seeing, what I'm seeing uh, them do with AI that could easily bring her back in that way, but uh, you know, whether they will or not, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, that, What's that's what got to do with strike, it. That's what the strike was all about, and all that uh, property. You, you, who owns your your face? Your, likeness, your, your image, look, yeah. Your, yeah, your look. Here, let me show you more uh, monsters really quick. We're almost done with these. Um, there's one. I like that one with the harp and Lily. Yep. That's from April 10th, 67, long after the show was off the air. And then there's 13. Was there a name for their house? It was a trivia question asked. What was the name of the Munster's house? Well, we know it was on Mockingbird Lane. 13, 13, Mockingbird. 13, 13. But was there a name for the house? I don't recall there being a name for the house. There's not. That was that was the answer. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the 14th issue, a reprint of the second cover. The 15th was a reprint of the fourth cover. That's from November 10th. So the show was off the air. They're starting to get cheap here. Dell, uh, Gold Key Comics, rather. And then there is the last issue with the new cover from January 31st, 1968. Anyway, I'm not going to rehash. Anyone who's here earlier has already seen these covers. I just put some up for your benefit. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you just one Bewitch cover because you love this too, Tom. I know. The effing song. Yeah. There's Samantha as... Serena, you, you gotta wonder. You gotta wonder what happened to that guitar. When you see, when you see some of the props, the cars or whatever, and you go, "What happened to that? Where, where's that at today?" And it's probably either in someone's personal collection or prop storage out in Hollywood somewhere. Well, movie studios just—they didn't keep stuff around. They just got rid of it. Yeah. After you know, after after the they finished with it, they really didn't hang on to it. Or they repurposed stuff. it, like we talked about earlier. Well, you know, um, MGM MGM had a big auction years and years ago. They sold off a bunch of their yeah, props. Yeah, the 70s. A Life Magazine did a, a yeah a thing, a big spread, photo spread. That's where they sold first sold the original uh, uh, Time Machine. I remember uh, Rod Taylor, 1960. Yeah, that, they also <laughs> sold, sold sold the chariot that Charlton Heston used in Ben Hur. Yeah, and Debbie Reynolds bought a lot of the uh, you know the actress Debbie Reynolds. Bought a lot of, uh, uh, of costumes and, mm-hmm. and stuff that she had in, in her little museum, um, you know, before even before she passed. So I don't I don't know, what, she had a, she, they did a story on her one time. They had a story on Debbie Reynolds and her the stuff she collected. I wonder what happened to all that. Uh, you know, that's a good question. I I want to say they had an auction of mm-hmm. her stuff too, and whether I mean she had one of what three or four pairs. Of ruby slippers that Judy Garland had, that MGM had, whether it was uh, screen worn, I don't recall. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I know that uh, she had a pair of those, and uh, I, I don't know where her her collection went to. One person, or just uh, scattered to the wind. I mean, who knows? I mean, I mean, who knows uh, where it would go to, or where something like that would go to. Um, think, think about, think about Liberace. Did you ever? No, you never. You've never been to Las Vegas, right? No, no. I've been through oh. Las Vegas. Never spent any time there. Well, in Las Vegas, once upon a time, there was a Liberace museum. It was off the strip. It was on a cheap strip mall, mm-hmm. you know, and it wasn't very elaborate. But the front of the museum was, and walked in. It was Liberace all the way. How his outfits. Had a bunch of pianos. I mean, it was a nicely done museum, and you gotta wonder where is all that stuff because that museum is is closed as well. Well, his uh, his estate there in Las Vegas. They there's a story I saw it on YouTube. They did a video. His estate where he lived. It's it's basically in ruins now. It's not it's not kept up. No, no, it, it, it's been restored. It has been restored. Yeah, I well, agree. I saw it. Well, they they went into his bedroom and stuff, and the paint Correct. was peeling off. Yeah. You know, it was it was in terrible condition. Yeah, yeah, it was. But but somebody bought that. And, and oh, okay. Is restoring it or has restored it? Uh, I remember seeing an update. Mm-hmm. On that, so yeah, that's ago. I think it's on YouTube. I think you can find it. And, and you know, it his his house in Vegas was not. 
It was that, nothing special. It was nice, but it wasn't nothing yeah, special. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know, you know how expensive houses are out there. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, they they just opened a new uh, about twenty some miles from the strip. Uh, a new house out there is in the four hundred four hundreds. You know, base base house, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of money. Uh, but then again, with, with today's uh, pay and whatnot, maybe it's maybe, maybe it's the new, not what you pay for your house, of course. But uh, no, you know, uh, that's the new. Now have they have they uh, rented out the house next door to you yet? What have they rented out the house next door to yours yet? No, no, they yeah. they want a lot of but, money for it. The but, rent. but yeah, but anyway, I mean, I mean, houses in, in general are are have gotten real expensive. It's not a good buyer's market for. Well, that's people. why younger people today they they can't afford to come up with a down payment because houses are so expensive. Well, they North, they, North, they North, just North, rent, and he makes more money than I do, and uh, he doesn't want to pay that kind of money. For, oh, dropped off the phone. <laughs> you, what happened? Oh, you dropped your phone. I, I did. I did. I dropped the phone. I'm sorry. Uh, no, millennials. Millennials don't want to buy. They just soon rent. You know. Who knows what that looks like? Uh, my my phone, by the way, is in low power mode now. So. Uh, well, plug it up. Well, I have no where to plug. Oh, chances, Mac. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, I had to take care of something. My my little I, pet bunny was raising heck in the other room. Oh, so I well, I hope your pet bunny is okay. She's all right. Now is, that, now, is that a big bunny or is that a little one? Little, little. Not a dwarf. They're actually are dwarf rabbits, but nobody cares. She's she's average size. She's a European cottontail. Gotcha. And uh, she makes noise when she wants more food. So I just took care of that. Um, <laughs> Let me... Uh, look, there's a lot of comments. I was going to ask you, Al, do you still have that uh, comic? I gave you a gold key uh, Dark Shadows comic book. I do. Do you still want it? I'm you, want kidding. Go, was, you, you want me to go get it and show it to no, you? No, I don't. Yeah, go, go, yeah, go get it. Hold it. Uh, that'd be perfect. All right, hold on. I'll be back. And I don't want it back. I'm not being an Indian giver, but while you're doing that, I'll show I'll Tom some. These are new to people that have been with us all along. <laughs> Land of the Giants. I know I showed this right when Dan's uh, power gave out in his laptop. There is issue one from November 10th, 1968. And I love the shots of the cast on the side. Those are publicity shots. Yeah. And That's I think they're nice. pretty neat. What's that? Those are nice. Those are very nice. Guys, yes. used to watch that show back when it had its network run. Um, I remember it was on ABC. Yes, it was. It started, this is interesting, Tom, in 1968, fall of 68, but they began production in 67. They actually had three seasons. It's listed as having two seasons, which it did on air, but production wise, three seasons. They shot 13 episodes in 1967 during the final season of voyage which is season four of that show and the final season of lost in space season three of lost in space now, now which which episodes do you have in film i have I a mean, pilot mint yeah, i have yeah, a mint pilot. color pilot yeah, directed by erwin it. allen we, we with john that. williams music and in syndication right now is the was it johnny version. williams or john williams it, by then it was john i think he's okay. credited as john okay. and i have that on film we watched it together at al's years ago yes we did perfect color i remember uh, and I have one called Collector's Item from season two that I love. It's about this, like, mobster. It's not really said that he's in the mob, but he says, I killed a whole family for that item. He collects things from all over the world of the Giants world, and he's a despicable guy in a wheelchair. And ah. his nephew is played by Dean Stockwell, and it's, like, the guy in the wheelchair's birthday, and that's his nephew. And the nephew wants to blow him up to inherit some money or something. It's just, it was terrible. And so he captures one of the little people played by Deanna Lund, the redhead, to go in a music box in a cage, and he rigs it with a bomb. So that while he's looking at the little girl, she's dressed as a little uh, uh, ballerina, and he, whoever opens the cage gets blown up. So anyway, I, it's just a, it's a, I'll have to bring that over. So that one doesn't have great color, though. It's from a 1982, at least the airing is from a TV station. It, it had listed on the uh, tape I'm back. the last time it aired, which was back in 1982. But my, the, I love the pilot because it has John Wayne's music. My, finish my point. The one that MeTV airs, Tom, yeah. does not have the John Wayne's music. The unaired version had uh, Alexander Courage, who scored the Star Trek theme. And it's not as good a music. Oh, look at that. Dark Shadows. Thank, let me make you big, buddy. Hang on. I'm making you big. There it is. And that's a Whitman. Yeah. So that is from the uh, multi-packs we talked about earlier, the three-pack. 
Very cool. It's cool. That's the one I gave you. I guess I thought I gave you a gold key. That only gave you one. Well, I'll show you what you gave me. You gave me this one. <clears throat> First John Byrne. Yeah. Yeah. And hey, they've announced the cast of the new Fantastic Four movie. I'm happy with half of them. I I don't know. The the jury will be out. I'll try to maintain uh, All right. an open <clears throat> And you gave me this one? Yes, Silver Age Hulk. Yep. Aren't I a good friend? How many of how many of them have you read, Al? How None. many have you read? None. Al, did you hear what Tom's asking you? How many have you uh, read? I don't know. Now, now, to be fair, I gave Tom some key Thor books from the 60s, including the first high evolutionary issue, yeah, Thor 134. Like seven, seven of them, I think. Did you sell them yet? No, no. <laughs> Good, well, thank I, said, God. I don't know. If you, if you want them back. I, no, I, could, I do not. I'm not needing to get I'm only teasing. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you, buddy. But I appreciate the offer. I would not do that. that that's, that's so uncouth to do that i would not now that's a hang on to that wolverine one 1988 first print uh that's patch i think patch may come to play in deadpool 3 so that is about to go up big time in value and that's what you gave me i have like i think 20 copies of that wolverine one currently well, that's cool. why you gave it to me there <laughs> well and it's a it's a book that i know has legs where you'll mm -hmm. be able to make some money let me put tom back on the screen and uh you're gonna bring you. you're gonna bring some more over here yeah, and are you going to put any of those back on the wall? Or do you, have you already put too much stuff on the wall? No, I can put them back. I can put them back. All right. Um, 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 um. So I was showing Al, if you want to look at the screen. I don't want to hate to cover up Tom's face. I just, What's I was showing Land of the Giants comics. Look at that, Al. Issue oh, one. Yeah. Issue two. I'll go through this quickly. That's from uh, January 10th, 69. The show was still on the air. There's the third issue from No Place uh, to Hide. Yeah, from February 28th, 69. Season one was airing. And June 10th, 69, issue four. August 31st, 69, season two was about to start on ABC. And that's the final issue. There's five issues of the Land of the Giants. Look at the little tiny camera, guys, yeah. at the bottom. I'm mean, actually a big camera. What am I saying? I got it backwards. Yeah, I, I knew what you meant. Giant prop camera. Now you gotta wonder. You gotta wonder how many how many shots in that show was done with just forced perspective, uh, where they, they didn't want to make everything big and make but make them look small. You use a different lens on your uh, on your film camera, and then you force perspective to make make everything look big or small. And you gotta wonder how many of those shots were done that way to save money. Was it was that wasn't that Irwin Allen? Yes, he directed mm -hmm. the pilot only, but it, he was the executive producer, King of Cheap, and he would shoot in season one particularly a lot of cameras from the ground up to make the yeah. giants look massive, like well, little camera tricks. By, that's what I mean by force perspective. And talk so. about what Al's point about how they would share props on different shows. Land of the Giants started production in summer of '67, right? All of a sudden, mm -hmm. on Idrew Magini, you had a story where Darren is shrunken down; he's terrorized by the cat. I drew a genie would be in front of a giant telephone. She'd shrink herself down. They used a lot of props from Land of the Giants, even though those were uh, screen gem shows. Mm -hmm. And Giants was a 20th Century Fox show, competing studio. They would share mm -hmm. props. So anyway, to your point, Al. Yeah. The Land of the Giants, I was going to say, uh, I already finished my point that it's kind of interesting that on MeTV, they're running the unaired pilot, which the unaired pilot has additional scenes with the cast that flesh out the characters, more so than the one I have on film, the aired version of the first episode of Land of the Giants. Anyway. Well, did the series Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea share a lot of stuff with other shows? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. All, yeah. yeah, all are renowned shows. That, yeah. yeah. The Merman Life Monsters, Monsters the sea monsters that were re reoccurring monsters on Voyage showed up in the end of season one of Lost in Space in black and white. Mm -hmm. um, in a change of space. You had all sorts of examples. I could go on and on and on. I mean, but yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> you know, you know, in Voice to the Bottom of the Sea, the big board they have with the little square lights flashing. You see <laughs> yeah. that in, in other Erin Al Allen shows. Yeah. 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 Yes, you do. The lead paint was peeling, says Facebook user. 
what Carrie that Fisher got the shoes. I don't know. I got to see what reference that. What did I? Say? Oh, here we well, go. Well, there, there were. Oh, he's talking about the ruby slippers. Old. Everyone made a huge deal about the ruby slippers in the Wizard of Oz. Yeah. Well, they they had three pair of those. I think. Yeah, I think I they had three pair. Yeah. I should have uh, pulled an image from uh, Wicked, which they played a trailer of during the Super Bowl. The poster looks awful. It just doesn't look very creative. No, no, I'm, I'm not going to say anything <laughs> objectionable. Well, sometimes, um, sometimes, sometimes the plays don't translate well to film. Now, I think, personally, Phantom of the Opera translate pretty good. I, I, and I've seen Phantom of the Opera at least eight times. And I enjoyed the movie. I, I would watch it today. It was, yeah. it was well done, I thought. Uh, well, but, but some plays probably would not or, or have not uh, translated, uh, you know, as, as well, you know? Here's an old comic, Mesmerella, talking about your story, Tom, about you running the wrong reel at the movie theater. <laughs> I was good, she says, I saw two older ladies walk out of an Alice Cooper concert because they obviously did not know who they were. You might have thought it was Alice in Wonderland. Listen, listen, uh, me and Monty Johnson went and saw a play, excuse me, a play, listen to me, a show in Las Vegas. And it was one of those uh, Cirque shows. And it was one of those body sh Cirque shows. And Zoomanity, to be exact, I think that's what it's called. And people were walking, so, listen, uh, people were walking out of that show left and right because it was, you know, you, <laughs> you thought you were going to a Cirque show. You didn't go, you were going to a naughty one. So, anyway. Danny then, says, I'm listening while I eat. I'm going to go into uh, Thrash Pondo Pond's time because I still have so much to cover. And he starts at 7.30 at 6.41 as we're live. I don't, didn't intend to do this. I hate to go against someone I like to watch myself. I'll, I'll but try didn't you to. start at 2.30? Yeah. And I've gone four hours, ten minutes. I just, because but, uh, too much fun. Fun's we're having off. fun. I don't mind. How, I'm, I'm having a good many, time. How many of the Dark Shadows DVDs have you watched? Because... Uh, there's so many of Because usually when you get the DVDs, and I'm guilty of it too, um, whether it's Al or, or Chance, you may have the DVDs, but something about watching them on TV <laughs> without having to get up and put the DVD in the DVD player, there's something to be said about that. And, and how many of those have you actually watched? I mean, because... I well, could, uh, you know, most of the DVDs have maybe two or three shows on each disc. Yes, they do. Yes, All you got to do is use the remote and start the next show. Well, yes, it's true. It's true. I even had a laser disc player that will play both sides. Um, you know, um, she, so she's watched all of them. And I love it. Good, good. That's um, good. But Wicked, my point was just, if you look at the poster they released, the poster now. It yeah. looks like a catalog cover of a toy ad. It looks like toys. It's not dynamic. It's not. It doesn't capture your imagination. For something as big as the Wizard of Oz and Wicked in the play, you just think there'd be more creativity in that initial poster. That's yeah. all I had to say about that. Anyway, you, you would think so, but but it, it, is it a teaser poster or is it? It's a teaser, but um, oh. even the trailer, I, just and some images they've had of the two leads, it just. There's no background. There's no interesting. It looks like they're sitting like in someone's house. It just doesn't mm -hmm. look appealing. Just, just my opinion. Just yeah. my opinion. Hey, I Chance, I like got, could... I got some more Fall Guy posters. Really? Yeah, I hadn't even opened them up. I guess I don't, I don't know what they are. They could be the same, or they could be new ones. So there's a new trailer and a new poster. Okay, I got to trade you something. I want you've already traded me the teaser poster and the big Marvel's canvas, right? And the Twilight Zone Twilight 1983 Zone. movie poster. I need to get that new Fall Guy poster because I have every episode of the Fall Guy in 16 millimeter film on these shelves. Uh, 110 reels. 110. Well, actually, you know, the trailer doesn't look so bad. You know, it it, it looks like it could be fun. I don't see anything uh, that's. Yeah. Again, the casting. I don't know. Maybe now, Gosling, see, now you can't you can't compare it to the TV show. Now it's going to be different from what the TV show was. I can compare it, but I I, I will. Try. You can compare it, but it's not going to work. Is it, is it going to have a, is it going to have a cameo from Lee Major? Yes, it's already been filmed. I know that it's confirmed. Okay. And I, he's not in the Australia. trailer though. He's not in the trailer though. Good. They 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 keep it as a surprise for those that don't know. But it was filmed in Australia last year. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, but he looks nothing like he he looks nothing like he did in the Fall Guy, though. Of course not. Got, we all age. Well, that's true, but uh, but I Ryan don't. Gosling is soft. He's a soft kind of guy. I mean, Lee Majors is a hard actor. Uh, I mean, he's a he's an action star. Ryan Gosling is not. But the director's good. I like Bullet Train, and the director was a real stuntman. So yeah, but you can't you can't judge a you, you can't judge it just by the trailer. You have to see the movie. The first yeah, trailer well. looked a little odd. Well, the trailers are meant to make you want to go see the movie, so. Yeah. You know. Oh, Terrell Hopefully. says about Dark Shadows. Do one of you fellas want to read that? Wasn't well, Dark Shadows the only daytime soap opera to be syndicated in reruns decades after? Yes, I, th I believe. After its original run. I remember coming home from school. I used to rush home from school yeah. just to watch it. I watch it. Because it came on at 4 o'clock yes. on ABC. Yeah. 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 And that's about before the days where they had uh, uh, videotape, or you can tape it and watch it later. You know, it was so campy. Uh, and his teeth almost fall out when he tried. Esmeralda says Dark Shadows was bite. so campy, and his teeth would almost fall out when he tried to bite someone, and the sets would almost fall when they opened doors. Sometimes, yeah. Well, they did. They did two. Office. They did two feature movies of Dark Shadows. The first one was the best. It was called Nine of Dark you Shadows, know, I believe. You, know, you, have, you know, uh, as well, if you, it's just Dark Shadows is stolen today, forget where. If you have a Roku or, or a Google Fire Stick or whatever, Amazon Fire Stick, just type in search and, and it will tell you what channels, whether it's 2B, whether it's Freebie, or whoever has. Uh, well, the old Decades series. channel used to run Dark Shadows. Well, I don't think there is a Decades channel. There's not no, it's just catchy it's comedy catchy now. TV. But they used to run Dark Shadows. Yeah. Catchy comedy. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm one of the few people that liked the Dark Shadows movie with uh, that, that uh, uh, Johnny Depp played uh, uh, Dracula. And, and, and I liked it, yeah. I liked it. I, I, I enjoyed it. Especially when they dug him up and he saw the McDonald's sign. I thought that was as funny as crap. You know, Johnny Depp's sister is an actress, too. Oh really? Yeah, she was. I, there was a movie I watched last night on Netflix called The King, and it's got uh, Timothy Chalamet who was Wonka. He was also uh, Robert Pattinson's in it, and uh, Johnny Depp's uh, uh, sisters in it. Well, hopefully she's a better actress than. Uh, she kind of looks like him a little bit. Yeah, she was pretty good. Yeah, I liked right. her. Hopefully Can she's I... better, better yeah. than what's his face. The guy who did the monsters. Uh, the movie. Rob Here Zombie. Zombie. Hopefully he's better than uh, Zombie's wife's actor. The, the, the Rob Zombie uh, monster oh. was awful. Awful. Well, awful. Had, no, wait a minute. It had some good parts. No, it didn't. It, it was, was terrible. His 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 wife was in it. And she was awful. Well, she no, was just terrible. I, I don't debate that. I don't debate that. Yeah. I don't debate that. A big but, thumbs uh, down. Danny who played uh, Danny who played Grandpa did a very good job in what he Robot. was supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. I about him earlier. Well, he, he was doesn't... probably the. You know, he he was be... probably the best, but yeah, the rest of the movie stuff. Yeah, he was. And Catherine <laughs> Shell played his ex-wife, but uh, he used to be very heavy. Daniel Roebuck. And um, if you watch Matlock, which I have all on DVD, I haven't opened them yet. Look at that, all eight yeah. seasons. There he is really? on the back. Here, let me make myself big. Yeah. You'll you'll never huge. you'll never watch all of those. Yeah, well, chance you'll never watch all of them. He used to be huge. He he was in every season of Matlock as different characters, but he was a big. Big guy, he lost a yeah. ton of weight. But but he, he he's put it back on. He, he's big guy. He, he's 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 big. Yeah, Chance will never watch all I of those. About this he was in the Fugitive movie. There he is next oh, to Andy. Drop the phone again. Oh, <laughs> see Tom. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, there he is. There he is on my DVDs of Matlock. All nine seasons. I said eight. Nine. Wow. Oh jeez. We've lost chance, ladies and gentlemen. No, no, no. Let me let me let me get the solo layout off of here. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you turned your TV on finally, by the way. TV? Your TV behind you. That's oh, yeah, I it, well, it, I had it on and it turned itself off. It was the darndest thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna have a Mr. Goodbar. All right. Um Oh, I love uh, Mr. Goodbars. May I have one? Virtually, yeah. Oh this is a little I want mini. A big one. I have a bigger one. Uh, that's what she said in the fridge. Yeah, but I, I agree with you, Esmeralda. Rob, Rob Zombie. He may make great music, but uh, 
he doesn't he shouldn't be allowed to make movies. <laughs> you know, he used to host uh, TCM Underground back when they first started doing that. Uh, but Rob and he Zombie, might have been good. And he he, been good. okay, at it for, for some reason they didn't keep him very long. At, yeah, uh, wonder. What did what you think did... of the Halloween movies by Rob Zombie from like 2009? Those were interesting. They, he yeah. remade the one in the hospital, Halloween Two. Anyway, yay yeah. or nay? Did you watch them? Al, Al, did you no. watch them? You watch no. everything. Okay, mm -hmm. I never saw those. Tom, oh, no, Rob I, Zombie I, Halloween. I, no, I can honestly say I, did, I didn't watch them either. I did. Okay. Um, no, I did not. He, uh, I watched, he was on a uh, podcast with Joe Rogan. Rob Zombie was, he's really kind of an interesting character. Uh, he was, he was very entertaining and I love hearing him talk. Uh, so, uh, but if you get a chance, I mean, go back and look at, uh, some of Joe Rogan's old shows he's on there, but he, he was really very in interesting guy. You know what, you know what, uh, another side note, this is I'm going well off topic here. Uh, I'm real low on my battery. I'm going to have to uh, go and service to get my battery charger. But anyway, totally off the beaten path I'm going here now. Uh, Mike Douglas show. Al, I know you know who Mike oh, Douglas is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We used to run it at the Channel 6. A variety talk show, syndicated. He would do something really interesting that nobody else was doing at the time. He would have stars be his co-hosts for a week. And it was great. No, oh, yeah. He, he Johnny had, Carson did that too. Yeah. Did Carson do that too? Um, yeah. He had I, like I, bo not huge stars, but like Burke Convy would yeah. be a fill-in host. Of course, everyone knows Joe well, Rivers. Well, what but, I meant, what I meant was the co-host. I mean, Mike Douglas was still there, but his sidekick would become a star. Oh, like that. I never like watched that. Okay. Like there's one with Liberace, and there's oh, one wow. with uh, 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 John Lennon and Yoko was was on his show. They're, they're great to go back and watch on YouTube. Uh, because Who was a Batman villain? Liberace was, believe it or not, for those that don't yes, know. Yes, he was. Chantel. <laughs> yeah. I, I had I had a uh, I had a beautiful print of, of one of the shows, and I also had one that was also a beautiful print, but was in Spanish. The whole the whole stupid show was in Spanish. I should have kept that one. I probably you should have kept it. it. I kept yeah. that. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yeah, Shandell, yeah. Anyway. Uh, I see this comment from Terrell. You met Lily Rose Depth. Which, which is actually is Johnny's actually daughter, not Oh, oh okay. I, yeah, yeah, I stand corrected then. That's, that's right. You uh, said right, correct. Terrell, yeah, yeah. you call in, you take out splice. <laughs> <laughs> um, before you go, I know you're losing power. I'm going to show you just three more gold key covers. Here's one I had signed by Julie Summers. I've talked about it before, but what a strange choice for a comic book it series. Is. That was an adult sitcom. Why would anyone at gold key think kids would buy that comic? Book? And, and it didn't even last very long at all. I mean, what, the, the show last, or the comic? Or the really, show. No, it, it, all in the family knocked it off the air. Basically. Yeah. Um, it, it did well in the first year, had a fir full season. The first year, the second season was canceled midway through. Yeah. Because of all in the family, but I like Julie Summers. I didn't really care for the show, but I liked her, the redhead you see there. There's the second issue, which is a rare one from my collection. And then she also signed the third issue right there wow. for me last summer. Now, and now did, did what a she nice ask lady. you where you found those? Or, or she said, hey, I know you have those. I sent her a letter and I said, keep one, sign one, please send me one. And I put cash in there. And I don't know if she'd want this out there, but she returned the cash and sent me both books back last summer. Isn't that nice? I mean, unbelievable. Um, she returned the money, and she got me both. And I have um, other copies unsigned. Like, you can see the condition was not great on the ones, because I wasn't sure if the address was real. I just found the address yeah. through a friend, and I wasn't sure. So I'm like, I don't want to mail. See, here's another one she did not sign that's in better condition. So I sent the two copies that were not in as nice a shape for her to sign. Yeah. This one, but look at the nice message. I don't put this on the internet because I don't want it scanned. I will show it on the show. Hello, Chance. Love Julie Summers. Of course, she's been happily married since 1984. She has nice uh, handwriting. She's, she's yeah, she does, and I love her voice too. And she was on Matlock as well, and uh, a lot of Quinn Martin shows back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And she was in the very first uh, Rockford Files in 1974, and the but first he, that same year she was in two first episodes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I you're right, Sarah. It's, it's almost seven o'clock. <laughs> Does she she have a, 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 a four o'clock her time. Voice now? What? Say what? 
Does she's she still have- I don't know. She she's been retired <laughs> from acting since 1994. She they have a nice life apparently. I don't know. Listen to me. I don't know why I just said that, but I don't think she needs to work. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, probably. anymore. But she quit. She was the last thing she did was a Matlock. They brought her back because the show left California to North Carolina because of well, Andy how, Griffin. Wait, wait, wait. wait and so she didn't want to move from California. What I read online, Julie Summers did not want to leave her boys, her family, and her home in California and uh, commute to North Carolina. So she quit the show. And they brought her back, and she did travel to North Carolina to make one final appearance well, in season nine. And well, that's the last were- time she acted. Huh? The original Marilyn from the Munsters <coughs> didn't want to do any more Munsters because my boyfriend lives in New York. So that's you've told that on the show. We did a great yeah. show, you and I and Al, about yeah. the Munsters and the Adams family way back in Podblast episode five. And now, Tur- that Tur- mm-hmm. the Governor of JJ was one of the many shows that fell victim to the infamous rural purge. I don't I... remember it being a rule. Show, but then again, I I, I can't honestly say because I don't. No, want... I think his point is, but yes, it wasn't. But like other shows that were not rural were taken out, like Hogan's Heroes. It was still doing well. Like it My was. Three Sons, My Three Sons at the end of the uh, 71, 72 season. Those weren't rural shows, but it was part of the cleaning of the slate by CBS. Yeah, these were all but, CBS shows that got. But but it was kind of weird seeing Commodore Clink show up on Batman. As one oh of yeah, people. in the window cameo. <laughs> in the window. window. Well, wasn't wasn't CBS considered the highbrow network? Yeah, the you Tiffany, know, Tiffany Network. The Tiffany Network. They were they were the uh, you know the poo poo network over yeah. ABC and NBC. Yeah, and ABC was kind of like the bottom of the barrel stuff. Yeah. No, did you say ABC or NBC? A- ABC. ABC. Uh, wait a minute, Al. You're contradicting but, yourself. You once told said on this show many times ABC had the best shows. They did. Like. They did, but not to the executives. I mean, but a- CBS was the Tiffany Network. Okay. Well, you were alive yeah. then, so I'm not going to argue with you. You would. Yeah. Know. Interesting. I mean, I used to watch. You know, I I watched The Fugitive all the time. I watched Twelve O'Clock High on Outer ABC. Limits. Outer Limits. For, well, Outer Limits was CBS, wasn't it? No. ABC. No, it was ABC. Okay, okay. And then Adam's um, Family, ABC. Adam's, yeah, Adam's Family. Bewitched, ABC. Come on now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I could go on and on, but I won't. <laughs> I did, I did, you know, NBC had the peacock, but I did like the CBS color logo before the, uh, you know, ding, CBS presents the following program in color. I used we, to love it. We love featured that. here on the pod blast. Uh, we yeah. pulled the audio and from yeah, we did. something I had, and yeah. 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 Yeah, that was I, I've, got, I've got a ringtone that has all those network sounds on it, um, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, executives often think more of their products than the public does, or vice versa. The public likes the product better, and the executives don't. And they'll can it because they don't like it, which I don't think they'll do that anymore. Um I, I find it hard to believe they would cancel the show today. It was real, although they canceled the uh, um, America's Got Talent or whatever that s- stupid show was that uh, the people. Yeah, American Idol is still yeah. on. Yeah. I don't know why. Fox it's on Fox. Canceled. It got picked up by Fox. No, no, yeah. no, no. Oh. It got picked up by ABC. Fox yeah. canceled it and ABC Fox picked it up. Fox canceled it and okay. ABC picked it up. So networks still do that. And, they, and they've been doing it. And that's a more recent example uh of them doing that so with great power comes great stupidity no i'm kidding yeah well that's instead of there's responsibility yeah. there's some truth to that you know oh man but all in the family did change the landscape and and um you know they fred silverman thought the public had moved on beyond the rural stuff uh and report he canceled shows that were doing well in the ratings after that like swat on abc yeah. That show was a good, the original SWAT, and it got canceled after a season and a half. It was a spinoff of The Rookies. But I digress. Yeah. But You're right. I have nothing against the man. And he actually produced shows. He was an executive producer mm-hmm. on Matlock and on um, Matlock and the, 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 He the Night, which was shot in Covington, Georgia, where we are uh-huh. in the state of Georgia, back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, he was behind his production company. So I have no, I'm not disrespecting the man. I'm just stating facts. Yeah. And thanks to Jim Gossett telling me, I didn't know he was the one responsible for killing all of those CBS shows. Yeah, I didn't know that until recently, till within the last year or so. 
Well, but you know, network television is not what it used to be. People just don't watch network TV like they used to no, because no. of streaming and, you know. I, I'm not saying there's not any good shows on network TV, but uh, um, Kate Jackson was on Dark Show. Yes, she yes. was. She was. And she was in The Rookies. Maybe. Oh, that's a great uh, comment from Jim's camera at dawn. Yeah, Kate Jackson was, she's a, was uh, from Alabama originally. I had a mom. Yep. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Ding, 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 ding. That is that is so true, Al. Like it says that. Esmeralda to Al Hardy. Yeah. Uh, You're probably out of power, aren't you? Yeah, Tom? I, I was going to say my phone's about to die, so I'm going to get off here. So um, let me go, and uh, I'll talk to you, Yahoo's, later. Well, are you we'll going to go to your car and charge your phone, or what are you going to do about your phone? You need power I'm, when you're I'm, live. I'm going to go downstairs and get my charger. My charger's downstairs. Ah. Well, get I'll your charger and bring it back up. Well, that's a, if you guys are still on, I might try my camera. Now, right. I don't understand who this is. Karen was my favorite angel. Who's Karen? I don't know. In, uh, in Dark Shadows? You talking about Charlie's Angels? I no, don't I'll know, because I don't know a Karen and Charlie's Angels. Well, Kate Jackson went on to to be on. She Charlie's was Sabrina. Angels. I know she was Sabrina. Explain yourself, sir. Da, Kate. Da, da, oh, he meant Kate. Kate. Da, yeah, oh, Kate, Kate Jackson. It's a typo. Yeah. Such a great show. Uh, all right, and Sarah says bye, Tom. Uh, bye, Chance. Uh, Are you leaving, Sarah? See you, Sarah. Well, I'm going to continue on because I got space giants to cover. Al, you're willing. I mean, you're willing. You're welcome to hang with me if you want, <laughs> if you're willing. Well, listen, um, I'll, I'll just go backstage. I've got to go get something to eat, and okay. I'll just stay backstage. Hey, I appreciate y'all coming on, and uh, I apologize for my my text. <laughs> I didn't mean it. Don't, I have a temper. I'm, All I'm right, okay. well, ha I'll be watching your weather channel, Tom. I'll be looking for you. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> Bye, yeah. everybody. All right. Later. All right. See you guys later. Bye. Oh, so I'll put you backstage, Al. Okay. But you, All it, right. it, that, that'll, it, that'll be fine. You can text me if you want to come back on. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I'll Text do that. me or just just wave at the camera, but I can okay. see you backstage. All right. Okay. Bye okay. for now. All right. Now the ugh, my ugly face. Bye, Terrell. I know it's been a long God. Over four. Thanks for your time and patience. Four and a half hours. Now I can talk about some other stuff and show some things. Uh, Governor and, J and JJ. That was in it started in 1969. I already showed these covers. I know. I won't go on and on about this show. It was a sitcom. It's on YouTube. It's very rarely seen anymore in broadcast television. But uh, there, there was the comic, and I don't know why they even published that. Now I want to talk about this comic book. Where is it? Ah, The Space Giants. I have some great video I'm going to share with you folks, those that are still with us, pertaining to The Space Giants. Some quick background. The Space Giants was a show produced in Japan, and it debuted on, of all days, July 4th, 1966. Ted Turner imported this show in the wake of the success of Star Wars and movie theaters. So he was airing all these shows that had to do with space, like Lost in Space, Star Trek Space 1999, when Al Hardy was at Turner. That's how he got these film prints and stuff. And this was dubbed into English in 1972. And actually, it was in syndication before Ted Turner picked it up. Here's the comic book version of it. But the... Let me just show you a nice little piece from a fellow fan that's six minutes long. That can take a much needed break to set the stage of what this show was. This is an awesome video. It would help if I switch to my uh, clips. Here we go. Ooh, um, I'm UGLY. I'm ugly. <laughs> Let me get this real quick. Um, this is it. This is a six minute video. Check this out for those. I know most of you've never heard of the Space Giants. Look at this. From the far reaches of outer space comes a threat to planet Earth. Mankind faces its most powerful enemy, the mastermind Rodak. The Space Giant. Steel yes, Rodak. Growing up, I was really unaware of Japanese TV shows. But around the age of seven, maybe eight, I find myself transformed into a world that I had real no understanding of. 
Thanks to a odd 305 time slot and a new network called TBS, I saw my first glance of a world not just outside of the southern U.S. The show I would learn years later was called Ambassador of Magna. But what I grew up on was a show that was dubbed over from its Japanese release and re-edited to a more American audience. What kids in Japan grew up on, I and many kids my age grew up on the same show but called Space Giant. The Space Giant. Goldar, a 50-foot robot, and his electronic space family are created to defend our world. This was my first TV show that I can remember as a kid that I fell in love with. It was a show for me. It wasn't something my parents watched or I was forced to watch along with them. It wasn't even something my brother was a fan of, so I became a fan of it also. This was my show, and thanks to the lead star of the show, a boy about my same age, it was a show that I felt was aimed for me. Over the years, I couldn't really recall much about this show. I didn't remember any of the storylines or any of the major episodes. But what stuck with me for years to come stayed with me from my childhood to my adulthood. The Evil Wardak was, as a kid, one of the most terrifying things on afternoon television. Even if his mouth didn't move, even as a kid I could tell this was a guy in a suit, he was pure evil. And it didn't help much that he looked like one of the worst evil teachers of my school. Along with Rordak to help him take over the world, what his ninja-like troopers called Lugu Men. These fighters for Rodak were turned into green slime when they died, leaving my young mind to wonder, were they people or just some kind of evil warrior created by Rordak? Rodak each week will unleash a monster on the city in hopes of taking it over, but thanks to a young boy hero named Miko, Rordak's plan never worked out. Miko was given a whistle by an old wizard who lived inside of a volcano. Blowing his whistle, he could summon the help of three transforming heroes. With just one blow, a young boy named Gam, who looked a lot like the hero of the show, would transform into a rocket and come to his aid. If he blew on the whistle two times, Gam's mother, Silvar, would transform into a rocket to come and help. And if times really, really got bad, the young boy would blow on the whistle three times to bring the father, Goldar, to help fight the evil scheme of Rodak. I called Goldar Gam. Now, I think there were some toys from this show released in Japan, but as a kid, I didn't see any in the U.S. And what I wanted more than anything in the world during this time was one of those rocket whistles. Still to this day, I would love to have one. This show quickly went out of my life as quickly as it came into it. Either I stopped watching it or it went off TBS not long after I fell in love with it. It seemed like I was only into this show for about a year. As I grew older, I almost forgot all about the show, other than the names and some small details. Throughout the 80s, I never saw anything about the show or even heard anyone talking about it. It wasn't until the late 90s, while I had a convention, I found an old VHS bootleg of the show. This homemade box, the cheap VHS tape, it was clear this was no official release and it recorded off TV back when it aired on TBS. I slammed down $20 for a chance to take home a show that I loved as a child and I was ready to love again. Once back home, after popping in the VHS into my VCR, I sat back and I quickly learned, you can't go back to your childhood. This show wasn't the show I had built up in my mind. It was not the greatest battle for freedom on television I thought it was. It was bad effects. It had a hard to follow storyline. It was cheesy. It was cheap. I never got why kids in the 90s loved the Power Rangers. But once I saw Space Giants as an adult, I understand why kids growing up in the 90s loved the Power Rangers as this show was kind of the Power Rangers of the 70s. Now I understand why kids like something that would look so cheesy and cheap like the Power Rangers. Watching this show as an adult, I can't get into it the way I did as a kid. I can still love it for the memories it gave me. But now I can see the faults that I didn't see as a kid. But this show wasn't aimed for the adult me. It wasn't aimed for the young man closing in on 30. It was aimed for the 11 year old boy who could overlook the dubbing audio, the cheesy effects, and the weak storyline. There's a charm and love for this show that most people couldn't understand if they didn't see it with their young eyes in the late 70s. Space Giants might not be the classic I remember, but it's a part of my childhood, just as much as a Darth Vader action figure or a mixed up Ruby's Cube. 
Well, in the comments below, let me know. Did you watch Space Giants? What did you think about it? And as always, please thumb up my video so I know you like my content and subscribe to the channel. And I'll be back again soon. Junk Man. Good job, Junk Man. But it's Rodak. It sounded like he was saying Wardak. Now, in the background, I have something from Japan. He was talking about merchandising. Look at this magazine I got. <clears throat> The name of this show in Japan is Magma Taishi, which means Ambassador Magma, because Goldar, these were the first Transformers, by the way, could transform into a rocket, as you saw in the video. From a robot to a rocket, he's supposedly 50 feet tall, and you had monster after monster that Rodak, real name Goa, G-O-A in Japanese, sent to the Earth. He's a dude that collects planets, like they're comic books, and he wants to take over the Earth because it's the most beautiful planet I've ever seen. And there is a final episode. There's only 52 half-hour episodes. It ran for a year in Japan, and it had an actual ending where good triumphed over evil. I have a couple more clips. The Lugo men were really cool shapeshifters. It was a ripoff of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Now, if you were born, say, in 1966, you're pretty much a boomer, and you were probably older when you saw this on TBS. It aired from 1978 until 1981, so you may not have liked it as much as I did. You had to be in that sweet spot age to really appreciate it it's just like godzilla you know godzilla or something like that i'm going to play now the original opening in japanese to the space giants and you'll hear magma taishi that's really the kid saying goldar and he whistles but magma taishi that's what goldar uh means in japanese So that's the original Japanese opening. Now, this is really brief, just a few seconds. I want to play the original, 43 seconds to be exact, the retooled opening credits for the American version that aired on WTBS and WTCG before it was retitled with the call letters WTBS, Superstation 17. I got a funny promo to play, a 27-second long promo from 1980 from WTBS 17. From the far reaches of outer space comes a threat to planet Earth. Mankind faces its most powerful enemy, the mastermind Rodak. The space giant. Goldar, a 50-foot robot, and his electronic space family are created to defend our world. And now the comed and now the comedic WTBS 30-second commercial. Rodak unleashes monster after monster, destroying toy trains, muddled tanks, and cardboard cities. Who can stop them? A 
about a 50-foot giant who turns into a rocket, or a kid with a flashing light in his head, or an old man who wanders around a cave and bumps into the walls. Are our heroes any match against Rodak and his cunning little men? Find out Space Giants on the Superstation. Watched it after school every single day. Loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, Bear with me. I want to play one other Space Giants clip of the Lugo men, the shapeshifters. Shape, I see Al in the background. I don't know if he's ready to come on, but let me play a clip. This this is a five-minute clip, five-minute clip. Oh, you know what I'm going to do, actually? Before that, I'm going to play the end credits, 43 seconds, because you'll hear a voiceover from WTBS announcing i think that the flintstones are coming up next it's just sentimental to me hopefully to someone else here we go here's the original english wtbs outro to space giants stay tuned for prehistoric fun with the flintstones next on superstation wtbs <laughs> Hey, I see in the chat, Danny Staten says, I never got to the Croft stuff. Come back on. The link's in your email. Do you need the link? Are you charged up? Come on back with it because I have some clips I'm going to play from Sid and Marty Croft in just a little bit. i got to start to wind the show down. I can't do another six-hour show. I've gone four hours, 45 minutes, 30 seconds. Danny, do you have the link? Let me know in the chat. Uh, but I know you might want to watch uh, Bob um, thrash Pondo Ponds with his trivia at 7 30 about 15 minutes 14 minutes so i don't want to conflict with him i like him a lot now you just heard that intro to the space giants this is a cool version a dude did on youtube this blew my mind 30 seconds I think that guy did a great job. And then here's some of his ending. Now, Lakeside TV, which is defunct, they were in New York City. They distributed the Space Giants in the 1970s to TV stations all across the USA. So that theme was made specifically by Lakeside Television to repackage the Space Giants, which again aired between 1966 and 67, about 10 years prior in Japan before it hit America. I like this version of the end theme you just heard by this uh, this guy. I got to give credit to who this gentleman is. Let me see. His name is Louis R O I, like return on investment. That's the guy that composed or um, created this uh, cover of the American Lakeside TV Space Giants theme. <laughs> You get the idea. He did a great job. Now I am going to play a clip of the Lugo men. This guy put these on YouTube way back in 2006 when YouTube was just a baby. So the quality is not great. 
they have been released on Blu-ray in Japan not too long ago in better quality and on Laserdisc before that. This guy used the Laserdiscs, and uh, I just want to play a clip of the Lugo Men. These are the most memorable creatures from the Nastrix galaxy in the Space Giants universe, and they had the power of the fifth dimension, the power of the fourth dimension. And so they could go through walls, they could take over your identity, and when they take over a human, the human would be asleep until the alien Lugo man was killed. And they would turn into like this blue sludge when they were killed. And the good guys, the Transformer family of Goldar, Silvar, and Gam had laser beams from their antenna. And when they would strike a Lugo man, they would melt and die. Let me just play a little bit. And what's happened here in the plot of this, this is the ninth episode of the Space Giants out of 52 called The Terrifying Lugo Men. And uh, the, the main character, Miko, who's like a 10-year-old boy who has the whistle that summons Goldar, his mother's been taken over by the lead Lugo man, a grotesque creature. Let's just play this clip, and then we're going to start to wind down the show. Wind down the show. But let's watch this. The Space Giant. Goldar, a 50-foot robot, and his electronic space family are created to defend our world. What has happened to the communication systems between the Earth countries, Goldar? Silvar, look, there's a monster. Look, Silvar, when the monster submerges, the communications return to normal. Ah, do you hear that? All the sound waves have returned. I wonder why the sound returned. I don't know. Anyway, it's good to hit. Look. monster so far the nation's leaders are not aware of our monster zandosis every time it comes out of the sea countries declare war against each other good soon we will occupy the earth what are we going to do with morris sir as long as he's alive the earthling is a threat to the success of our operation while he doesn't know that you are one of us we can make good use of him however you will have to watch him carefully i think he should be eliminated all of the newspapers think he is one of the wisest of the reporters. He could easily catch on to all our business. All the better that he is wise, for he will give us the best information. That's true. As long as he doesn't know your real identity, he can keep us well informed. In a few seconds, I expect a signal that will tell us that another spaceship containing our people has landed on Earth. Look, there it is. Oh. Yeah! 
They don't look like us at all. Quiet down. That's white. They're certainly not humans. I wonder what they are. Mijo. Uh. Mm. Somebody's hiding there. Get them. neat when the aliens land they walk on water yes it's dudes in their mama's pantyhose or something nylons but i still thought those were cool and i'm going to play the next chapter in just a minute just to break it up i have two more chapters five minutes each i want to show you what the lugo men can do you'll see them take over a nurse and go through walls it's pretty interesting i know the quality's not great but uh oh we got some comments coming in let's see here esmeralda this is a fantastic show, Chance, and all of the wonderful gentlemen on your show. Thank you all so much. Got to go. Hey, I appreciate all your time. You spent hours with me. Much appreciated, Esmeralda. And uh, those cards should be there in your P.O. box tomorrow, hopefully. Have a good one. Um, I see Al in the background. Let me go ahead and play the next chapter of our little story. Uh, and there's just this clip and one other, and then I have the game show theme of the week, and then we'll start to wrap it up. But here is the next chapter in this story. The Space Giant. Goldar, a 50-foot robot, and his electronic space family are created to defend our world. Try to get the monster. Be careful. consuming the sound waves yes sir at least 10 billion cycles that's interesting a creature that has the ability to consume sound waves hmm. first the world has its communications cut due to absorbed sound waves and then a creature appears that has the ability of consuming sound waves hmm. It seems obvious to me that the monster is responsible for the Earth's chaos. 
Whoever summoned that monster here wanted the Earth's countries at war. I wonder who that could be. It must be Rodak, sir. I agree. Now, I fully understand the situation, and we have to put a stop to it immediately. Yes, sir. One country will blame another for the ship that was sunk, and therefore another war will start. I should attack that monster. Yes. And right away. What I want you to do, in addition to attacking Rodak's monster, is find out where it came from. That is important for us to know. We'll try to cut off Rodak's supporters. Yes, sir. Miss Susan, I'm very worried. Have you heard anything from Gam? Why, no. He hasn't contacted any of us. I wonder where he is. The cause is unknown at this time, and officials are calling it an act of war, increasing tension around the world. In other news today, riots are taking place all over the world. The communication systems of many countries have There's been There's a cut lot on going on. As of this moment, no one has been able to What's determine caused? who or what is responsible for the trouble. I wonder where Miko is. Mura, the reporter. I'm not sure where he's at. Answer us! I did that. The people you want aren't here. That's a lie. You're Mura's son, so you ought to know more than that. The more you delay, the harder you'll make it for yourself. The people aren't here, I told you. I've been waiting nearly an hour. We are the Lugo men sent here by Rodak to take over the Earth. Huh? You're inhabiting the Earth? Come with us! As a kid, this stuff was cool, I'm telling you. And I got one other clip, actually two more clips from the show, but let's continue on with the storyline. Watch this nurse get taken over by one of the Lugo men from the shadowy world of Lugo in the Nastris galaxy. The Space Giant. Goldar, a 50-foot robot, and his electronic space family are created to defend our world. going to do? I have to see where they're headed. Let me go with you. You can go. You, come with me.
Mama wasn't hurt, was she? No, she's okay. She'll be all right. She wasn't hurt. She's only unconscious. So you don't have to fear for her. I said, don't worry about Amiko. I promise you she's all right. You sure? Uh -huh. Let's help her. Wait. But Papa. Not yet. First, let's see what happens. I suggest you take their places as fast as possible. We'll destroy the real humans before the night is over. Time is an important factor. I want this operation to get started as fast as possible, so pick your human substitutes quickly. Rodak's orders are for speed and efficiency. We must replace all the humans on Earth. Others from our planet are on their way here right now. Did you hear that? Now go. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> engaged as the little kid after school all the time and they had a lot of stuff that was done in this show <clears throat> that couldn't be shown in america there was a christmas eve episode i won't show it because it'll look like i'm a demon where rodak kills a priest in church murders him and he falls over dead they couldn't play that in america also in that same episode it showed drive-by shootings people getting shot up a lot of violence beheading stuff like that that they couldn't show in the american version which wound up on the laser disc uh never translated into english uh, yes, it has been a five-hour marathon stream uh, from, who said that? Wood Train. Hey, Wood Train. I'm going to wrap it up. I, I keep saying that, then I go another hour. I can't go six hours because Twitter will shut off. The Twitter stream shuts off at six hours. So I'm at five hours, seven minutes. Good Lord. Oh, Space Giant. So let me get to the comic book. So that comic book was a one-shot comic book right there. Based on this show, that was a long setup, huh, about Space Giants. But I wanted to give those that are younger than me a sense of why i like the show it was just like the transformers it was like power rangers later on you know it was ultraman made the same time as ultraman 1966 in japan now here's the inside front cover of that space giants comic book it was in black and white it was basically newsprint it wasn't a slick cover it was a paper cover and what year was this august 29th 1979 is when this book was released there's the interior artwork of Goldar. And then there were also images of publicity shots from the Space Giants. There's one there. I wish it was in color. There's another one. And uh, Rodak was tiny. He wasn't tall. Uh, and of course, in reality, the actors were humans, so they both were the same height. But in the show, Goldar's 50 feet and Rodak is the size of a human being. There's a shot from the very first episode or pilot where Rodak arrives on Earth. And there's another shot, publicity shot. And I like this monster. It reminds me of my little bunny rabbit, my pet. That is, Mol Molosaurus is the English name of that monster from episodes two and three of the Space Giants. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, two, three, and four of the Space Giants. And he was destroyed. And then there's the back cover of that Space Giants one-shot comic book. Here is a nice little ad from Japan from 1966 and 67 promoting some of the merchandising of Magma Taishi, Ambassador Magma, 
in Japanese. Hello, Sarah. Thanks for still being here. Um, And then I have another comic book story to share with you. Bear with me. I've got to play another clip of Space Giants, and then I'll stop talking about the damn Space Giants. But I do want to play a clip. I just yanked this from my other YouTube channel, Chance Acting Demo. The quality's not great. But I love this scene where uh, Rodak and Goldar square off. I think this is an episode... 17 or 18 17 of the space giants out of 52 episodes watch this and uh, part of it is not even in english there's there's some extended scenes and scenes that where the english translation was lost basically the english you're hearing that's from someone who recorded it on a betamax in 1979 of wtbs or vhs i think it was betamax and they kept it and then someone made copies and copies and copies and then when the laser disc came out someone used those english tracks so there's some tracks that are lost that's why i wish al hardy kept those film prints because i could get those lost english tracks there's not much that's lost episode seven has some lost english where the tape was lost from back then um and i have a film reel of a lot of lost english tracks scenes that were cut that were translated into english and then next week previews i have a whole reel of those from the space giants but let's watch a clip of the space giants and then i promise we'll move on to another topic and then we'll say good night but this is pretty cool i think attention earthlings were just located at this training center earthlings catch them whoever they are <laughs> Oh, 
はるばる人生から飛ばしてきた俺の力を見たか隕石の下で溶けてスクラップになるがいい<笑>勇気を出して戦うことが大切なのだそれが地球を守ることなのだよはい大変よ日本が大変なのよゴアの命令で怪獣アロンが暴れているのアロン I'll attend to that immediately Please let me assist Stay here, Gam Oh, why? I want you and Miko to destroy this entire training center Make sure it can never be used again Can you do that? Certainly, Goldar. Right, Miko? Mm -hmm. We'll sure try. Good. Gam, I'll let your mother know that you're all right. <laughs> Went a little long there. By the way, a few years ago, I had a Japanese friend, Akiko, translate. I took notes. We watched that together here, and I wrote down... Everything was being said, so someday I'm gonna do this and on my YouTube channel and translate in English for Rodak when he, when he went up on the ship, ship and going, going, was going, was going. Was going. <laughs> right before right he before summons he all those meteorites to attack, he says, Rodak says, The childlike power you have makes me laugh. Show your real power. I'm gonna show you what I can do. Watch this. I got this from Venus. I will I turn, turn you into scrap metal. metal. Lita, Lita, hang on. Hang on. I, can't I can't run, run anymore. anymore. Don't, Don't mind me, me. Just, just run. run. Miko. Miko. Gam, take care of her. Goldar. Let's, Let's go. go. Gam. Father, you saved us. We could have been killed. Anyway, there's more. She translated all this for me. <laughs> I'm going to do that another time. Like, I'll, I'll figure it out technically, and I'll add the lines in. Now, that beginning that was in Japanese of the next episode wasn't cut. It's just uh, whoever recorded it recorded it late. So that's why, and that's lost, you know, unless you had the film prints or some of the source material. But I have some of the lost English tracks on 16mm film of various scenes. I, like I said, I have a whole reel that's got next week previews and cut scenes. That's one of my cherished films, and if that one goes bad, I don't know what I will do. Um, so that's all I got to say about the Space Giants. Finally, it just it was just a really cool show. I'm going to do a whole. I don't think anyone would tune in for Space Giants. Uh, if anyone's still alive that watched it, like I did. Um, oops. Let me just go through. Oh, no, my other comic book story. 
I want to mention this. This is an exclusive. I'm going to do like a short on this because this is information no one is really talking about. There was a character named Sabretooth first introduced in this comic book. This is from my collection, Iron Fist 14. This later became a villain of Wolverines. And you saw this character in the very first X-Men movie from the year 1999 in the snow. And he fought Wolverine in the comic books. And you saw that in Wolverine issue number 10 with the white cover in the snow. Well, here's the controversy. The controversy is what's the second appearance of Sabretooth? That's where the controversy comes in. That's the first appearance. No debate there. I, have a, I just should get that great. It's a gorgeous copy. I have my collection. Well, for the longest time, dealers and collectors said this was a second appearance of Sabretooth in Power Man and Iron Fist issue 78. Now they say it's in issue 66. Eh. The real appearance is in a lost issue you know how you had the honeymooners the lost episodes and the hidden episodes well in comic books you had lost comic books like this one ms marvel issue 24. this was the real second appearance of Sabretooth. this is pop culturally significant i think and here's why this book was canceled issue 23 was the last published issue of ms marvel out in january 1979 but the 24th issue had already been put together, written, drawn, everything. And there's the cover. It was finally published in this book, Marvel Superheroes, Volume 2, Summer 1992 Special. That's a new cover they drew. But finally, between it was, it was drawn in late 78. It wasn't until 1992 when you saw this story. Now, here's why it's significant. Here's why I say this is the true second appearance of Sabretooth. One, Chris Claremont, a longtime writer of the X-Men, wrote this story and created Sabretooth. He also wrote the second appearance in Ms. Marvel 24. There's his credit, bottom left, Chris Claremont. Well, the writer of these Power Men and Iron Fist issues is Joe Duffy, not the creator, not in the timeline, and years after Iron Fist 14. So... Just a little bit of comic book history for you that no one talks about. The true second appearance of Sabretooth, there's the first, uh, from May of 1977. The real second appearance was in The Lost Ms. Marvel 24, which you can find uh, inexpensively reprinted, or printed for the first time, I should say, in uh, this book. So there's my little comic book story. Now moving on, um, I already showed that. Uh, some other comic book adaptations. I'll save this for part two. Um, Danny Staten's going to come back with me. We're going to talk about Sid and Marty Croft. I'll save what I had. I've, I'm going to wrap the show. I have more incredible Sid and Marty Croft footage and some stuff I've not shown yet that I want to share. I'm tempted to do it now, but I guess I want to. Well, I'll just save the Carlton comics like Charlton. It's actually Charlton. I always call it Carlton ever since I was a kid. It's Charlton comics. They... I didn't talk about their history. We'll, we'll just save it for next time. Um, they had a lot of comic book and TV adaptations like Space 1999. I guess I could show you all the covers real quick. Then you had Speed Racer and Now Comics down the line. You had Star Blazers in Comico. Battlestar Galactica way back in 1978. That lasted a long time in Marvel Comics. Robotech for DC. So the big publishers... DC and Marvel also, of course, did movie and TV adaptations, along with Gold Key and Dell. Um, let me just show you on camera the other Space 1999 issues from this short box right here. While I have them out, oh, look at these books. First appearance of Nightwing. I have multiple copies of that. He's going to be a thing. That's Dick Grayson Robin. He became Nightwing in 1984. Is my mic still on? Can you hear me? There's that. Um, these were good Teen Titans issues. Here's the first uh, appearance of... This guy's going to be a thing. Deathstroke. Deathstroke in DC comic books. But let me uh, stay on topic. Stay on target. We're too close. We're so close. Stay on target. I've got these weird romance comic books in here too, like... I love you. Um, 
Ghostly Tales Charlton Comics. All sorts of weird books in here. Um, but Space 1999. Here's issue one. I already showed it on camera, but just to prove, and I can start putting the stuff away. There's issue one with John Byrne cover art. John Byrne had the distinction of drawing a Time Magazine cover for Superman's 50th birthday, which was in 1988. Here's issue two of Space 1999, the comic book. A little bit of a glare. Issue three, and Joe Staten did the interior art of issues one and two. John Byrne eventually did the interior art when he was up and coming. This is, he was brand new to the comic book scene. But there's issue three with a John Byrne cover. Here is issue four with a John Byrne cover. I love that with the exploding eagle. Very cool. Here's issue five with a John Byrne cover. These are all in pretty good shape. I hope my mic can pick this up. Let me get closer to the mic, Rafon. Issue, yeah, six. <laughs> uh, Space 1999 with a John Byrne cover. And this is the only one based on season two of Space 1999. This one is not a John Byrne cover, but it introduces Maya, the metamorph character. I have a couple copies of this one. This one was really hard to find. This one's really rare. I mean, this was like, when I say that, this was like before um, you had basically eBay. And there's another weird Space Giants comic book from years later. It's a one shot. Mankind is doomed. No one can defy Rodak. And also I have a, a 45 single record album. Oh man, I have a bunch of these. Speed Racer. That I talked about. Um, I guess I should just save it. Save it, save it, save it, save it, save it, save it, save it. Star Wars 3D. Uh, I'm going to start putting this stuff away. Oh, and then there's the Comico. Listeners, and this has been a fail. A listen fail show. All the Space Giants clips will not be listener friendly. All these covers I'm showing are not listener friendly at all. Oh, I forgot. At Star Blazers. Comico. And you had another independent publisher, First Comics, that published some interesting comic books that were adaptations, and we'll talk about that, too, in part two. Let me just look at what's in this box. I got all sorts of weird books in here. Um, Tales of the Unexpected. I love this underrated Untold Legend of Batman Origin miniseries. It's really good. Um, there's issue two. It was just three issues, and it, I have the book where it was reprinted. It's one of my favorite of the Batman books. Even better than, I hate to say it, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight. I know a lot of you are probably cursing me for saying that. And then I have a ton of copies of Watchmen, number one, uh, first print from 1986. I bought right off of the shelf in the comic shop when I was a teenager. Um, Ult Someone was talking about Ultraman in chat. There's Ultra Klutz. I have all of those. Which is a strange independent little spoof on the Japanese Ultraman, Ultra Klutz. I think they're worthless, but I like them. They have sentimental value to me. Um, John Byrne, Doomsday Minus One. Doomsday Plus One. I always screw that up. Doomsday Plus One. I have all those. I'll just have to save that for another time. Oh, dear. Um, make sure there's nothing else I wanted to show on top. Those are my four Invaders issues. We showed those earlier. Whoa, so much glare. There's the Invaders issues. I'm like packing up here. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. There's a, my Land of the Giants books up top in the background. Let me change the camera shot. And, uh, God, I can't believe people are still watching. I know I'm a, just a bag of wind talking so much. Change that. And turn, oh, I forgot to turn on my sign. I don't know why I turned it off in the first damn place. Okay, so uh, duh, 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 duh. let me check the comments. Comments. It's our sweet Sarah, Southern California Sarah. I'm in and out. That's what she said. That's such a stupid, tired little comeback. I mean, everyone says that now. Um. He says, oh, my gosh, another dead battery. Okay, man, charge that sucker up. Chance you're killing me giggle, says Southern California Sarah. Okay, so I thought that was an interesting. Then again, maybe I'm just nuts, but I thought that was an interesting 
tidbit about uh, Sabretooth. And for the longest time, I thought the lightsaber was spelled S-A-B-R-E, I mean, L-I-G-H-T, S-A-B-R-E, because Sabretooth is spelled that way. Instead of E-R, it's R-E. I don't know why. Um, and I'm going to quickly check my, my clips. I want to make sure I showed everything. I know I didn't show the Sid and Marty Croft. I better save that for next time, for next week. I'm going to do it Friday night, though. I'm not, Sunday's not my day. I like to relax on Sunday. I know you do, too. It just worked out this way. And besides, um, there's no football, no baseball right now. I thought it'd be a good time to do one on a Sunday, do a show, because there's no sports going on. And as Danny pointed out, NASCAR was rained out. But I don't think sports fans are watching me anyway. Um, oh, I want to say there are a couple birthdays. I guess. birthday to Vanna White. And also I got a trivia question for those that were hanging on to win something. I know I had some questions earlier. I did forget to do a question. Esmeralda's back. Oh no. Oh no. That's an old comment. Um, 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 um. I do. I'm, I'm going to do a trivia, but I want to say I've got to acknowledge some birthdays. Happy birthday to Dr. DeRay. I love the beats headphones. He was born on February 18th, 1965 in Compton, California. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to John Travolta. I need to do a post about him. Born uh, February 18th, 1954 in Englewood, New Jersey. Remember his sister? His sister was in a lot of TV shows back in the day. You never see her anymore. I wonder if she's still with us. Probably is. Let me, um, I'm trying to find something. I want to be able to play my little birthday music in the background. <laughs> background. I can't talk today. Here we go. Let me see if this will work. It should work. Let me get it to play. Come on. I already heard that, so I won't, won't have the levels right, so you can hear me and the music. All right. He's had a lot of tragedy in his life, John Travolta. Um, happy birthday to you. Lost his wife, lost his son, Jet. Terrible. Happy birthday to Vanna White, born on uh, February 18th, 1957 in Conway, South Carolina. What a career she's had. She's staying on Wheel of Fortune after Pat Sajak retires and uh, Georgia's own, where I'm at. Ryan Seacrest takes over. Uh, that'll be interesting to see the chemistry between those two. Happy birthday to Matt Dillon. He was born on February 18th, 1964 in New Rochelle, New York. Happy birthday to Molly Ringwald. A lot of good ones today. I got to do posts about it. I was busy preparing the show, and I, did, I neglected the Nostalgic Pod Blast Facebook group and Twitter. I'm mo mostly active in terms of social media on the Facebook group, The Nostalgic with a C Pod Blast. Got almost 6,000 members. Uh, would love you to join as well. There's no questions to answer. You just hit join. <clears throat> but uh, Molly Ringwald, and I'm going to do a show upcoming. I've already talked about the John Hughes movies, the best of John Hughes movies. And uh, I'm going to talk about that later. Um, but Molly Ringwald was born February 18th, 1968 in Roseville, California. So she's a California girl. Yoko Ono, born in Tokyo, Japan, on February 18th, 1933. Happy heavenly birthday to the great Jack Palatz, born February 18th, 1919, in Hazel Township, Pennsylvania. He passed on November 10th, 2006. Happy heavenly birthday. Gosh, so many good ones. Sybil Shepherd. she was born on February 18th, 1950, in Memphis, Tennessee, a Southern gal. And uh, there's a lot of big ones I missed. I'll just go to our friend... Uh, 
Curtis Retro Zest on Facebook and just share out the cool uh, photoshopped images that he uh, has. And speaking of John Hughes, it was his heavenly birthday today. He was born back in 1950 on February 18th, 1950 in Lansing, Michigan. He passed on August 6th, 2009. And uh, some really big pop culture personalities. Happy heavenly birthday to the great Bill Cullen, who was born on February 18th, 1920 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He died July 7th, 1990. He had all sorts of health ailments, but what a great game show host. The original host of The Price is Right on NBC and then ABC, long before CBS revived it in 1972, starring the great Bob Barker, who passed away in August of 2023. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me just see. Oh, my, my birthday music cut out. My bad. <laughs> oh, God, I'm messing up. Come on now. Are you? Oh, geez. No, I'm not going to play an ad. Uh, let me look at birthdays because I'm going to run this on Fistful. Um, let me look at birthdays. I'm going to run this after the fact on Fistful. So let me look at February 19th birthdays and February 20th birthdays, which is my sister's birthday, February 20th. Happy birthday to you, Nicole. Um, we did a family celebration yesterday, but who gives a crap? Um, you're here for the nostalgia, not my family stuff. But um, let me find my list. Where is it? Here it is. Let's see who was born on February 19th that uh, that we care about. Mm -hmm. I didn't have time. Smokey Robinson, happy heavenly birthday to him. He was born on February 19th, 1940 in Detroit, Michigan. Um I love his music. Jeff Daniels, uh, 1955, February 19th, 1955 in Athens, Georgia. Happy heavenly birthday to Lee Marvin, born February, get my music back, February 19th, 1924 in New York, New York. He passed on August 29th, 1987. And uh, Seal, the singer Seal, born uh, February 19th, 1963 in Paddington, London, England. And let's see here. I always look at the top 50 on this list. Usually they'll put some good ones between 40 and 50, you know, people that maybe retired from the entertainment industry uh, that I think should be towards the top of the list, but they aren't always that way with the internet gods. All right, so let's move on to February 20th, my sister's birthday. Oh, some good ones. I love Charles, I love, I mean, I like Charles Barkley. Um, let me just, where is my little list here? Hang on, folks. I know this is bad, bad, bad. Is the music still freaking playing? No, I had turned the volume down, dumbass. I am a dumbass. Dumbass, dumbass, dumbass. Ah, boy, oh boy, oh boy. I'm a dumbass. Okay, hang on a second. Where's that list? Because you might be listening on the 20th, right? found it uh, Rihanna heavy happy happy heavenly birthday to Kurt Cobain born February 20th 1967 in Washington State in Eberdeen he killed himself on April 5th 1994 allegedly allegedly um, let me see here happy birthday to Charles Barkley born February 20th 1963 in Leeds Alabama Remember that bit he did with Barney on the SNL where he's playing some pretty rough basketball prison rules on the court with Barney the Dinosaur. That was hilarious. Happy birthday to Cindy Crawford, born February 20th, 1966 in DeKalb, Illinois. Uh, happy heavenly birthday to Sidney Poitier. Guess who came to dinner, right? He was born on February 20th, 1927 in Miami, Florida. He passed on January 6th, 2022. Ansel Adams, great artist. Born in 1902 on February 20th in San Francisco, California. He passed on April 22nd, 1984. Amanda Blake, happy heavenly birthday to her. Born on February 20th, 1929 in Buffalo, New York. She died on August 16th, 1989. We know her as uh, 
Miss Kitty on Gunsmoke all those years, and she quit the show. She wasn't in the last season of the show. She made it almost through the entire run, and there went my damn music. So it's probably a sign that I need to uh, log the hell off. Shut up, Ad. Shut up, shut up, shut your ass. Wash your ass and shut your ass. Sorry. Um. Oh, Gloria Vanderbilt, born February 20th, 1924 in Manhattan, New York. She died June 17th. 2019 anderson cooper's mother for those who don't know happy birthday to sandy duncan born february 20th 1946 in henderson texas and uh mm -hmm. let me just go ahead and look here happy birthday to jennifer o'neill i remember her from cover up in this movie steel opposite lee majors she was born february 20th 1948 in rio de janeiro brazil in south america um, let's see what else. All right, that's pretty much all. And I guess I'll just look at February 21st, too. February 21st birthdays include Jennifer Love Hewitt and uh, Alan Rickman. He died January 14th, 2016. But he was born February 21st, 1946 in Hammersmith, London, England. Jennifer Love Hewitt, born February 21st, 1979 in Waco, Texas, where they had that terrible massacre in 1993 at the Branch Davidian compound there. Wow. Um, let me just look here. I'll never forget that, man. That was an awful day. Mm. Oh, good one. Tyne Daly. Great actor. She's having some health problems. She's been in the news lately because of health ailments. But Tyne Daly was born February 21st, 1946 in Madison, Wisconsin. Her brother played Jeffrey, played uh, David Koresh. I was just talking about that tragedy in Waco, Texas. Her brother played him in an NBC TV movie very effectively. And uh, her brother, uh, Tim, also did a version of The Fugitive as Dr. Richard Kimball, a revival on TV in the year 2000. 2000. I believe it was 2000. But Tyne Daly is a remarkable actor. Ooh, my video game went a little screwy there. Look at that. It's effing up. Um, I've got a lot of Facebook posting to do. These are some big birthdays, people I care about and they're fan and am, that I'm fans of. William Peterson, great actor. Oh, man. Live and Die in L.A. Uh, Fear, an underrated crazy horror movie. Stars Mark Wahlberg. He'd rather forget he did that, as does uh, Reese Witherspoon. She said so publicly she regrets doing that movie. Whatever. He was born February 21st, 1953 in Evanston, Illinois. Of course, he's in the CSI stuff, but I remember from Live and Die in L.A., and he played the dad, Reese Witherspoon's dad, in Fear. Um, wow. Okay, I'm going to wrap on birthdays because this is getting ridiculous. Um Let's see what else I got here for y'all. Let me see if I have another clip. I just got a scan. I'm not going to do a fake rant of the week. I did have something else. I'm going to skip the Nostalgic Tree of the Week. Here is the promised game show theme of the week. This is two minutes. Just two minutes. And it kind of applies to Bill Cullen because he was uh, one of the panelists on this show in the 70s. I like this theme, to, to Tell the Truth.
it airs on Buzzer, a free over-the-air network if you're in the USA and you're within range of a local affiliate. And it's on Pluto TV. I like it, and I like the kinescopes they've been playing at 4 in the morning. I record it, and uh, Johnny Carson was on the panel before he hosted The Tonight Show, before he took over from Steve Allen. And you had all sorts of remarkable people on this. Don Amici. Um, but I like the whole concept of To Tell the Truth. I watched the version in the 80s occasionally. But uh, that's my game show theme of the week. Now for the trivia that I promised you. I'll make this a prize question. Here is a trivia question. You can name your prize. I will give away. Let me uh, switch the uh, camera shot so you can see what I'm giving away. Just a sec. Let me change my camera shot. Okay. I've got some really cool mint condition Batman cards. I'll mail you five 1989 tops Batman, Tim Burton's Batman cards, okay? Or some Star Wars tops cards from 1977. Five. I only mail five. I have five. The reason I do that is not to be cheap because I have tons of stuff I could mail out. It's just. I like to be able to just slap a stamp on an envelope and mail something out. It's easy. It's quick. It's no problem. And I have to keep it to an ounce for one stamp. Um, so that's the reason. Or I'll give you a Star Wars. I don't think I ever gave this away. Star Wars issue two. Now, full disclosure, it is a reprint. I promised a comic book. It's not in the best of shape, but I'll give you a, a bonus comic book too. All you have to do is be the first person to answer the correct answer, to, to say the correct answer and say claim. Then you'll win. Um, that's all it takes. So here's the question, and I'm going to make this a 50-50 question. So all you have to do is guess the right one. And uh, by the way, uh, Outcast Creative, hello, had said uh, he was a legend, such a lovely person too. Bill Cullen, who are you referring to? Uh, I'd like to know who you were referring to there. And Esmeralda said William Peterson was good in the original Manhunter movie. Oh, yeah, good one. That, that was the origin story to... Um, uh, not Jeffrey, you know who. Um, 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 um. Hannibal Lecter. Hannibal Lecter. That was the, wasn't that the origin story to Hannibal Lecter? Hannibal or something? Yeah, to tell the truth, it was a fun show. Um, so the, the trivia, the trivia. First person answers this correctly wins. Question. Which came first on TV? The Munsters or the Adams Family? You have a 50-50 chance at being correct with a guess here. Which came first on TV, Monsters or the Addams Family? First person to answer correctly that wants a prize and says claim will get the prize of your choice. The Star Wars Tops cards, the Batman Tops cards, or the Star Wars comic book. Pick a prize, pick a prize. I'm going to repeat again in case there's a delay. The question is... Which came first on television, the Munsters or the Adams Family in the 1960s? Esmeralda guessed Munsters. Sarah guessed Adam Family. Sarah claimed, I, I, I'm not. I love you. Don't misunderstand. I love your support. Claim, just so you know, is spelled C-L-I-M-E, not C-L-A-M-E. I'm not shaming you. I just want I'm a teachable moment. I hate that expression. Obama started that. I hate that. I thought he did. A teachable moment. It's so condescending. Um, no, no, no. Uh, you guessed Adam's family, Munsters, anyone else? Let me see here. Um, I just want to wait, give someone else a shot. Well, actually, you win, Sarah. You're eligible. You're eligible. It, it was... It was the Adams Family. The Adams Family premiered on September 18th, 1964 on ABC TV. So the correct answer is the Adams Family. The Munsters debuted on CBS on September 24th, 1964, just days after the Adams Family premiered. How about that? How about that? Now, which show did you like the best, Adams Family or the Munsters? And I don't like it when people pose that question like Genie or Bewitched, you know, but it is a fun question to ask and answer, I think. There's no harm in it. You know, when there's similar shows, similar concepts, um, which did you like best? So I will ask, did you like Adam's Family or the Munsters better? Or both. There's no wrong answer here. So, okay, Sarah, name your prize, and I'll mail it to you, and I'll finally mail you that T-shirt. There you go. 
you you got it. So Sarah wins. She, I don't think she, she should be ineligible because she puts in so much time here and so many hours. Uh, Danny Staten says, who was a guest tonight, how do you remember all of this trivia? I can't remember this morning. Ugh. Yes, Esmeralda, it was the Adams Family, which debuted September 18th, 1964. And the Munsters debuted. On, I know I'm repeating myself. <laughs> on September 24th, 64, on CBS. All right. Well, we're going to now finally say goodnight. i got to do my shout-outs really quick. Um, apologies to Bob, Thrash Pondo Pons. I usually wouldn't be on in his time slot. He's on YouTube. Thrash Pondo Pons is his YouTube channel. He does trivia every Sunday night at 7.30 Eastern time. Want to recommend some Facebookers, too. I want to recommend um, Steve Russo's Facebook group called The Fun, Fun World of Classic Television as well as classic television shows on Facebook, a huge television uh, Facebook group of classic TV. And then, of course, Nostalgia World on Facebook, which is run by a gentleman named Jerry Dobson. Jerry with a G, like Jerry Anderson. Jerry Dobson. Um, Curtis of C Curtis Langclo of RetroZest.com and the RetroZest podcast or the RetroZest show, as I call it on Fistful. He has excellent content, guests and fun. It's audio only, but that's cool because he's got incredible guests. He had an interview with Marin Jensen, who had been dormant for years, just running a business successfully behind the scenes out of the limelight. That was one of his better interviews, and he's always... Uh, doing a great job on that show. He had Stu Phillips, the guy that composed the Knight Rider theme, and all of these Glenn Larson TV themes that you know and love, like BJ and the Bear, Buck Rogers in the 25th Century, et cetera, et cetera. He interviewed Stu Phillips. I was really impressed by that. On Facebook, it's RetroZest. Uh, he's got 35,000 followers or something. Um, he does a really good job remembering the anniversaries of the debuts of record albums, movies, and celebrity birthdays. Uh, great content, uh, and I'm proud to be partnered with him. Just go to RetroZest.com and check out his T-shirts as well and buttons. He's got merchandise reasonably priced at RetroZest.com. Um, BK on the air. I called in uh, yesterday. He's on Saturdays, 10 a.m. to noon with Alan Sanders and Sky Barry King on WBHF, which is a radio station in Cartersville, Georgia. It's audio only, but it's still fun to listen to. Um geek to me radio live will be on tonight is real live sunday night at um 10 p.m eastern 7 p.m pacific and 9 p.m central his time locally in st louis missouri he's on a big radio station ktrs st louis missouri the big ktrs james install he has big interviews with people currently in the business not just comic book people, nothing wrong with that. He has comic book writers, artists, uh, actors, creators. And then, of course, sometimes Joey, who uh, does his video for him, they talk movies just one-on-one. -on -one. That's my favorite thing is when they just go one-on-one -on -one talking about movies. Uh, and he has a nice presence on uh, Twitter slash X, geek to me radio and he is live on camera for his one hour show on YouTube and Facebook and I think Twitch and Twitter. Geek to Me Radio, James Enstall. K-pop junkie out of Michigan State. She's a YouTuber. Katie is her real first name. And you spell her YouTube channel, letter K, letter P, letter O, letter P, underscore J-U-N-K-I. She's live with comic book artists, creators, writers, and just shooting the breeze. Uh, on occasion, so subscribe so you'll know when she's going live. Man Cave 101 podcast, they're on Thursday nights uh, around 7.30 Eastern time. They go for a couple hours, uh, 90 minutes to a couple hours, talking pop culture news, uh, and it's from a fresh perspective. Uh, I like it. Uh, I like what they have to say. And last but not least, Superman Homepage Live, Monday nights at 10.30 Eastern, 7.30 Pacific. They're the number one Superman resource for all things Superman, the new movie directed by James Gunn, the classic Christopher Reeve movies, comic books, and they feature classic and new comic books, new stories, new and retro Superman. One-hour show. It's always a one-hour show, just like James Enstall's geek to me Radio. And also, if you haven't already... Check out Dave Sundstrom on YouTube. He has a great pop culture YouTube channel. 
He produces excellent content, and he's really good, just like uh, Thrash Pondo Pons is with communicating with his audience in chat. And he has exclusive content for members of his YouTube channel. And then Pat McCormack of Golden Rage of TV on YouTube. He interviews a lot of big names in entertainment. And he's a accomplished guitarist as well. He won an Emmy Award, a Daytime Emmy Award, for pl playing a fictional band member on General Hospital on ABC. How cool is that? Um, and in case you don't know, the geek shall inherit the earth. So I guess that's pretty much all of the shout outs. If I forgot anyone, I will kick my, oh, Al Hardy, Nostalgia Rewinds on Facebook. That's his Facebook group. And then uh, Tom Williams, who was on, he's known as Basil Chesterman on Facebook and on social media. And his Facebook group, I believe, is Basil's Original Nostalgic Facebook. I never can remember it. I got to write it down. Basil's Nostalgic Podcast, I think is what it's called. Woo, I said a mouthful. I got almost six hours. I'm going to say goodnight. Esmeralda says, thanks. Always a good show. Appreciate that. Appreciate you being here. Thanks to Sarah, my flock. Oh, my God. How could I forget my flock? She's probably like, Chance, what about me? I'll be on with her Tuesday night talking about television shows. I'm sorry. Motion pictures that became good and bad television shows. The link should be in the chat. Link it up, girl. Southern California, Sarah. I'll be on with her Tuesday night at 7, no, 9.30 Eastern time, which is uh, 6.30 Pacific time. Tuesday night. On February 20th, my sister's real birthday. So uh, I'll be on there. Yeah. Oh, and I asked which... Oh, Esmeralda was correcting me. No, you asked what you like better, Adam's Family or Munster. So she was saying Adam's Family. That wasn't an answer, right? She'd already answered Adam's Family was Esmeralda's favorite. Now I got it. Danny Staten asks, how do you remember all this trivia? I can't remember this morning. I know I already said that and put it on the screen. I don't know. I, I, I Actually, I forgot I put it on the screen. Now I just remembered I put it on the screen. Ah, uh, okay. I'll save the other clips for when I'm on Friday night with Dan. Dan, are you available Friday night? Let me know in chat. Let's reschedule part two of our conversation about, uh, and we'll talk about some of the Charlton comic book adaptations, as well as some more of the gold key comic books and the Dell comic book adaptations. And we'll get into now comics and innovate some of the other publishers like first comics, any of the one that published a movie or TV comic book adaptation, we're going to talk about. And of course the Sid and Marty Croft comic books. Can't wait. I got some, Material, I'll just save it for then. All right, so Friday night going to work for you, brother? Let me know, Dan, if you're still listening. Uh, but I'm going to do this Friday night. Part two would be fun chance. Okay, I don't want to talk about too much of the same thing for diversity's sake. People, A lot of people don't care about comic books or classic TV, and I talk a lot about both of those things. So I try to have other topics like food, music. Danny says, call me tomorrow. All right, well, I'm going on Friday with something. Friday at 7.30, and I'll be on Tuesday with Sarah on my Flock YouTube channel. Uh, Al is still in the background, but he's not in his studio, so I guess he's having supper. He's probably moved on, so I'm going to say good night. Good night, everybody. I appreciate everybody being here for this marathon stream. Oh, shit. Five, excuse. Oh, shucks. Five-hour mark. I got to stop, or Twitter will cut off at the six-hour mark. We're almost at the six-hour mark, so good night. I'm finally going to say good night. Have a great week. Thank you.